provisioning they received a message from Himmler. As a reward for their accomplishment, he had promoted the entire team Schaefer to the rank of SS Hauptsturmführer and his colleagues to SS Obersturmführer.11 Cheered by this, the expedition set off for Lhasa. It was December 20, a bitter time of year to be climbing into the Alpine zone and crossing a high Himalayan pass. The next evening, the team held a winter solstice celebration in fine SS style. They piled up wood and built a huge bonfire, and as they huddled about its warmth, they sang an old German military march, Flame Rise, that was a popular standard among SS men. The next morning, they tramped onward toward the icy mountain pass of Natala at 14,600 feet, straining for breath in the thin air. At the summit, prayer flags fluttered in the breeze and the team stopped to gaze to their heart's content at a sight granted few Europeans, the snow-powdered highlands of Tibet. Descending into the valley below, they passed heavily laden yak caravans and Tibetan wool merchants armed with antique-looking flint locks and swords sheathed in silver and turquoise scabbards. Along the side of the road, tents of black yak hair revealed groups of Buddhist pilgrims mothers nursing their infants and men drinking tea. As beggar passed them by, he stared at and sized up the curious faces. In the southern village of Ferry, an important caravan stop, he was pleased to spy a high official with what he judged to be a noble warrior mean the vestige, he concluded later, of some European blood. Point twelve. he hastened to take the man's picture. At the other end of the social scale, he later noted, were beggars of almost indeterminate race. In beggars' eyes, they seemed to be walking billboards for the perils of miscegenation. They are remarkable to me, he noted, especially because of their irregular and jarring racial mixture type 13. Whenever possible, Beggar took a head or partial body cast of his subjects. He had learned a special technique employed by medical professors to make models of diseased human organs, stillborn babies, and on occasion, the faces of convicted criminals. 14 Unlike conventional plaster casting, the technique employed a soft substance called nigokal that could be heated and applied to the human face. When it set, nigokal formed a rubber-like mask. A second liquid substance either hominid or solarite could then be poured into the mask to make a positive. The result looked eerily lifelike by the standards of the day, for as the inventor of the method noted in one of his books, a beginner is able to make a flawless cast in around 10 minutes, which shows the finest plastic details of the skin under a magnifying glass 15. Such lifelike casts had become valuable commodities in academic circles in the Reich. In the mid-19th century, three German brothers, Hermann, Adolf, and Robert Schlegentweit, had taken plaster casts of many people they encountered during their travels through India and Inner Asia. By the 1880s, copies of the complete Schlegentweit collection, which consisted of 275 heads, sold for 6,000 Reichsmarks to museums and universities. Individual heads could be purchased for between 25 and 30 Reichsmarks. 16 Moreover, trade in such human replicas had become even more brisk after the Nazi seizure of power. Across the Reich, museum curators sought new and more lifelike casts of exotic untermension to liven up otherwise dry museum exhibitions on Nazi racial doctrine. 17 In addition, racial biologists purchased the casts as teaching aids to instruct students in the finer points of racial typing. Head casting had become a profitable line of business. Beggar tried to collect as many casts as possible. He had begun in Gangtok by bribing his personal servant, a Nepalese Sherpa, Pasang, who was in poor health. Pasang was clearly terrified at the prospect of being replicated, but he tried to keep his composure as Beggar first oiled his face, then applied a thick slop like paste. Before long, some of the paste dripped into one of Pasang's nostrils, making breathing difficult. Beggar insisted that he remain still, however, allowing the cast to set, but the frightened man could not wait. He leapt out of the chair, clawing at the mask forming on his face as if he was possessed by the devil. 18 Beggar and several others tried pinning the unfortunate man to the ground, but by then he was panic-stricken, flailing his arms wildly and uttering strange roaring sounds. Beggar looked on with growing alarm. All of us were thinking that if he died, our expedition which we had embarked upon with so much hope would be as good as dead. 
so all of us, with the same thoughts, tried to help him. 19 The German scientist stood watch over Passang as he gradually revived. Later Schaefer threatened the porters who witnessed the scene. If they breathed the word of the incident to anyone outside the expedition, Schaefer would fire the informers on the spot. Despite the strain this created, Beggar soon resumed making casts of porters and others he met on the team's travels. On the morning of January 19, 1939, Schaefer and his colleagues glimpsed with wonder the steep white and ochre walls of the Padilla of Lhasa towering high in the air. Light glinted and gleamed from its golden roof pavilions, a mesmerizing sight. Like other travelers on the road, Schaefer and his team dismounted and bowed in silence to the stronghold of Lamaism 20. The Padilla was the fabled home of the Dalai Lama, the spiritual and political head of Tibet. The 13th Dalai Lama had died six years earlier and Tibetan monks had only succeeded in locating his reincarnation in 1937, in a small village in northeastern Tibet. As a young boy, the new Dalai Lama could not play any part in governing the remote kingdom. Indeed, he had not even arrived yet in Lhasa. In his place a council of ministers and a powerful regent, Ritiang Rinpoche, ruled the country. Schaefer had received word earlier that a celebration awaited their arrival in Lhasa. He was expecting a warm reception an important Tibetan welcoming committee, traditional gifts of white silk scarves known as katas, an invitation to inspect a Tibetan guard of honor, crowds of curious Tibetans, and accommodation in one of the larger mansions of Lhasa. But apart from a swarm of beggars that descended upon them as they reached the western gate of Lhasa, the Tibetans took little notice of their new guests. As Beggar recalled later, a simple official greeted us and showed us to our quarters 21 this lodging consisted of a small, shabby, foul-smelling government house. The paltry welcome did not bode at all well for the team's success in Lhasa. Schaefer intended to ask for permission to film and photograph the people of Lhasa and to extend their stay, all of which would require careful diplomacy. So he hurried off to pay his respects to the Tibetan ministers, as well as to Tsarongjisa, an important member of the nobility who had once served as commander-in-chief of the Tibetan army. Schaefer, who had taken lessons in Tibetan manners from one of his interpreters, was gracious and charming and respectful and invariably arrived at these appointments bearing expensive gifts HMV portable gramophones and records, Philips radio sets, Zeiss binoculars. To further cultivate favor, Schaefer made frequent mention of what he called a common bond between the Himalayan nation and Germany, the swastika. For centuries, Tibetans had regarded the ancient symbol as a sign of good fortune and permanence. To capitalize on this, Schaefer had brought a supply of Nazi pennants with him and took pleasure in pointing out to his hosts how revered the symbol was in Nazi Germany. 22 The Tibetans were delighted, little knowing that in Europe the swastika had come to symbolize the dark forces of German ultranationalism. Indeed, one influential Tibetan remarked innocently to the team that it is the first time that the eastern and western swastika could meet under the banner of peace, on the neutral basis of cultural exchange and scholarly activities 23. In an official report dispatched to Germany on January 23, just four days after the team's arrival, Schaefer stressed the progress they had made in warming up Tibet's ruling men. The Tibetan government was about to let their secrets out to the Germans and show us life in the capital and in the huge monastery cities 24 moreover, the cabinet was prepared to allow the Germans to film Lhasa and its medieval setting and extend their stay much longer than the original 14 days. It is a wonderful feeling, Schaefer concluded, to know that the power of the German Reich is so great that it reaches into the most isolated parts of the inner Asian continent 25. So pleased were the Tibetan authorities with Schaefer's gifts and good manners that they gave the team freedom to explore the exotic streets and temples of Lhasa. As Beggar wandered each day past market stalls laden with dark, pungent bricks of dry tea, bales of fine silk and cheap printed cloth, heaps of scarlet chili peppers and fragrant nutmeg, and fine jewelry of amber and coral, he gaped at the exotic wares and the even more exotic press of humanity. There were shaven-headed monks wrapped in dark red robes, burly yak herders muffled in heavy sheepskin robes, delicate-looking high officials dressed in shimmering brocade shubas, with an elegant turquoise earring dangling from one ear. 
Beggar wished in vain that he could bring out his calipers and spreading compasses. When the team finally managed to gain an audience with Regent Reading Rimpaki, Beggar stared at the young ruler's face intently for a long time. He was particularly gratified to see that the frail, spindly young man had an especially long thin head 26 the object of this intense scrutiny, however, completely misunderstood the nature of the young German's longing gaze. Reading Rimpaka smiled warmly at the anthropologist and later asked him to join his bodyguard, where the two could presumably get to know each other much better. Afterward, Beggar noticed that one of the regent's young male attendants seemed to serve the inverted desires of his master. Point 27. The team was greatly restricted in the scientific work they could do in Lhasa, but they were resolved to make the best possible use of their time. Schaefer seems to have asked for samples of grains from Lhasa's granaries to add to the collection he had already acquired from Sikkimesa and Tibetan farmers and root point 28 the German government was extremely keen to develop new forms of vegetable oils and increase the yield of its cereal crops. It hoped to become agriculturally self-sufficient. Tibet, with its highland fields, seemed a promising place to look for new, hardier, disease-resistant varieties of barley, wheat, and oats. Point 29 So Schaefer was particularly pleased to discover what he later called Lassa's 60-day grain 30 it could be harvested just two months after it was sown. During the colorful New Year's festival in Lassa, Schaefer and Krauss spent days filming the magnificent dances and parades, when crowds of onlookers turned out in their finest clothes. During the quieter periods, Beggar set off to visit the most important monasteries in the region, some of which were the size of small cities. As the chief repositories of Tibetan learning, these huge institutions housed important libraries of rare Tibetan books. Beggar carried with him a very long wish list. 31 He wanted to collect stories from the ancient Tibetan epic, the Gisar, pictures and drawings of the Tibetan gods, copies of the Tibetan astrological tables and calendars and detailed information on the old holy places of the ancient shamanistic religion of Tibet, known as the Bone, which predated Buddhism. He also wanted to obtain floor plans of each monastery and an exact record of all inscriptions carved on the monastic walls. Last but not least, he wanted to collect copies of the most valuable books which consisted of loose sheets of paper protected between two separate wooden boards and interview the scholars who knew them best. All these sources might yield clues to the presence of ancient Aryan lords in Tibet. To obtain these things, Beggar began cultivating the monks and other officials. He filled his notebooks with interesting remarks from their conversations, jotting down Tibetan lore about the swastika and quickly sketching details about the four castes of Tibet. The first caste, he noted approvingly, hailed from the race of gods second, from non-gods third, from the ruling races and fourth, from subject race S.32 he also managed to collect a priceless copy of a 108 volume encyclopedia of Lamaism. As a rule, Tibetan monks were reluctant to part with such treasures. They had previously bestowed only three copies upon Europeans. All three, however, sat on the shelves of European libraries, gathering dust. Schaefer intended to see German scholars claim the distinction as the first translators. After more than two months of visiting the great mansions of Lhasa and sipping yak butter tea with high officials, Schaefer was growing restless. He felt it was time to push on. By much humoring and wooing of the regent and other key officials, he had wrangled permission to visit what many scholars called the birthplace of Tibetan civilization, the Yarlung Valley. It was a rare coup, one made all the sweeter by the knowledge that such consent had been denied to British officials. So Schaefer and his companions bid their goodbyes to their hosts. After all the diplomacy, and the intrigue and undercurrents of tension in Lhasa, Schaefer felt relieved to be on the road again. The caravan wound its way eastward across a patchwork of farms, toward the Yarlung Valley. It was a place Tibetans treasured. They believed that their first kings were divine beings who slid down from heaven on a sky cord, landing near Lhabab Rai, a mountain bordering the Yarlung Valley. When their reigns had ended, these kings climbed back up the dangling cord to the celestial realm. Eventually, however, an unlucky thing had happened, 
one of the monarchs accidentally severed his silken escape route while battling a court magician. After that, Tibet's kings died as ordinary mortals did. Tibetans believed that their earliest kings ruled from a great stone fortress known as Yumbula Gang in the valley. To Schaefer, it sounded like an ideal spot to search for traces of primeval Nordic overlords. He intended to be the first white scholar to study the secret of Yarlanpatrang, the ancient capital city of Tibet 33. As the team crossed down into the Yarlan Valley, Schaefer reveled in the green peacefulness. He later described the region as paradisial 34 but the ruins of the ancient royal stronghold, Yumbulagang, perched upon a high mountainous spur, proved something of a disappointment. Neither Schaefer nor his colleagues could see much sign of a great palace, still less an ancient capital. All that remained were mighty watchtowers, which are still to this day testimonies to the brave warriors and courageous soldiers who stood at the side of Tibet's ancient kings. 35 The team pitched camp at the foot of the spur and spent two days carefully surveying and mapping these ruins. Then they turned back westward toward Shigatse, Tibet's second largest city. Beggar planned on purchasing traditional Tibetan rugs, teapots, stampa bowls, and other goods in the markets there for the team's ethnographic collection. Relations between the team and British officials in the region steadily deteriorated, however, as the weeks passed. By the midsummer of 1939, family members and friends in Germany were urging them in letters to return home as soon as possible. In March, Hitler had sent armored columns into the old Czech heartland, occupying Prague, and declaring the industrially rich provinces of Bohemia and Moravia a protectorate. Now Hitler's eyes were trained greedily on Poland. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain had vowed to defend Poland in the event of German military aggression, but no one knew if he would honor his word. Only one thing was clear. If Westminster did declare war, Schaefer and his companions would find themselves in a very difficult spot. British officials would almost certainly arrest them and clap them into an internment camp in India for the duration of the war. The team had hatched half a dozen adventurous plans for their return trip, even considering at one point driving back from India to Berlin. But Schaefer loathed the thought of capture and imprisonment by the British. He informed the team it was time to wrap things up, and he contacted Himmler's personal staff, who began making arrangements for the team to fly back to Germany. Meanwhile, he, Gear, and Krauss carefully packed up the voluminous natural history collections animal and bird skins, butterflies, bees, ants, wasps, and other insect specimens, fragile dried plants for the herbarium, packets of seeds containing 1,600 varieties of barley, 700 varieties of wheat, and 700 varieties of oats, not to mention hundreds of seeds from other potentially useful plants. 36 They also arranged for sturdy crates to be built for the live animals they had captured or acquired for German zoos. Three breeds of Tibetan dogs, rare feline species, wolves, badgers, and foxes. 37 Beggar saw to it that his valuable ethnographical collection of nomad tents and llama trumpets was safely stowed in trunks. During his Tibetan travels, he had photographed nearly 2,000 Tibetans, Buddhians, Sherpas, and Nepalis. He had measured 376 individuals and cast the heads and faces of 17, including two of the most powerful men in Tibet Tsarong, a close friend of the 13th Dalai Lama and a former commander-in-chief of the Tibetan army, and Mondo, a Tibetan noble raised and educated in England. It would take time to thoroughly analyze his measurements, but based on what he had seen, he thought it very likely that the Nordic race had changed the course of Asian history. The first colonists of Tibet seemed to have been ancient Mongolians who settled in the mountainous land after the last ice age ended. He believed, however, that racially mixed descendants of ancient Nordic invaders had swept into the Tibetan plateau more recently, giving rise ultimately to the higher Tibetan classes 38 The proof, as he saw it, lay in the supposed Nordic characteristics of Tibetan nobles tall stature paired with long head, narrow face, receding cheekbones, strongly protruding, straight or slightly bent noses, smooth hair, and a sense of themselves as dominant 39. The five scholars boarded a British Indian Airways flight in Calcutta, and switched in Baghdad to a German flight. 
For the next leg of the trip, from Vienna to Munich, they traveled in Himmler's own personal aircraft, the Otto Kill and Beth. And both Himmler and his chief of staff, SS Gruppenführer Karl Wolf, were on the runway in Munich when the plane touched down at 5.10 p.m. on August 4, 1939. Schaefer was flattered and delighted to see Himmler. It was sunny and warm a splendid summer day in Bavaria and the stocky zoologist beamed broadly as he walked side by side with Himmler down the tarmac toward the terminal. His colleagues followed respectfully a few paces behind. Together, the SS chief and the scientists had a cup of coffee in a private room in the terminal. Schaefer likely explained that he carried with him an official letter from the Tibetan regent, Ritiang Rinpoche, for Hitler. In addition, the regent had given him three gifts to present to the German leader a Tibetan mastiff, a gold coin, and the robe of a lama. Schaefer believed that the garment, which was carefully wrapped, had once belonged to the former Dalai Lama, and he hoped to meet with Hitler in person to deliver it. Point 40 The SS leader listened to the zoologist's account attentively, and together they proceeded to board the plane for a major press conference and official reception in Berlin. The next morning, all across the country, Germans read sensational news of the expedition. As they sipped their steaming coffees in cafes and unfolded their newspapers on trains, their eyes lit on the headlines, Hitler's delegation in Tibet, the first Germans in Lhasa, and the first white men in Yarlungpatrang. Himmler was delighted by the great splash of attention, particularly as it reached all the way to the Reich Chancellery. Hitler, it seems, had finally taken notice of one of his cherished projects. Soon after the Tibet team's return, Schaefer received a rare mark of favor and invitation to lecture on his Tibetan work to an audience of senior Nazis. Hitler himself would be in attendance. Point 41. 14 in Sievers's office. For many Germans, stories of exotic lamas and romantic Himalayan lands were a welcome relief from the grim invective occupying the pages of most German dailies in late August 1939. For weeks, German newspapers had railed viciously against the Poles, reporting murderous attacks on the German community in Danzig. The increasingly shrill accounts of foreign persecution part of a massive propaganda campaign orchestrated by the staff of Joseph Goebbels were clearly a prelude to a new German invasion. Poland was next on the list, and many Germans worried whether Hitler wasn't biting off more than he could chew. Would the government of Neville Chamberlain meekly back away from its vow to defend Polish independence? Would Stalin seize the moment and attack? German officials were bracing for the worst. At the end of July, they instructed Berliners to begin practicing air raid drills. Point one a few weeks later, they began handing out ration cards for meat and such luxuries as jam, sugar, and coffee. But on the morning of Thursday, August 24, the German government announced a dazzling coup. Hitler, it seemed, had fooled everyone, signing a major non-aggression treaty with Germany's greatest enemy, the Soviet Union. With one stroke of the pen, the German leader had turned one of Nazi Germany's most formidable foes into an ally, eliminating the danger of a bloody war along the eastern borders of the Reich. It was a masterful stroke. The new pact seemed to all but guarantee that the British would now step aside and allow the German Wehrmacht to begin carving up Poland. Germans were elated. In Berlin, they took to the streets in celebration. Point two. In his elegant office in Delam, Wolfram Sievers welcomed the news. He had grown accustomed to the privileged life of a high-ranking Nazi official, riding through Grunewald each morning and attending important receptions in an expensive new dress suit in the evenings three it was all much preferable to crawling through enemy fire. Sievers, moreover, had important work to do. While Schaefer and his colleagues were roaming Inner Asia, measuring the crumbling glory of ancient Tibetan strongholds, the senior scientists and scholars of the Ananurb had been busy at their desks. Some had planned major new expeditions to remote corners of the world, from Bolivia to the Canary Islands. Others had proposed projects on medieval village life to help organize the future SS settlements. And a few were clinically accumulating racial data for the day when the SS would uproot all Jews and their mixed-race descendants from the Reich. It was up to Sievers to orchestrate all this research, to cut through the flimsy excuses of Nazi officialdom, 
to slash away the endless rolls of red tape, to prod the unwilling, flatter the important, cajole the incompetent anything to get the job done. In his spare hours, Sievers was a musician. He played the harpsichord, organ, and piano, and he particularly loved the music of Bach, in all its rich textured complexity. But Sievers reserved his greatest dexterity for his work in the sprawling villa in Delem. There he spent his days on the telephone, in meetings, and at his desk arranging financing, foreign currency, steamship company tickets, passports, balloon-mounted cameras, aerial surveillance aircraft indeed, almost anything that Ananurb researchers needed for their important work. Sievers seemed to be everywhere and anywhere, on top of every file. Without him, everything in the Ananurb would grind to a halt. By far the most urgent problem on his desk was the massive expedition of Edmund Kiss. Kiss, an architect and writer by profession, was mounting the Ananurb's largest and most expensive expedition yet. Its destination was the Bolivian Andes. During an earlier trip to the region, Kiss claimed to have located the stone ruins of an ancient Nordic colony in the New World. Bolivians called the site Tiwanaku. Kiss declared that the elaborately carved temples of Tiwanaku dated back more than one million years. This was at least 800,000 years before the evolution of modern humans. Point four, and as if all that were not wildly exorbitant enough, Kiss also alleged to have found crucial new geological proof of something known as the World Ice Theory, a crackpot paradigm that many influential national socialists adored. Kiss was exactly the kind of man with whom Himmler enjoyed socializing. At 53, he was a commanding presence, standing 6 foot 3 and tipping the scales at 224 pounds. Point five, he possessed a broad, sturdy face, ears that splayed out from his head, wire rimmed spectacles that curled around him, and a determined stamp to his mouth. Point six, he spoke bluntly, kept his word faithfully, conducted his affairs with a gentleman's sense of honor, and was, judging from the testimonies of his friends and co workers after the war, kindness itself toward his subordinates. Point seven, he also possessed a distinguished military record. He not only survived two gunshot wounds, a serious case of malaria, and four years of mucking in the trenches in the First World War, but also won two Iron Crosses, one of them a first class. Point eight. After the war, Kiss took his examinations as a building contractor and settled in Munster, where he began to study the world ice theory. The bizarre theory tossed out most conventional scientific ideas about the universe. In their place, it offered a new explanation for just about everything the origins of the solar system, sunspots, the appearance of the Milky Way, the creation of the human race, the sinking of Atlantis, and some of the more obscure passages of ancient Icelandic creation stories. The theory was the brainchild of an Austrian engineer, Hans Horbiger, who prided himself on the fact that he never performed calculations and who firmly believed that mathematics was deceptive. Nine, his ideas greatly appealed to right wing extremists who were always looking for ways of Germanizing science and junking anything that smacked of Jewish science. The Nazis regarded Horbiger as a genius. Point 10, they intended to consign Albert Einstein to oblivion. Kiss was fascinated by Horbiger, who likened the universe to a giant steam engine filled with hydrogen and water vapor. In the distant past, Horbiger suggested, small stars thickly clad in ice had collided with steaming hot giant stars, spewing stellar material into space. This material then condensed into planets of varying sizes that spiraled around the sun. As the smaller planets edged closer toward the larger ones, they were ensnared by gravity and captured as moons. Horbiger believed that Earth had known six of these satellites. The serial destruction of the first five, he suggested, had led to vast, almost unimaginable environmental catastrophes on Earth. As each had spiraled downward into the atmosphere, it had revolved faster and faster, creating an immense gravitational pull. This force had then yanked the Earth's waters toward the equator, forming an immense tide resembling a giant spare tire around Earth's girth, beyond the perimeters of this towering wall of water, the land surface froze beneath thick glacial ice. Only in certain mountain refuges the Bolivian Andes, the Tibetan Himalayas, the Ethiopian highlands had flora and fauna survived. 
each of the plummeting moons had then exploded in turn in the atmosphere, releasing oceans and seas to flow back over the Earth. The last of these celestial explosions, claimed Horbiger, had taken place more than 11,000 years ago. Point 11. This theory was pure, unadulterated nonsense, condemned in the strongest terms by German astronomers and other serious scientists in the 1930s. The world ice theory, noted one prominent mathematician, combined the tyranny of an Asiatic despot and the presumption of a mathematical illiterate who, with childish innocence, strides up to things about which he knows nothing and ventures to substitute a caricature for a scientific picture of the universe 12 but Kiss and many other Nazis were deaf to such criticism. Horbiger's talk of giant tides and vast sheets of glacial ice provided a neat explanation for scientists' inability to find any trace of an ancient Aryan civilization in the far north. No less an eminence than Hitler himself had latched onto these outlandish ideas. I'm quite well inclined to accept the cosmic theories of Horbiger, he noted one night over dinner, before launching into a muddled description of the engineer's ideas. Point 13. What Horbiger's supporters desperately needed, however, was proof of the primeval cataclysms that Horbiger had described. Kiss was acutely conscious of this. So in 1927, he began searching about for evidence. He wrote to a silver-haired Austrian expatriate, Arthur Poznanski, in Bolivia. Poznanski had begun a detailed study of ancient stone ruins in the Bolivian Andes one of the places that the world ice theory predicated as a mountain refuge. He had published and lectured extensively on Tiwanaku. Situated just south of Lake Titicaca, the prehistoric capital had once ruled a mighty empire whose power extended all the way from the Bolivian rainforest to the northern coast of Chile and northwestern Argentina. By the 20th century, however, Tiwanaku lay in scattered pieces. Looters had plundered most of its wealth, leaving only huge inscribed tablets and immense doorways carved with jaguars and strange mythological characters. Some blocks weighed more than 400 tons. Most professional archaeologists of the day knew that an indigenous Andean people forerunners of the Inca had designed and built Tiwanaku. But Poznanski strongly disagreed. He suggested that a mysterious group of immigrants from the far west designed the great capital and put Andeans to work building it. He also asserted that construction on at least one of Tiwanaku's great temples began 17,000 years ago, an erroneous contention based on his own calculations of certain astronomical alignments of the walls. Point 14 Lastly, Poznanski believed he had discovered an ancient calendar of some sort carved into the stone above a Tiwanaku portal. Point 15 Kiss sponged up these ideas, convinced that the mysterious architects were none other than the Aryans. So fascinated was he, indeed, that he journeyed to South America in 1928, subsidized by a 20,000 mark prize he had won in a writing contest. For months, Kiss studied Tiwanaku's ruins, sketching their floor plans and their inscriptions. He was particularly struck by an ancient sculpture of a man's head unearthed from one of its ruins. It is immediately clear, he noted later, that this man is not Indian nor does he have Mongolian characteristics, but rather pure Nordic ones. 16 Moreover, he continually jotted down notes about what he thought were European touches in the stone monuments. The doors are framed as they were in the Baroque period, he observed, and the construction of the eastern facade shows a series of cross symbols underneath an entablature that is easily identified as Greek 17. He brusquely dismissed any suggestion that ancient Andeans had designed the splendid temples. The works of art and the architectural style of the prehistoric city are certainly not of Indian origin, he wrote later. Rather they are probably the creations of Nordic men who arrived in the Andean highlands as representatives of a special civilization. 18 The big question in Kiss's mind was when this migration had happened. He peered and squinted at the massive inscribed relief on the ruin known today as Gateway to the Sun. Was it truly a calendar? Kiss thought it very likely and he became convinced he could decipher it. Point 19 He felt certain he could see symbols for 12 months of the year, each possessing either 24 or 25 days. He also thought it certain that each of the days had 30 hours, and each hour 22 minutes. Kiss regarded the inscription as compelling proof of Horbiger's theory. The Tiwanaku inscription, he concluded, 
was a calendar reflecting the primordial conditions on Earth when an earlier moon rapidly orbited the planet. He had no means of determining when this had happened, but this did not stop him from leaping to a wild conclusion. One thing we do know and it would be extremely hard to convince us otherwise even if the age of Tiwanaku cannot even be guessed, it must be at least millions of years old, 20. Back in Germany, Kiss began determinately popularizing his ideas, first in a series of fantasy novels set in Atlantis and South America, and then in a more scientific-sounding book entitled The Sun Gate of Tiwanaku. He illustrated the latter with his own architectural drawings of massive Nazi-style monumental temples and tall, slim inhabitants dressed in a strange futuristic fashion. The editors of Nazi party newspapers and magazines were delighted. Both S.A. Mann and Die Hitler Jugend, the official magazine of Hitler Youth, ran popular articles on Kiss's research, illustrated by the architect's drawings. These pieces extolled the beauty of the lordly Nordic colony of Tiwanaku, and described, as if it were now proven scientific fact, how the ancient Andean capital had collapsed during the cataclysms triggered by a falling moon. Point 21 Himmler was so pleased with the book that he ordered a copy to be expensively bound in leather as a Christmas gift for Hitler. Point 22. But Kiss longed to expand his field research. He yearned to return to Bolivia with a large interdisciplinary team of scientists to search for fossil evidence of ancient flooding and to conduct extensive excavations at both Tiwanaku and nearby Seminake. He hoped to unearth compelling new evidence of the ancient master race in the Americas and requested backing from the Ananurb. Himmler and Wust were both wildly enthusiastic. One can now quite certainly expect results which might have a revolutionary importance for the history of mankind, opined Wust.23. Kiss drew up meticulous plans and relayed his needs to Sievers. Over the next year and a half, the two men worked together on the project, interrupted only when Himmler dispatched Kiss on a brief research trip to Libya to scour the Mediterranean coast for fossil evidence of the world ice theory. Point 24 By late August of 1939, the mushrooming plans called for a team of 20 archaeologists, geologists, zoologists, botanists, meteorologists, pilots, and underwater experts to toil on the project for a year. Point 25 In addition to the archaeological digs, Kiss planned to Explore the deep waters of Lake Titicaca by underwater camera. He also proposed flying across the Andes so that film crews could shoot footage of the famous Inca roads, which Kiss believed were the work of Nordic Lords. Point 26 Last but certainly not least, he also intended to conduct extensive geological fieldwork from Colombia to Peru to find evidence of ancient celestial cataclysms. Sievers estimated that the salaries of the team members alone would cost 100,000 Reichsmarks, or some $520,000 today, taking inflation into account. Point 27 But Himmler did not flinch at the cost, and by late August 1939, Sievers was deeply immersed in the final arrangements for the trip booking the team's passage to South America, locating a pilot experienced enough to undertake aerial photography in the high Andes, and organizing payment of all the team members' salaries. It was a mammoth task greatly complicated by the plotting bureaucracy of the Nazi state and the pressing nature of Sievers's other duties. In Munich, Walther Wust was planning a small expedition to the grey and forbidding mountains of western Iran. Point 28 The Ananurb superintendent had never traveled to Asia, but since arriving at the Ananurb he had succumbed to expedition fever. In 1938, he proposed leading a group of researchers to study and record the famous by Saiton inscription in Iran. The inscription preserved the autobiography of Darius I, one of the greatest kings of ancient Persia. Point 29 In the 6th century BC, Darius had seized the throne by murdering a rival. He had then successfully extended the borders of his realm as far east as the Indus Valley, before launching an ill-fated invasion of Greece. Wust considered Darius to be a great Aryan monarch. Moreover, he thought his story particularly relevant to the Reich of the 1930s. 30 Darius had usurped a throne, ruthlessly extinguished other contenders, stamped out rebellions, and forged a vast empire of diverse peoples. This sounded like the blueprint for Hitler's career. Wust also believed that empire building was an integral part of the Nordic psyche, a trait that characterized all major Nordic leaders through time. 
In all places on earth where the Indo-Germanic peoples turn up, he wrote, they enter into history because of their creation of states and empires, whether it be the empire of Darius I, Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, or the Empire of Charlemagne. Each introduced the Germanic form of empire to the Occident. 31 such claims were patently false, but they greatly appealed to Himmler, suggesting as they did that Hitler was following his destiny as a Nordic leader by founding the Third Reich. If Wust was to popularize the story of Darius and curate an important museum show about him, the Ananerb had to acquire an exact copy of the inscription. This would be no easy matter. Darius had ordered his sculptors and scribes not only to inscribe the story of his victories at Bai Saitun, but to preserve the account for posterity. So his servants had constructed a high stairway up a steep cliff at Bai Saitun. Perched precariously upon a narrow ledge 100 feet in the air, they carved Darius's words in three languages and delicately sculpted a large relief of Darius standing majestically in front of a long line of his vanquished foes. 32 When they were finished, they destroyed the wooden stairs up the cliff, placing Darius's words beyond the reach of most vandals. Some 2,500 years later, a young British linguist learned of the mysterious carving. In a feat of great daring and athleticism, Henry Rawlinson scaled the crumbling cliff and copied by hand almost two-thirds of the inscription for scholarly research. His young Kurdish assistant then recorded most of what remained by applying damp pulp to the surface of the inscriptions and pressing it against the indentations to make exact casts. 33 with these copies, Rawlinson and other scholars deciphered three dead languages Old Persian, Elamite, the administrative tongue of the Persian Empire, and Akkadian, the language of Babylon and opened a lost door to the early civilizations of the Middle East. Rawlinson had copied the inscription with marvelous accuracy, but he had erred somewhat in his interpretations of badly weathered and nearly illegible passages. Moreover, neither Rawlinson nor his assistant had been able to reach or copy a small portion of the text. So Wust proposed to journey to Bicyton to create a new scientific recording of the inscription in accordance with the will of the RFSS and head of the German police, Heinrich Himmler 34. At 37, Wust was a bulky, desk-bound scholar plagued by knee problems. 35 he was incapable of climbing his way up a sheer cliff, and he could see that building a large scaffold would take too much time and manpower. So Wust intended to rely upon a new technology devised by an American archaeologist suspending a camera from a tethered balloon and floating the device alongside the cliff face at Bai Saitun.36 with a long cable release to activate the shutter, Wust and his colleagues could snap photographs of the inscription. Already SS archaeologists had enjoyed some success with the technique, employing it to take aerial photographs of an excavation at Tilsit in eastern Prussia.37. Wust planned to travel to Bai Saitun with his wife and a team of four a scientific amanuensis, an Iranian student who would be responsible for dealing with the local inhabitants, a photographer to take care of the imaging, and a mountain climber to clamber up and down the cliffs to guide the balloon-mounted camera to the right spot. 38 Wust was convinced that there was no time to lose. The inscription itself, he noted in one letter, is situated on a steep cliff wall, and with each passing year it is more and more in danger of being damaged or even destroyed in the most important parts by a strong torrent 39. Wust had already approached the German Research Foundation for financing point 40 but it was Sievers's job to take care of other logistical matters from locating a suitable photographer for the team to persuading officials at the Reich Aviation Ministry to provide the Ananerb with the necessary balloons. As Sievers contemplated solutions to these problems, he also labored on the arrangements for two other expeditions. The first was a relatively small affair a field trip to the Canary Islands led by Dr. Otto Huth. Huth worked in the Ananerb offices in Dilem as an expert in religious science, specializing in ancient Aryan spiritual beliefs. 41 He had read nearly everything ever written on the aboriginal inhabitants of the Canary Islands a small archipelago located off the coast of northwest Africa and had arrived at a novel conclusion. Huth believed that the original Canarians were in fact members of a pure, undiluted line of the Nordic race, who had preserved ancient Aryan religious practices well into the 15th century. Huth was a former protege of Hermann Wirth. A fine-boned man, 
with a long face, sharp nose, heavy glasses, and a thin Cupid's bow mouth frequently drawn into a self-satisfied smile, he spoke seven languages including Hebrew and was a fervent Nazi. He had become politically active as a teenager, joining an ultra-nationalist group in the Rhineland that was later absorbed into the Nazi party. At 22, Huck took out membership in the SA, the party's political combat troops, and for a time he worked as a reader for the official party department to protect Nazi writing, the agency that dispatched the Gestapo to seize books failing to conform to Nazi doctrine. Point 42. Huff seems to have acquired his passionate interest in the Canary Islands from Worth. The older scholar firmly believed that the islands once formed the southern edge of a vast primeval Aryan homeland, Atlantis, and had somehow escaped devastation. Point 43. Intrigued by this notion, Huth had sopped up historical accounts of the ancient Canarians, a tribal society of prosperous farmers and herders. The Canarians, he learned, had shaved with stone knives, painted their bodies green, yellow, and red, dressed in dyed goat skins, and mummified the bodies of their leaders. On islands scattered some 60 miles off the coast of northwestern Africa, they had long lived in relative isolation. During the 13th century, However, European navigators began to frequent their ports, carrying news of the islanders back to Europe. Eventually Spanish ships arrived to begin baptizing the Canarians by the sword. The inhabitants fought tooth and nail, but they could not long resist European muskets and European germs. Point 44 By the early 16th century, only a few of the aboriginal Canarians remained. They had little choice but to marry into the families of European settlers. It was a story that appalled Huth, who was no lover of Christianity. This conquering of the Canary Islands by the Christian Spaniards, he observed in one article, is a shocking tragedy and one of the most appalling examples of the poisonous effects of Jewish Christianity on the soul of European people. 45. Huth's sense of this tragedy was considerably compounded by his particular concept of the Canarians. He noted with delight that some early European chroniclers had observed islanders with golden locks, rosy cheeks, and white skin. He was also fascinated by the accounts of later travelers who found Canarian mummies with blonde tresses. But Huth was a very selective reader. He deliberately ignored the warning of a contemporary, the prominent American anthropologist Ernest Houghton, who had written a major book on the ancient Canarians. As Houghton pointed out, the chemical nature of the preservatives and time itself often had a bleaching effect upon the mummy's hair. Point 46 Huth, however, saw only what he wanted to see. Separated from the disturbances of European world history, he could later in print, the ancient Nordic civilization blossomed undisturbed on the Happy Islands until it was destroyed. 47. Huth was anxious to study the religious practices of the ancient Canarians, certain that they would shed valuable new light on the beliefs of the primordial Aryans. First, however, he had to clinch the racial origins of the Canarians. Point 48 for his expedition, he planned on taking a racial scientist to perform detailed measurements on both the living and the dead. Point 49 he also intended to take an archaeologist to sift through collections of Canarian pottery shards and stone tools in hopes of detecting similarities to those of ancient Nordic peoples. This he firmly believed, would give numerous results 50. Huth planned to depart for the Canary Islands in the fall of 1939, and was bubbling with enthusiasm for the venture. We have a head start in the source material, he wrote to Wust, and now we have to obtain a head start in the field work, thereby securing the best canary research for the Ananurb 51. In addition to completing the arrangements for Huth's trip, Sievers also had to find a way of salvaging an important Ananurb field trip to Iceland. The leader of the trip, Dr. Bruno Schweitzer, was an old classmate of Himmler. 52 He was also one of the Ananurb's most senior researchers. An expert on Germany's complex maze of dialects, Schweitzer headed the Ananurb's research center for Germanic studies in Detmold. There he supervised a wide range of projects deciphering runestones, translating ancient Germanic documents, compiling old Germanic place names, and offering public tours of Externstein, a site that many Nazi scholars deemed to be a primeval Germanic shrine. Even so, 
Schweitzer had still found time to plan a major Ananerb expedition to Iceland. Nazi scholars took a peculiar view of Iceland. Many saw its rocky lands as a kind of racial icebox, a place that preserved some of the purest strains of Nordic blood and the richest legacy of ancient Germanic tradition. In reality, however, Iceland's inhabitants traced their roots largely to Scandinavian ancestors. In AD 874, an adventuresome Norse chieftain, Ingolfur Arneson, had crammed his family and his retainers and thralls into large wooden ships and sailed westward to Iceland, which was inhabited at the time by a few Irish hermits. Arneson settled in what is now Reykjavik, the hermits promptly left. Other Scandinavians soon followed, and along the coast they cut down forests, raised timber halls, slept in warm sod houses, and tended their livestock. Many followed the old pagan religion of Scandinavia, and the most stubborn of their descendants clung to these beliefs long after Iceland formally recognized Christianity in the year 1000. As a result, in the 12th and 13th centuries the old bards of Iceland still sang and wrote of heathen gods, committing their beliefs to paper in the sagas. Nazi scholars, however, stubbornly insisted on seeing the founders of Iceland as their German forefathers. Point 53 As one SS researcher noted in a letter to the German Research Foundation in 1935, nowhere can the primeval history of our people be recognized in a more thorough and true way than in Iceland, where it has been maintained free from foreign influences on race, customs, and language due to its historical development and geographical position. The new knowledge about old Germanic traits will not be collected from the sagas, because there are already good translations of them, but rather from the study of family records, state records, and traditional customs. Iceland gives an untainted Germanic picture, free of Roman ideas, even in places where people have embraced baptism. 54. Schweitzer strongly subscribed to these beliefs. He had already journeyed three times to Iceland, and had brought back an Icelandic wife for himself of old farmer stock as well as a fine pair of Icelandic horses. Point 55 He installed the horses in the SS Nature Reserve near Externstein, where guides showed them to visitors as living continuations of the ancient Germanic horse race. 56 Schweitzer believed that this hardy Icelandic breed could be of great value to future SS colonists. They are raised half wild and are only brought into the stalls in the winter he observed in a short article for the SS calendar. In three days, they can travel around 200 kilometers, only needing grass at the rest stops for their food 57. Schweitzer was convinced that Iceland held many other treasures of value to the SS. In 1938, he proposed a major Ananerb expedition to the island. He wanted to excavate an ancient farm and a heathen temple to learn more about ancient Germanic agricultural and spiritual practices. Point 58 He was also keen on making a detailed inventory of the old assembly places, the things, examining the architecture of ancient Icelandic sod houses, photographing artifacts in Iceland's National Museum in Reykjavik, and gathering soil samples for pollen analysis. The latter would supply data on Iceland's paleoclimate. Last but not least, he hoped to record old Icelandic songs in the countryside and in Reykjavik, and film the renowned ballad dances of the Faroe Islands, en route to Iceland. Himmler lent his full support to the project. Point 59 Like Schweitzer, he regarded Iceland as an invaluable archive of ancient Germanic lore, and he relished the data that Schweitzer's research would bring. Point 60 New details on the things, the architecture of medieval sod houses, old agricultural tools and customs, as well as traditional Icelandic songs and dances would all greatly assist SS planners in arranging and regulating practices in future SS colonies in the East. Point 61. Schweitzer initially proposed departing around the summer solstice, and picked a team of seven young scholars from an expert on ancient German buildings to the prominent Ananerb archaeologist Herbert Jankin whose research on bog bodies seems to have inspired Himmler's justification for the arrest, imprisonment, and brutal abuse of gay men. But the entire expedition fell seriously off the rails in late February 1939, when the German embassy in Copenhagen forwarded to Berlin a series of scathing press reports. Scandinavian reporters had learned, much to their amusement, that a German expedition was heading to Iceland. 62 They regarded the entire project as ludicrous, 
and did not hesitate to point out its faulty logic to their readers. Today a private telegram from Berlin arrived at the newspaper Politiken, announcing that the head of the secret state police, Heinrich Himmler, wants to outfit a comprehensive ancestry research expedition to Iceland in order to find his ancestors. A large number of genealogists have received the order to travel along in order to excavate the ancestors. At the same time, they intend to attempt to establish the degree to which the Third Reich can be traced back to the Icelandic Vikings. We showed the telegram to the genealogist director Th. Hotch Fosbal, who had the following comment, I must assume that there is a misunderstanding because in my opinion this is pure nonsense. No genealogical connection can be made between Germany and Iceland and the German genealogists who are to be sent will have a hard time with it. It is well known that there aren't any church records dating back to the Vikings, so I cannot understand how they will prove the suspected relationship. Everything that we know about the Vikings regarding families and tribes is taken directly from the Icelandic sagas. Herr Himmler doesn't really have to mount an expedition to get acquainted with this source, as it is readily available in every bookstore, presumably including in Berlin 63. Himmler loathed being the object of ridicule. He was furious that news of the SS expedition had leaked out in such a careless way. Point 64 He forbade any further work on the trip and prohibited all direct contact between the Ananurb and Iceland. SS investigators immediately set to work searching for the informant, but they never found the leak. Point 65 After Himmler's initial rage abetted, he permitted planning for the expedition to proceed and Schweitzer and Sievers quietly picked up where they had left off. Point 66 But a few months later, a second major problem surfaced. Himmler's personal staff was unable to lay hands upon sufficient Icelandic crowns to finance this trip. Point 67 there was no immediate solution for it, so once again, Sievers rescheduled the team's departure this time for the summer of 1940. The towering stacks of paper that crossed Sievers's desk daily would have overwhelmed most other officials, but Sievers sorted through them effortlessly, navigating the labyrinthine channels of the Nazi government with ease. Indeed, the young administrator even found time to oversee other key projects for the SS. At the beginning of 1939, for example, Himmler had instructed the Ananurb to mount a major new research project on Jews. 68 Sievers was only too happy to lend a hand with the arrangements. Rass and Kunda specialists in the Reich had failed to come up with any quick, absolute way of physically identifying men and women of the Jewish race. Most of these researchers believed Jews to be an elusive blend of many purported races the Hither Asiatic and the Oriental, the Hamitic and the Inner Asiatic, the Negro and the Nordic a blend that shifted and changed from group to group, country to country. Point 69 As a result, they found it nearly impossible to put their fingers squarely on the essential physical trait the biological barcode that set Jewish men, women, and children infallibly apart from their neighbors. Point 70 There seemed to be no defining measurements such as the cephalic index they used for the supposed Nordic race to neatly separate Jews from others. For a man such as Himmler, who planned in one way or another to dispose of all Jews, including the elusive miskling, or individuals of mixed Jewish blood, this was a serious problem. Point 71 He intended to eradicate every trace of Jewish vermin from the Reich, so that there would be no chance of introducing Jewish blood into the new SS colonies. So he ordered his own SS research organization, the Ananurb, to look into the matter. Perhaps they could devise some new index of Jewishness. Sievers and Wust found a 31-year-old SS researcher, Dr. Walter Greet, to take charge of the project. Greet was a biologist by training. Point 72 He had studied the pigmentation of bird feathers as a student at the University of Göttingen, but his attraction to Nazi politics greatly influenced the direction of his research. He began delving into Rassenkunde, eventually becoming a lecturer on racial matters for a teacher training school in Frankfurt and a racial researcher for the Reich Health Office. Like many German Rassenkunde specialists, and unlike many of their superiors, including Himmler and Hitler himself, Greet looked like a walking billboard for the mythical Nordic race, with his golden hair, blue eyes, and long, narrow face. 
Sievers arranged for Greed to conduct measurements on Jewish men, women, and children who flocked each day to the Reich Central Office for Jewish Emigration in Vienna. The office was the purview of another efficient SS official, Adolf Eichmann.73 It was located in a newly Aryanized palace that had until recently belonged to the Baron Louis de Rothschild. Each morning, hundreds of desperate Jews lined up outside its black gates, quietly waiting to enter so that they might apply for the papers they needed to flee Nazi Austria. The SS guards saw to it that this was a terrifying experience, accompanied by much shouting, cursing, and brutality. 74 Only after the applicants had handed over their assets and life savings could they obtain the necessary papers. Greet and his research assistants added considerably to the humiliation, requiring applicants to submit to racial measurements a cold, dehumanizing experience. By the summer of 1939, Greet and his team had completed measurements of nearly 2,000 Jewish men, women, and children, a sufficient number for the project, and they had begun analyzing the data, making use of photographs and film footage taken at the examinations. 75 Sievers a fervent anti-Semite who had often heard his father-in-law, a physician, speak on the perils of racial mixing awaited the results with interest. 76 He knew that Himmler was counting on something of value turning up. Privately, he found this new line of research on Jews full of possibilities. Already Germany's leading racial experts were beginning to court his favor at official receptions, hoping to ally themselves with an increasingly influential research organization. 77. 15 Thieves? In the last week of October 1939, Himmler and his large entourage of senior SS and Gestapo officers rode in sleek comfort through the Polish countryside, with windows shut and shades drawn. As their private train clattered eastward past shelled villages and bombed airfields, abandoned cars, and houses pocked with bullet holes the SS chief and his staff poured over a thick stack of dispatches and reports. Himmler had equipped Zonderzug Heinrich with everything a mobile SS and Gestapo headquarters needed, three cars fitted with anti-aircraft guns, a baggage car, plush parlor, secretarial and office car, Mitropa diner, refrigerator car, six sleepers, and a radio car equipped with telegraph facilities. Point one the din from the office was nearly deafening as secretaries clattered at typewriters and tall, blonde-haired men in uniforms dictated orders in loud, rough voices. Himmler, who was tireless when he relished his work, did not want to waste a minute in completing the business at hand the destruction of Poland. Hitler had launched his assault on Poland at 4.30 on the morning of September 1st. Without any declaration of war, he had unleashed squadrons of lethal Stuka bombers upon the sleeping Polish air force and hurled five armies into the heart of Poland. The speed of the assault, the Blitzkrieg, was terrifying, and on the morning of September 3rd, Britain declared war, followed later in the day by France. Hitler took the news poorly. He had gambled that Britain would merely stand by as he methodically dismembered Poland. The German military, in the opinion of many German experts, was simply not ready for a widespread European war. Point two, but Hitler was not about to back down from World War II. In the weeks that followed, the Western Allies did little to save Poland and Hitler, who had privately vowed to annihilate the Polish people, showed no mercy on his new subjects. Point three, he directed Himmler to crush any sign of resistance. Point four, for this, Himmler dispatched six specially trained Ansatzgruppen, or roving killing units, to Poland. Each was some 5,000 strong, and made up of men from a wide range of forces under Himmler's command the SS, the criminal police, the regular German order police, and the secret state police or Gestapo. Following generally on the heels of the armies, the Ansatzgruppen searched for any sign of opposition. Point five, equipped with lists of potential enemies, they dragged priests, rabbis, landowners, peasants, doctors, teachers, and lawyers from their homes and executed them in public squares and streets. Often, they freely improvised on the terror. According to one British eyewitness in the small Polish town of Bajazic, the first victims of the campaign were a number of Boy Scouts, from 12 to 16 years of age, who were set up in the marketplace against the wall and shot. No reason was given. A devoted priest who rushed to administer the last sacrament was shot too. He received five wounds. 
A Pole said afterwards that the sight of those children lying dead was the most piteous of the horrors he saw. That week the murders continued. Thirty-four of the leading tradespeople and merchants of the town were shot, and many other leading citizens. The square was surrounded by troops with machine guns. Point six. In this way, Himmler's Einsatzgruppen slaughtered an estimated 60,000 Poles in the early weeks of the war. Point seven. On September 27, Warsaw surrendered after fierce bombardment. Almost immediately, Hitler began carving Poland up into three separate entities. He brought the western flank, a region where one in every six inhabitants descended from German families, into the Reich. Point eight, the ethnic Germans would be permitted to stay, everyone else would eventually be deported eastward. Hitler transformed the central region, which included Warsaw, Krakow and Lublin, as well as the poorest, rockiest and least fertile lands in the country, into a kind of colony known as the general government. It would become a vast no-man's land for future slave laborers Polish Christians, German Jews, Polish Jews and Gypsies. Point nine that left only Poland's eastern flank outside German control. The Soviet Union had invaded and occupied it in mid-September, but Hitler viewed this as a purely temporary arrangement until he could unleash the Wehrmacht on the Red Army. No sooner had the first corpses been trucked off Polish streets than many senior Nazis began eyeing the possibilities of plunder. For centuries Polish princes and merchant families had collected fine art, rare books and coins, and ancient manuscripts. The country's cathedrals harbored hundreds of artistic masterpieces, and its numerous museums exhibited important archaeological and historical treasures. All these prizes were now up for grabs among senior Nazis. Just four days after the armored columns of the Wehrmacht pounded across the Polish frontier, Sievers wrote to Himmler with an important suggestion. The outbreak of World War II had brought all expedition planning to an abrupt halt and the offices of the Annenerb had grown strangely quiet. Kiss's expedition to South America, Wuss's journey to Iran, Schweitzer's field trip to Iceland, and Huth's trip to the Canary Islands all had been postponed indefinitely, and it was clear to Sievers that many of the Annenerb scholars would need new projects to occupy their time and justify their salaries. Sievers had come up with a plan. In the formerly German part of Poland, he noted in a letter September 4, 1939, there are numerous museums which have irreplaceable finds, documents, and monuments for the study and proof of prehistoric and historic German culture in the eastern area 10. Sievers proposed sending an Annenerb scholar to Poland to seize all potentially useful materials catalogues, reports of grave excavations, drawings and photographs and ship them back to Germany. Point 11 Such records would greatly assist scholars in fabricating evidence for claims that Germany was merely writing an ancient wrong and seizing land that legitimately belonged to it. While it was certainly true that Poles and Germans had fought over their borderlands for hundreds of years, the Reich now wanted all of Poland, and it intended to present its criminal acts of mass murder and deportation as legitimate policies. Sievers had already discussed the idea of seizing Polish materials with a young Annenerb scholar and SS Untersturmführer, Dr. Peter Paulson. Paulson was a professor of archaeology at the University of Berlin. Point 12 He was a Viking expert with an international reputation and a dedicated Nazi who had worked as an archaeologist for RUSHA. At 36, he had published half a dozen monographs, on subjects ranging from medieval gold treasures to the symbolic meaning of weapons, and had taken part in excavations in Poland, Hungary, and the Middle East. Point 13 Senior German archaeologists praised his abilities highly. According to one prominent scholar, Paulsen was the best expert on the Vikings among the young German prehistorians. Also abroad he has a good reputation among Swedish scholars. 14. Paulsen, who had grown up in a little town just south of the Danish border, had worked hard to get where he was. His salesman father had died in a train accident in California when Paulsen was just three years old. Point 15 After that, the family was forced to scramble to make ends meet. Paulsen was a good student, and he managed to put himself through university thanks to a string of part time jobs. His professors encouraged him in the study of prehistory and art history. In 1927, at the age of 25, 
he took out a Nazi party membership. 16 Like many other Nazis of the day, he was drawn to the mystical view of archaeology and was exceedingly fond of the old Icelandic sagas. He named his children Sigurd, Heda, and Astrid, after Norse heroes and heroines. In 1938, he and his young family moved to Berlin, where he had landed work at the university and at the Annenerb. His ailing wife suffered from a serious thyroid condition that required surgery, forcing him to borrow money from the SS, and he seemed notably lacking in the kind of high-octane confidence that characterized many of the young scholars there. Point 17 Indeed his official portraits showed a rather harried-looking man, with deep-set, wary eyes, a thick thatch of dark curly hair, and an air of being rather uncomfortable in his skin. Point 18 Even so, Paulson was eager to begin the plunder of Polish museums, and Sievers was convinced that time was of the essence. As he noted in his letter to Himmler, they would need to move swiftly once the hostilities were over, particularly if they hoped to confiscate not only important records and documents but also Poland's most important prehistoric treasures. Polish authorities would be expecting looters, and as all wars have shown up to now, the enemy side will make efforts to hide or evacuate the most valuable finds 19. While Sievers waited impatiently for Himmler's reply, he asked Paulson and a colleague, Dr. Ernst Peterson, to draw up lists of the most important Polish museums. Paulson quickly obliged. In his office at the University of Berlin, he jotted down the names of more than a dozen Polish institutions worthy of looting from the famous Wawel Castle in Krakow to the Museum of Archaeology in Warsaw. 20 Moreover, since he took a personal interest in the fine arts, he also included a museum of art in Lemberg, as well as the bronze doors of the Nizen Cathedral and a major sculpture by Weizstoss in Krakow. Peterson, who was one of Germany's leading experts on the prehistory of Eastern Europe, submitted a second list three days later. This itemized 36 major Polish museums and academic institutes and included the names of their directors and curatorial staffs. 21 In addition, it tabulated dozens of smaller archaeological collections in schools and local museums, as well as the names of Polish scientific societies and the locations of the most important archaeological excavations in Poland. But it was Paulson's brief mention of German artworks that seems to have galvanized Himmler. On September 21, Himmler approved a plan to send a detachment of scholars to Poland to secure both art and archaeological treasures. 22 He put Paulson in charge and placed him under the command of the Reich Main Security Administration, a newly created SS umbrella organization that directed all police and security affairs in the Reich, including the operation of the concentration camps. Paulson reported to Dr. Franz Six, a 30-year-old SS Standartenführer with a doctoral degree in political science and a long history as a stormtroop leader. 236 outlined the mission to Paulson. The archaeology professor was to travel to the old royal capital of Krakow with a small team and three furniture trucks to locate, seize, and transport back to Berlin one of Poland's greatest and most beloved art treasures, the Weizstoss Altar. 24. The altar of St. Mary's Church in Krakow is one of the masterpieces of 15th century Gothic art. Its creator, Weizstoss, or as he is known to Poles, Witztwoz, was a man of immense energy and great misfortune. Stoss was born in either 1447 or 1448 in the little town of Horb am Neckar, southwest of Stuttgart. 25 He gravitated as a young man to Nuremberg, where he developed a career as a master carver. In 1477 he accepted a commission in Krakow to carve a massive altar for the Church of St. Mary. He spent the next 17 years in Poland, laboring over a variety of commissions in stone as well as wood, always breathing life into his carefully observed human figures. When at last Stoss returned to Nuremberg, tragedy awaited. He lost money in a confidence scheme, and to compensate for his losses, he forged a promissory note with the name of the man who'd introduced him to the huckster. The local magistrates condemned him to public branding on both cheeks, turning the carver into a marked man. Emperor Maximilian eventually pardoned Stoss, but his life was ruined and he never recovered from the humiliation. The altar in Krakow, however, is from the most splendid period of Stoss's career. 
The artist spent 12 years toiling on it, carving 200 figures saints, apostles, magi, and angels from a single piece of lime wood, then delicately painting and gilding each one. The finished altar spans nearly 36 feet in width. Its central panel portrays the death of the Virgin Mary and her glorious ascent to heaven, the two adjacent panels depict more than a dozen scenes from the life of the Holy Family. Stoss modeled many of the figures upon his neighbors in Krakow, and it is clear that he had observed their foibles with a loving eye. He depicted one of the three magi, for example, as an exuberant young nobleman, who, as one art critic noted, strides briskly forward, his drapery swirling because of the swiftness of his approach, exposing to view his trim cuirass of burnished gold, as he ostentatiously doffs his hat, much to the consternation of the old attendant behind 26. After his death, Stoss fell into obscurity in Germany, largely because his finest works lay in Poland. In 1933, however, the Germanic Museum in Nuremberg hosted a major Stoss exhibition to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the sculptor's death. The display of his exquisitely lifelike figures in wood and stone stirred a newfound pride in his artistry and a deep-seated envy in the breasts of some art collectors, particularly those prominent in the Nazi party. It irked the ultra-nationalists terribly to think that Stoss's finest work adorned a Polish church, instead of the walls of a German art gallery. Paulson departed from Berlin on October 1, 1939, with three furniture wagons and attached containers. Polish officials in Krakow had already taken measures to hide the altar, suspecting that someone like Paulson would soon be turning up on their doorsteps. They had spent lavish amounts of money to restore the altar six years earlier for their own commemoration of Stas's death and were now desperate to protect it. As an aid to concealment, they cut up the altar into 32 massive pieces, packing them carefully in crates and sending them into hiding places in the Polish countryside. Paulson, however, seems to have known exactly where to look. Almost certainly, he had received intelligence from the Reich Main Security Administration, for within days of his arrival, the archaeologist had sniffed out the whereabouts of the boxes. He had located part of the altar, for example, in the 14th century cathedral of Sando Mirz, a small town some 150 miles northeast of Krakow. The four boxes he discovered there weighed 1700 pounds each, and Paulson and his assistants had to ferry them back to Krakow, across a remote hilly countryside that had yet to be fully subdued by the German army. Transportation of the Weitstoss figures, Paulson complained in a private letter dated October 5th, turns out to be rather difficult. Military movements are a serious hindrance to the ride. On the way from Sandio Mirz to Kiels, a car fortunately without a load broke down. On account of the bad road conditions, we had to drive without a trailer, and for reasons of security, the drive could only be made during daytime. Today I finally arrived at Krakow with the first load. And tomorrow I am going to pick up the second and last load at Sando Mirz. 27. While in Sando Mirz, Paulson searched for other objects worthy of plunder. He stopped in at the Nice District Museum and ascertained that the building and all of its contents were secure and under the control of German police forces. 28 Then, according to a later report, I took the valuable card index, the central record system that listed all the artifacts from the museum in Sando Mirz, which I found being hidden by a Jew 29 such indexes recorded all pertinent details about the artifacts and would allow the Ananerb staff to pick out at their leisure objects. Worthy of looting. Paulson made no further mention of the fate of the brave Jewish curator who attempted to hide the index. With these records in hand, Paulson departed for Krakow with the second shipment of the Stoss figurines. In Poland's old royal capital, Paulson proceeded to organize the transport of the various crates he had located. He realized to his consternation, however, that he would not be able to convey the massive shrine section of the altar back to Berlin without the help of technical workers, so he agreed to store it until they arrived. In his free time, he toured Krakow's museums, seizing their card indexes and registers. 30 when he was at last ready to escort the altar back to Berlin, 
the city's prince bishop made a final passionate protest against the theft to Krakow's new German mayor, explaining the deep religious significance of the artwork. 31 The Weizstoss altar is as important to Krakow, noted Paulson in his later report, as the painting of the Black Madonna is to Chestachowia. 32 But Paulson was unmoved by the pleas of the prelate. He set off with the figurines, arriving in Berlin on October 14, 1939. He personally delivered the boxes of the altar to a treasury in the new Reichsbank. Only the bank's director, he noted confidently, possessed the key. News of Paulson's success traveled swiftly through the Nazi grapevine. A month after his return, the Lord Mayor of Nuremberg, Willy Liebel, penned a letter urging Hitler to bestow the altar on his city, the place where Stoss had endured his greatest humiliation. 33 Goebbels, in turn, pressed Hitler to give him the artwork for a touring exhibition to mark its triumphant return to Germany, and Himmler seems to have had his own designs on the massive sculpture. Already, he had helped himself to one of its beautifully worked panels, Christian motifs, and all. 34 All this politicking astonished Hitler. No one had bothered to seek his permission for the theft. 35 After mulling over the problem, however, Hitler agreed to send the altar all of it to Nuremberg, where it was stowed, secure from aerial attacks, in a huge underground vault beneath the city's medieval castle, until it could be safely displayed. It remained there until the summer of 1945.36. Immediately after dropping off the altar at the Reichsbank Treasury in Berlin, Paulson met with Reinhard Heydrich, the head of the Reich Main Security Administration. 37 Heydrich ordered Paulson to return to Krakow, where he was to begin seizing important museum collections. Sievers saw this as a golden opportunity for the Annenerb. Paulson, he wrote after learning the news, has control over all of the material from various museums and collections in Krakow because he has secured the registers and catalogues. As it is to be assumed, that the cultural goods are to be transferred to Germany as completely as possible, it is necessary to view, seize, and transfer to Berlin those parts of the collections important to the work of the Annenerb, especially those which focus on prehistory and early history, valuable collections of house markings, gables, and weapons studies, as well as scientific collections on nature and ethnology, etc. 38. Sievers wanted the plundering to be carried out with scientific exactitude. This, he realized, would require a team of highly trained specialists. He began hurriedly assembling an SS scholarly command Dr. Eduard Tratz, the head of one of Austria's most important natural history museums, the Haus der Natur in Salzburg, Dr. Ernst Peterson, the archaeologist who had compiled one of the lists of Polish institutions to be plundered, Dr. Theodore Dassel, an art historian, Dr. Paul Diddle, a historian and geographer who specialized in archival, library, and museum collections, Dr. Wilhelm May, a specialist in folk tales and legends, and S.S. Hauptscharfuhrer Luis Mann, who would serve as the driver. 39. Sievers also realized that Paulson and his colleagues would require considerable administrative support. He sent a proposal to Himmler on October 16 suggesting that he be sent with Paulson to Poland to oversee and complete the assignment, which needs to be done as quickly as possible so that Paulson can continue on from Krakow to Warsaw. 40 Himmler immediately recognized the wisdom of this. A day later, his personal administrative officer, Dr. Rudolf Brandt, informed Sievers that he was to proceed to Poland with Paulson and his scholars. If Himmler thought that his unit of experts could simply take what they wanted in Poland, however, he must have been extremely disappointed. In Krakow, Paulson learned that Göring had dispatched a similar team of experts on an identical mission. Göring's avarice was legendary. The Reich Minister of Aviation owned eight sumptuous residences castles, villas, hunting lodges, and mountain chalets each lavishly decorated with German, Flemish, Dutch, and Italian old masters as well as fine gobelin tapestries and costly Persian rugs. Goring never missed out on an opportunity to add to his collection. To lay hands on the finest Polish pieces, he had chosen SS Sturm Banfuhrer Kajet and Mulman, an art historian with a very shady reputation, 
to head up a team of nine experts. Molman was a domineering man with a short temper, a criminal record for petty offenses, and a talent for ferreting out art treasures 41 from the beginning, he seems to have taken complete control of the situation in Poland. He swiftly forged an alliance with Hans Frank, the new leader of the general government in occupied Poland, and proceeded to outmaneuver Paulson at nearly every turn. By the end of October, Molman had obtained precisely what Goring most wanted first crack at all of Poland's rich art treasures. In exchange, Molman agreed to give to Paulson and his scholars carte blanche on Poland's archaeological, ethnological, and natural history collections. Paulson reluctantly accepted these terms, and he and Peterson set to work, assessing the collections of Krakow scientific institutes and museums. But before they could begin transporting the valuables back to Germany, they received new orders from Franz Six at the Reich Main Security Administration. Six had just returned from a tour of Warsaw, which had suffered heavy shelling and bombing during the siege, and he ordered the unit to begin its pillaging there before others beat them to the punch. So Paulson and his team swiftly moved their base of operation northward. To assist with the work, Sievers sent three other researchers Dr. Heinrich Harm Jans, an expert on folklore and ethnology, Dr. Hans Schlieff, an architect who had become a prominent classical archaeologist, and Dr. Gunther Theorogen, an archaeologist. 42. To those familiar with the beautiful parks and gardens of Warsaw before the war, the Polish capital must have seemed a shocking sight. The royal castle was in smoldering ruins. The palace of the Papal Nuncio, the National Theatre and Opera House, the City Hall, and most of the city's hospitals and principal railway stations were either destroyed or severely damaged. Entire residential streets in both the suburbs and Old Town had been flattened, and the sickly smell of decaying human flesh seeped from the ruins. Those who survived walked about in a state of shock. Warsaw citizens had put up a strong, spirited defense, but the German army, with its superior armaments, had finally overrun their streets. In the days that followed, citizens were forced to turn in their radios to authorities and spend hours each day lining up in the bitter cold to get bread and other rationed food. As they stomped their feet to stay warm, new loudspeakers in the streets blared the latest Nazi propaganda. If Paulson took much notice of the misery, however, he made no mention of it, even in passing, in his letters. He had other, more pressing matters on his mind. To inspect the museums and carry off their treasures, the team needed transportation. Cars were scarce in the Polish capital in early November 1939, trucks were almost impossible to requisition. But Paulson managed to patch together transport for his command, and the Ananerb scholars buckled down to work with a cold orderliness, interpreting their orders liberally. One of their first targets was the State Archaeological Museum in Lazienki Park, a former royal hunting preserve. The museum was the hub of archaeological investigation in Poland. Fourteen of Poland's leading archaeologists worked there, and it served as a central repository for their collections of artifacts flint axes, bone points, amphorae, swords, sickles, halberds, scabbards, necklaces, fibulae, bronze collars, bronze cauldrons, face urns, figurines. The museum also housed extensive files and card indexes on all the country's archaeological sites, as well as an important 12,000-volume archaeological library. 43 The Paulson unit intended to seize all of the most important material and cart it back to Germany, where they would put it to use for the Nazi cause. They also planned on stamping out, once and for all, the particular brand of research that the museum specialized in. The Polish archaeologists were a patriotic lot who had spent nearly two decades searching for the origins of the Slavic peoples. The quest had led them at times to parts of Europe that Germans had earmarked as their own. This infuriated Paulson's men, who continually referred to the museum as a poison kitchen 44 so they decided to steal the entire research base of their Polish colleagues. As one of Paulson's subordinates later noted, this would allow German scholars to comb through the Polish data, to establish where the Poles, 1, forged the results of discoveries, 2, 
suppressed them if they appeared altogether too unfavorable against Poland, 3, exaggerated Slavonic influences, or 4, discontinued investigations at the very moment when they met with Germanic remains beneath the Slavonic ones. 45 The terrible irony in all of this seems never to have occurred to the German scholars. Paulson delegated Peterson, Schliff, and Theorogen to take care of the museum, which was under German guard. The trio arrived on their first day in Warsaw and were none too pleased to see a young rising star in Polish archaeology, Dr. Konrad Jaszczowski, and two colleagues in the offices. 46 Jaszczowski was a 30 year old native of Upper Silesia, the much contested borderland that curved along the southwestern edge of Poland. 47 He had studied in both Germany and Poland and spoke German well. Almost certainly, Jaszczowski recognized Peterson from scholarly conferences and meetings he had attended in Eastern Europe, and perhaps he felt a moment of relief seeing a fellow archaeologist turn up at the museum. If so, the sensation must have been fleeting. Peterson despised the young Polish researcher and made no effort to hide it. Point 48 He thought Jaszczowski belonged to the worst anti German agitators. 49. Together with his SS companions, Peterson asked Jaszczowski to show them the museum collections. He spoke more like a conqueror than a colleague. Jaszczowski knew that the German archaeologists had arrived to case the collection. He gave them the required tour but as soon as they left he and his colleagues went through the glass display cases, removing the most valuable pieces and hiding them as best they could in the storage area. The following day, Schliff and Theorogen returned. They were enraged to discover the empty display cases and immediately searched the storage area, locating some of the missing items. Then they threw Jaszczowski and his colleagues out of the museum. Point 50. With the Polish researchers gone, Schliff and Theorogen began crating up the museum's extensive collection of artifacts, its official records and documents, and its library, for shipment back to the Reich. The packing must have taken days, for the museum had extensive holdings, including many delicate ceramics that needed careful wrapping. The German team were reluctant to leave anything significant behind, the material, as Paulson later observed, would be used to build the SS Research 51. As Schliff and Theorogen wrapped up the key holdings of the archaeological museum, Paulson combed through Warsaw's other major institutions. He crated up prehistoric treasures from the National Museum and sifted through the display cases and storage areas of Warsaw's military museum, seizing the Sword of Sandomir and several other splendid ceremonial weapons. At the Krasinski Library, he was delighted to find two handsome Viking swords and two ceremonial battle axes. These he also took and dutifully shipped off to Berlin. Meanwhile another detachment member, Eduard Tratz, rifled through collections at the State Zoological Museum, examining its collection with a connoisseur's eye. 52 at 51, Tratz was one of the most respected citizens of Salzburg. He had personally founded the city's natural history museum, the Haus der Natur, in 1924, and with assistance from Austria's new Nazi masters, he had rapidly expanded its facilities. Tratz believed museums played an essential role in society, as the link between science and the people, between humans and nature 53 to better communicate Nazi party doctrine to the public, he had recently added eight new departments to the Haus der Natur. These specialized in such subjects as racial development, racial hygiene and eugenics, and animal domestication and breeding. Tratz spent two days at the State Zoological Museum in Warsaw, selecting specimens to send back to the Haus der Natur. He and a colleague chose 147 of the museum's most exotic bird specimens from the resplendent Quetzal of the Central American Cloud Forest to the Crested Serpent Eagle of Japan as well as three huge European bison, a massive Nile crocodile, and two wildcats. 54 Tratz also carefully sorted through the museum's collection of skulls and skeletons. The Haus der Natur was planning important new exhibition rooms on human heredity to popularize Nazi ideas of race and prehistory. 55 As part of this exhibit, entitled The Ancestors, Tratz and his staff intended on displaying head casts of the Nordic and Jewish races, as well as the remains of ancient humans, such as the Neanderthal and the Cro Magnon. 
So from the Warsaw collections Tratz selected a variety of human, chimpanzee, and gorilla skeletons, a plaster model of a Neanderthal, and casts of the brain cases of Pleistocene humans. 56 In addition he created up a mammoth jaw, the skull of an Ice Age rhinoceros, and dozens of expensive reference books on butterflies, mollusks, protozoa, snails, crabs, paleozoology, bird migrations, the history of philosophy, and anatomy. 57 All this he dispatched to the Haus der Natur. Paulson delegated other scholars to tackle Warsaw's libraries. The Reich Main Security Administration, which directed all mass murder in the Third Reich and in the newly annexed territories, was assembling a library to educate its staff on Jews and other enemy groups. Paulson's commanding officer, Franz VI, believed that it was necessary for research purposes to carefully study the written works produced by the enemy in order to understand the mental weapons of ideological enemies 58 indeed, officers in the Reich Main Security Administration would later use reference volumes on the Jewish diaspora to help trace the origins of ethnically mixed communities in the Soviet Union. Those communities identified as Jewish were then slated for liquidation. 59. To line the shelves of this new SS library, Paulson and his colleagues carted off the same library in Warsaw and approximately 40,000 books from the Judaic library in the Great Synagogue on Tlomaka Street. 60. In addition, Paulson created up the library in the Ukrainian Science Institute and packed away some 1500 books from what was likely the Seminar for Indo-European Linguistics at the University of Warsaw. The latter volumes were almost certainly intended for Walter Wust, the superintendent of the Ananurb. Goring's experts had given Paulson a free reign in all these areas, but the two groups of scholars fought like vultures over the large private libraries of the Polish nobility. These after all, contained many rare works of art. After much wrangling, for example, Paulson and Siever succeeded in laying hands on one of the most important treasures from the Zamiski Library the Suprazil Codex, an 11th century manuscript containing the oldest known written example of the Proto-Slavic language. The two SS officers wrapped it up carefully and sent it to a Reich Main Security Administration storage facility in Berlin. It was a very valuable document. Indeed, Sievers later gleefully estimated its value at between 4 and 5 million Reichsmarks, the equivalent of some $20 to $26 million today. 61. Paulson also persuaded Mullman to release several important Jewish and Freemasonry artifacts from Poland's National Museum. The archaeologist was under orders to send these goods to Wolfsburg the German castle that Himmler was refurbishing as a senior SS Academy. 62 Almost certainly the items were intended for a private exhibition at Wolfsburg, one resembling a Freemasonry museum once installed in the SS Security Service headquarters in Berlin. Before the war, SS officers had led groups of SS men and Hitler youth clubs through the display, which warned in the most dire and lurid terms of the perils of Freemasonry. As one visitor later recalled, I was shown papers illustrating the work and methods of the Masons, seeking to prove that they used poison to remove the traitors from their own ranks. There were skulls all over the place, a coffin marked with Masonic signs, aprons, and insignia really quite a gruesome display. 63. As Paulson and his team of experts stripped Warsaw's museums and libraries bare, Hans Frank, the new leader of the occupied Polish colony known as the General Government, could not shake the feeling that the specialists were robbing him blind. Frank intended to live like a king in Poland, and to do this he needed to put an end to the thievery. 64 He issued a decree prohibiting any further shipments of property to Germany without his government's express approval or without payment from Berlin, a regulation that was to take effect on November 22, 1939. Paulson, who had yet to plunder all the museums on the Ananerbs list, deeply resented the interference. But he felt powerless against Frank an old friend of Hitler and saw little alternative but to bow to his orders. Paulson's colleagues were infuriated by this timidity, but none more so than Hans Schliff, who had spent days packing up the voluminous collections at the State Archaeological Museum in Lazienki Park. Schliff was a loose cannon in Ananerb circles. He was arrogant and brutally direct, 
and he considered many of his co-workers fools. Point 65 He saw little chance at all of shipping the State Archaeological Museum collection to the Reich before the November 22nd deadline that Frank had set. Nonetheless, Schliff traveled twice to Poznan in hopes of wrangling some kind of rail transport for the collection. It was a huge shipment five freight cars worth of plunder and no one was able, or perhaps willing, to help him. The November 22nd deadline came and went, but Schliff refused to give up. After days of haranguing and storming and browbeating others, he and a colleague finally managed to finagle transport of the collection to Poznan on November 30th. It meant disobeying an explicit order from Hans Frank, but Schliff was beyond caring. He desperately wanted to strip the archaeological poison kitchen bear and cart its collection back to the Reich. He waited for the crates to be loaded on the freight cars, then hurried back to the Reich, where he wrote a letter to Sievers explaining his own criminal actions and complaining about Paulson's ineptitude. A few weeks later, after opening the crates in Poznan, he gloated over his success. The Warsaw material is now entirely unpacked and registered. Now for the first time, it is possible to obtain a survey of the truly excellent stock. 66. Back in Berlin, Paulson penned a final report to the Reich Main Security Administration, listing his detachment's achievements and taking credit for the transport of the State Archaeological Museum collection to the Reich. He was proud of the successes so much plunder, it seemed, in so short a time but he deeply regretted leaving so many valuables behind. Many fine collections still lay untouched in Warsaw, and in Krakow, everything still needs to be done 67 but by then it was clear to the senior SS staff that Paulson lacked the brazen arrogance needed to be a thief among thieves. Point 68 so Sievers quietly arranged for a reassignment, finding him a teaching job at an SS officer training school far away from the front. Point 69. Working quietly in the background, Himmler searched for some legal way of plundering Poland's riches. Through clever political maneuvering, he took control of a public corporation that Goring founded to confiscate the assets of Jewish and Polish citizens. The corporation had a very forgettable name, the Hauptruhanstelle Ost, or Main Trust Center East, and served largely as a cover for further piracy in Poland. Most of the profits went straight to Goring, but Himmler arranged to siphon off part of the proceeds for his own SS projects. He placed the Ananerb in charge, named Sievers as the corporation's managing representative, and rewarded Schliff for his earlier audacity with the poison kitchen by appointing him trustee for Wartheland, one of the Polish regions incorporated into the Reich. The new Nazi regime in Wartheland had already begun expelling Jews, and officials there intended to treat Polish Christians much the same. Everything that is Polish is going to be cleared out of this region, boasted the new Nazi Gauleiter. 70 Each deportee would be allowed to take only a small valise, with room enough for a change of shirt perhaps and some underwear and socks, everything else would have to be abandoned. It was a prime opportunity for looting, and the Ananerb staff was delighted at first by the possibilities. Quite a few works of art and libraries have lost their owner, Schliff pointed out smugly in a letter to Sievers.71. Under Sievers's orders, Schliff and the other Ananerb scholars fanned out into the Polish countryside. They inventoried archives, museums, public collections, castles, manors, and other wealthy Polish and Jewish homes, then registered and seized all portable valuables historic and prehistoric artifacts, old property deeds, books, documents, paintings, sculptures, wood carvings, furniture, silverware, fine carpets, and expensive jewelry. Point 72 Schliff, a sarcastic and overbearing man, was not much of a team player, and the Ananerb scholars soon wearied of him. They grew to hate the Polish countryside. Point 73 The local farmers were continually scattering horseshoe nails over the roads, puncturing the tires of their vehicles. The roads were poor and the scholars got stuck in the mud. If they were wearing civilian clothing, the farmers ignored their requests for help, and often when they arrived somewhere promising, they were too late. The Gestapo had already beaten them there, cleaning out all the best booty. 74. When Schliff lost his enthusiasm for the work, another Ananerb scholar, Ernst Peterson, replaced him. 
Peterson expanded the efforts. In 15 months, the scholars of the main trust center East ransacked 500 castles, estates, and private apartments, 102 libraries, 15 museums, 3 art galleries, and 10 coin collections. Point 75 They plundered the silverware of Prince Radziwill, the pearls and gold and silver jewelry of Karl Albrecht von Habsburg Lithringen, the Durer drawings at the Lemberg Museum, and important collections from the Museum of Ethnology and Natural Sciences at Plock. At Golochow Castle, they made off with priceless treasures a rare collection of vases, the oldest of which dated back to the 7th century BC, an 11th century Italian fountain, a portrait of Copernicus, and dozens of costly paintings, including works by the modern French master Jean-Francois Millet. By March 28, 1941, they had amassed a large storehouse of treasures some 1,100 paintings, 500 pieces of furniture, 35 boxes of church treasures, and 25 sets of rare metal objects. Point 76. The staff of the main trust center East sold some of these valuables immediately to avid buyers. The profits went to Goring. But the trust center officials packed up most of the treasure in crates and sent them with an armed guard to a central collection point in Berlin. Sievers estimated that by the end of 1941, the main trust center East had confiscated goods worth 3 million Reichmarks, or some $15.6 million today a figure that is likely far too low. 77 Goring received the lion's share of the proceeds, but the Annenerb submitted a bill for its services, charging 10% of the total. Goring, however, seems never to have paid. But the pillaging of Poland had given Sievers and many other Annenerb scholars an appetite for piracy. They had looted entire museums and libraries in Poland without a qualm, stealing their greatest treasures. In the elegant Annenerb villa in berlin de Lem, staff members followed the latest reports from the front avidly and watched the advances of the Wehrmacht with new, avaricious eyes. 16. The Treasure of Kerch On the evening of July 27, 1941, Adolf Hitler lingered over dinner, his eyes glinting with pleasure as he mused upon the future for the benefit of a select audience in his stronghold in the East Prussian forest. Wolfskans was a dark, dismal, depressing place, more suited to an army of troglodytes or trolls than the triumphant new warlord of Europe. But Hitler liked its Spartan simplicity. He felt invincible there, surrounded as he was by nearly 2,000 military personnel, thick windowless concrete walls, barbed wire fences, sentry posts, and mile upon mile of northern wilderness. His existence at Wolfskans bore no resemblance to ordinary life, a fact not lost on most of his subordinates. Indeed, one member of the German high command, Alfred Jodl, later described it as a cross between a cloister and a concentration camp one. Hitler, However, had no desire to leave Wolfskans, no inclination really to step foot into the bloody apocalypse he and his armies had unleashed upon Eastern Europe. Just five weeks earlier, on June 22, 1941, he had launched a mammoth surprise attack on the Soviet Union, the bulwark of what many committed Nazis called Jewish Bolshevism too emboldened by his earlier military successes the invasions of Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, northern France, Yugoslavia, and Greece he had hurled nearly three million German troops against the Soviet military in Operation Barbarossa, opening a 2,000-kilometer-long front that stretched from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. Point three in just two and a half weeks, the Wehrmacht had seized Lithuania, Latvia, and parts of Estonia, Belarusia, and Ukraine, capturing hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers. German troops were now marching north to Leningrad, a city that Hitler admired, and south to the Crimea, the peninsula that jutted from the north shore of the Black Sea. Hitler was elated and energized, convinced that his troops would take Moscow in a matter of weeks. Point four, he now ruled over more of Europe than any man since Napoleon, and often in the evenings, when the spirit took him, he indulged for hours after dinner in meandering monologues that blended dreamy fantasy with monstrous cruelty. The servants would bring the guests tea and cake chocolate cake being Hitler's favorite and as the German leader sipped and nibbled and stared at a large map of the Soviet Union on the far wall, he would begin to talk to the assembled guests, 
military men, visiting Reich commissars or Reich ministers, members of his inner circle, young secretaries in pretty dresses. Always it was the same. The room would go silent, and a little man sitting discreetly off to the side would bend down over a sheaf of paper and begin taking shorthand notes. Point five. On these occasions, Hitler would casually hold forth in a lengthy stream of consciousness on whatever was uppermost in his mind at the moment the perfection of the German army, the inferior nature of English music and theatre, the natural aptitude of the Swiss for hotel keeping, the necessity of eradicating insects and dirt in Vienna. Point six. But on the evening of July 27, Hitler chose to talk about his future empire in the East. He particularly relished the thought of a new German colony he planned to create in the Crimea. The southern Russia peninsula was blessed with a pleasant Mediterranean air. It possessed forested mountains and splendid sea coasts where dolphins frolicked. It boasted vineyards that produced fine sherry and muscatel, and orchards that yielded apricots and peaches, and it was endowed with the kind of singular beauty that attracted important visitors. The Russian imperial family had built a fine summer palace in the Crimea, and the Grand Dukes and Duchesses of St. Petersburg had followed, putting up lavish dachas. Famous writers and artists took up residence there. In 1903, Anton Chekhov penned one of his most famous plays, The Cherry Orchard, while sitting in his Crimean country home. Hitler, however, envisioned a very different future for the Crimea. He believed that the sunny region possessed special properties of great importance to the Aryan race. There are few places on earth, he later observed, in which a race can better succeed in maintaining its integrity for centuries on end than the Crimea. 7 To illustrate this contention, he pointed to the history of the Goths, wandering herdsmen from northern Europe who settled in the Crimea in the 3rd century AD and whose language could still be heard on the peninsula some 1300 years later. Hitler, like many other German ultranationalists, regarded the Goths as ancestral Germans and the Crimea as a kind of southern German homeland. Point eight on the strength of this meager claim, he had decided to transform all of the peninsula into an exclusively German colony. 9. He planned to rid the Crimea of all those he deemed undesirable Jews, Tatars, Gypsies, Russians, Armenians, Georgians, Ukrainians, and replace them with racially sound German colonists. My demands are not exorbitant, he explained smugly one night. I'm only interested, when all is said, in territories where Germans have lived before 10. When news of these plans reached Himmler, he was electrified. The Crimea would be a perfect place for dozens of the feudal SS settlements he had been dreaming about for nearly a decade. On September 26, 1941, the German 11th Army, under the command of Lt. Gen. Erich von Manstein, began bearing down on the Crimea. 11 Manstein, a West Prussian aristocrat with nearly 35 years of experience in the German army, had an excellent reputation as a fighting man, but the Soviet forces put up unexpectedly heavy resistance. All along the Eastern Front, it was much the same story. Instead of folding and crumbling and buckling under the crushing force of the Wehrmacht, Surviving Soviet officers from one battle simply reformed their units, dragooning reservists and bystanders and arming whoever else they might find quietly tending their crops or walking the streets. Then they threw these makeshift troops back again against panzer divisions and artillery units, sacrificing ten Russian lives in order to kill one German soldier. Point 12. Over the next seven weeks, Manstein's troops bludgeoned their way across the Crimea, but they were unable to take the heavily fortified port of Sevastopol, once a thriving link in the region's grain exports. So on December 17 10 days after the Japanese Air Force bombed Pearl Harbor, prompting the United States to declare war first against Japan and then enter the war against Germany and Italy Manstein launched a major attack on the port and its 32,000 Soviet soldiers. The German objective was to cut through three major defensive rings that Soviet troops had constructed around the city. As Hitler and the German high command waited impatiently for Sevastopol's fall, Himmler directed his forces to begin ethnic cleansing operations in the Crimea. He ordered Ansatzgruppe, one of four large roving killing detachments in the Soviet Union, to liquidate all the Jews living in German-occupied Crimea. The first target there was Simferopol. 
Some 20,000 Jews had lived in the city before the war, giving it the largest Jewish population in the Crimea. Since then, many Jews had fled for safer quarters, but an estimated 11,000 remained. So in mid-December, members of three forces on Satsgrup D and the Wehrmacht's field police and secret field police set about methodically massacring the Simferopol Jews. Point 13 The plan was to liquidate the entire community before Christmas. Officials informed local Jews that they were to be resettled, and instructed them to gather in a public meeting place. Drivers then conveyed the families to a pre-arranged kill site some 15 kilometers outside of Simferopol. Point 14 There, by the side of the road, officers instructed the frightened families to climb down from the truck, take off their jackets and shoes, and leave behind their suitcases. Armed guards then led the barefooted victims through the snow to an excavated grave, some 300 meters from the road. Most of the Jewish captives could see at once the fate that lay in store for them. There were disturbing scenes, recalled one of the German executioners later. The Jews cried because they were aware of what was happening 15. When it came their turn, the victims were lined up opposite their killers, each of whom was armed with a machine pistol, a type of submachine gun. An SS officer gave the order to fire. Some of the victims immediately fell into the grave, observed one member of the firing squad after the war, others fell on the edge. These fallen Jews were then thrown into the grave by the waiting Jews. 16 After several rounds of this, the executioners needed no order to fire, they did so automatically. There was no possible escape for the victims no opportunity to run or flee. The SS security service had cordoned off the area and set up guards around the perimeter. Some Jews who tried to flee, noted one of the executioners later, were shot down by the unit who ensured that the area was closed off 17. The killing squads were very efficient. On December 15, Einsatzgrupp D reported to the SS command that Simferopol was Judenfrei, free of Jews 18 and it immediately set about orchestrating similar massacres in other Crimean cities Feodosia, Yepatoria, Kerch, Yalta, and Bakkisare. Point 19 By then, however, some of the squad members had begun to complain about the psychological stress of shooting such large numbers of women, children, and babies in cold blood. Rather than putting an end to the terrible bloodshed, however, Himmler and the SS leadership suggested a more impersonal method of slaughter mobile gas wagons. As the massacres continued, Einsatzgrupp D obtained three gas wagons two large ones capable of killing 80 people at a time, and a smaller one that could execute 50 people at once. Squad members used these to kill women and children. Point 20. In all, German forces were to shoot and gas to death nearly 40,000 Crimean Jews during their occupation. Point 21. The assault on Sevastopol in late December 1941 failed dismally, despite Manstein's brilliance as a tactician. The Soviet Navy succeeded in dispatching reinforcements, ammunition, and food to the city on December 20, bolstering the spirits of the defenders considerably. Six days later it pulled off a daring amphibious landing of 20,000 troops on the eastern tip of the Crimea. With this assistance from the sea, Soviet troops fended off the assault on Sevastopol and they retook the cities of Fyodosia and Kerch. News of this disaster so infuriated Hitler that he sentenced to death the German officer who ordered German troops to withdraw from the Kerch region, Count Hans von Spunek.22. These and other serious setbacks along the Eastern Front threatened to undermine the morale of German troops. Himmler, the schoolmaster's son, believed that further political indoctrination was the surest way of rallying the Waffen-SS, the military arm of the SS. The longer the war draws out, he stated in a later order, the more we have to educate and convince our officers, junior officers, and men about the Nazi worldview 23 in Berlin, SS writers dutifully churned out a flurry of articles casting the invasion of southern Russia as a kind of homecoming, where German forces might once again reclaim their ancient territories in the east. At the center of these fables were the ancient Goths, a favorite propaganda tool of SS writers. According to history, the Goths were a tribe of wanderers who originated in a place called Skanza quite likely in Scandinavia or possibly northern Poland. Point 24 They spoke one of the Germanic languages, 
as did just about all the inhabitants of Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. 25 The Goths, however, did not remain in Skansa. Being of a particularly footloose disposition, they wandered south looking for greener pastures. They eventually ended up along the Sea of Azov, a gulf-like body of water that adjoins the Black Sea. And in AD 238 they made a rather dramatic entrance into the histories of the ancient world. 26 From settlements along the Black Sea coast, they began attacking and pillaging Roman cities to the west. They seized ships moored in Black Sea harbors and became full-fledged pirates, raiding even into the Aegean. They were formidable foes, and according to the old Roman histories, they built a city alternately called Doros or Doris or even Doros, somewhere in the Crimea. They also converted to Christianity, and one of their bishops, Ulfilas, whose name means Little Wolf, invented the Gothic alphabet so he could translate the Bible into his native tongue. The fiery arrival of the Huns, nomadic horsemen from the Central Asian steppes, convinced many Gothic families that it was time to search for safer homes. They fled across the Danube in AD 370 and headed north and west on a lengthy odyssey that eventually ended for some in Spain. But a small group remained behind, clinging to their homes along the Black Sea. Travelers to the region took note of them, remarking in the 13th century upon inhabitants who spoke a German-sounding language and who lived side by side with their Tatar neighbors. 27 In 1475, the Turks invaded the region, bringing Islam and a new way of life to the Crimea. As the centuries passed, the speakers of Gothic converted to Islam and dressed as the Turks did. They forgot the old ways, and by the middle of the 16th century, the Gothic tongue had all but vanished from the Crimea. German ultranationalists made a great deal of this slender history. They brazenly claimed the Goths as their own ancestors, although there was not a single shred of evidence to support this contention. 28 Moreover, they grandly portrayed the Goths as the founders of a mighty German empire in the east that once stretched all the way from the Black Sea to the Baltic, and from the Carpathian Mountains of Slovakia to the Urals of Russia. 29 To tease out the truth about the Goths, Soviet archaeologists in the 1920s and 1930s began studying Crimean ruins. 30 They combed sun bleached coasts and thyme scented plateaus and poured over several ancient mountain fortresses and cave cities, places clearly designed to repel invaders and help a badly frightened people sleep a little easier at night. They surveyed remote cave cities where members of the Gothic tribes had lived, and ancient churches where the Goths prayed but they uncovered not a trace of a mighty German empire in the East. 31 The story was a fantasy, pure and simple. 32 Nevertheless, tales of the Goths and their magnificent empire in the East continued to circulate in Nazi circles. SS writers wasted little time in capitalizing on them. SS magazines sported cover photos of sparkling Gothic diadems and ran colorful articles with pseudo-scholarly titles such as Germanic Empire on the Black Sea or Gothic Art Proof of Culture 33 They recounted tales of Gothic Empire builders and remarked upon the instinctive German need for Lebensraum. All these stories, they insisted, were fully rooted in facts, and they left little doubt of the importance that the SS placed on this history. The Arrival of the Goths concluded one article, marked the first time in history that an organizing power of the highest kind appeared in the still undeveloped and unshaped east of Europe 34. This doctored history was clearly intended to inspire the soldiers of the Waffen-SS to new and greater heights in the Crimea. In the early spring of 1942, German troops prepared for a massive new attack on Sevastopol, assembling an enormous siege train of 670 artillery guns, including one behemoth that required the work of 2,000 men over a period of six weeks to prepare for its firing. 35 As Himmler waited for the campaign to begin, he carefully examined a detailed proposal for the future German colonization of the Soviet Union. Hitler had named him Reichskommissar für die Festigung der Deutschen Volkstums, or the Reich Commissioner for the Strengthening of the German Race, placing him in charge of resettling ethnic Germans from outside the Reich in the new eastern lands. It was work that Himmler had embraced enthusiastically, and in late January 1942, he had begun working closely with a senior planner and agricultural scientist, Konrad Meyer, 
to draw up a proposal for the future of the Soviet Union. 36 The Crimea figured prominently in these proposals, which Himmler called the Master Plan East, and which he intended to present to Hitler at an opportune moment. Himmler hoped to found three large colonies in desirable parts of the East, each of which would undergo what he and Meyer euphemistically termed Germanization. One of the colonies would encompass Leningrad and the lands directly south. The second would straddle northern Poland, Lithuania, and southeastern Latvia. And the third would embrace the Crimea and the rich fields of southeastern Ukraine. 37 Himmler intended to call this southernmost colony Gatenga, a name that roughly translates as Goth Region 38. He also intended to rechristen Simferopol as Gothenburg. Himmler estimated that it would take 20 years to completely Germanize all of Gatenga. 39 as a first step, he planned to round up the region's inhabitants. Examiners from RUSHA would perform anthropological measurements on those who appeared to be racially valuable to the Nazis, and men, women, and children thought to possess Nordic blood would be permitted to stay in Gatenga. Himmler's various security forces would then forcibly expel the Slavs and other racially unwanted groups from their homes in the Crimea. They would kill most, and enslave the remainder as hell its 40 when this was done, the undesirables would be replaced with ethnic German settlers and with SS settlers who would inhabit defensive villages along the borders of Gatenga. Such settlements would be the preserves of Werbauern, or soldier farmers blonde, blue-eyed men of the SS and their wives and children. The defensive villages of the proposed German colonies clearly reflected all Himmler's fervent dreams for the SS. He proceeded to draw up detailed blueprints for a prototypical farmer-soldier village in the east and showed them with immense pride to his personal physician, Felix Kirsten, in the summer of 1942. Such a village, he explained to Kirsten, will embrace between 30 and 40 farms. Each farmer receives up to 300 acres of land more Oregon less according to the quality of the soil. In any case a class of financially powerful and independent farmers will develop. Slaves won't till this soil, rather, a farming aristocracy will come into being, such as you still find on the Westphalian estates. 41. His plans called for settlements closely resembling those that the SS had already built in Germany. Dominating each would be a manor house occupied by an SS or Nazi party leader. 42. In addition, each settlement would feature a local party headquarters that Himmler envisioned as a center for general intellectual training and instruction, a Thingplatz, where inhabitants could hold outdoor celebrations for the summer solstice and other important Nazi holidays, and a special graveyard, where families could honor their ancestors. 43. Himmler was not content, however, with simply Germanizing the Crimean population. He also planned to turn the landscape of Gatenga into his vision of a Teutonic homeland. 44 Germanic man, he explained to Kirsten, can only live in a climate suited to his needs and in a country adapted to his character, where he will feel at home and not be tormented by homesickness. 45 To soothe the new settlers and supply better cover for their defense. Himmler intended to plant hundreds of thousands of oak and beech trees to reproduce the ancient forests of northern Germany. We'll create a countryside something like that of Schleswig-Holstein, he boasted. 46. Himmler also planned to develop hardy new varieties of crops in order to boost the agricultural yields of colonies across the eastern territories. 47. He ordered the Annenerb to found a teaching and research institute in plant genetics, assigning the task to Dr. Ernst Schaefer the headstrong young German zoologist who had led the Tibet expedition. 48 Schaefer set to work with characteristic vigor. He obtained a staff of seven research scientists, including a British prisoner of war, and set up an experimental station at Lanach, near the town of Graz in Austria. There the new institute set to work, experimenting with samples of grains that Schaefer had acquired from the granaries of the Tibetan nobility. On June 2nd, 1942, after struggling for more than eight months to capture the entire Crimean Peninsula, Manstein ordered a massive artillery attack on Sevastopol, determined this time to take the Crimean port. At his command, a deafening bombardment of five-ton high-explosive shells shattered the Soviet fortifications with the force of a high-magnitude earthquake. A prolonged aerial attack by German dive bombers followed, flattening the city. 
Manstein's troops then began their final assault. Overwhelming the Soviet gunners in their heavily fortified hill positions in weeks of heavy fighting, they stole the guns of the dead and began fighting their way to Sevastopol's outskirts. By July 2, they had captured the city's airfields. The Soviet casualties were staggering. I have never seen such a battlefield in all of my life, reported one veteran SS officer. Thousands of totally destroyed vehicles lie in the area. Heavy weaponry of all kinds, guns and ammunition in short, everything that an army requires to fight are simply strewn haphazardly on the ground. The earth is all churned up and shell craters cover the ground between the enemy field positions. Tens of thousands of dead Russians, and uncounted horse cadavers contaminate the air. 49 Manstein's forces finally captured the city on July 4. Two and a half weeks later in Berlin, Sievers organized the necessary paperwork to send a small Ananurb scientific team to the region. 50 An eminently practical man, Sievers regarded the Battle of Sevastopol not as a human tragedy, but as a prime opportunity for new research and plunder. Despite the terrible devastation wreaked by the war, the Ananurb's most senior archaeologist, Dr. Herbert Jankin, was anxious to travel to South Russia in order to secure for the Reich the great Gothic treasures of the Crimea and to locate Gothic sites for excavation. For years, SS archaeologists and scholars had enthused over the beauty of the famous Gothic crown of the Crimea, a small garnet-encrusted diadem discovered in an ancient grave near the city of Kerch and exhibited in one of Berlin's most famous museums. 51 Jankin hoped very much to find more of the Kerch treasure. He also yearned to find proof of what he called the Gothic Empire in southern Russia. 52 such evidence would help build a case for Germany's claim to the future colony of Gatenga. Jankin was one of the most respected archaeologists in Germany. He was a short, muscular barrel of a man whose sturdy physique was strangely at odds with a fine-boned, almost delicate face. Raised in East Prussia, not far from the border of Lithuania, he believed implicitly in Greater Germany and the ultranationalist cause. His own schoolteacher father had played an active part in local politics, publishing a small book entitled Is There a Prussian Lithuania? And Jankin had inherited his father's conservative views. 53 at university, he had become fascinated by the history of the Knights of the Teutonic Order, a religious group that colonized Prussia in the 13th century, founding German towns and marketplaces throughout the region. 54 and these studies led Jankin directly into the field of historical archaeology, a discipline he excelled at. At 26, Jankin became the director of one of the most important excavations in Germany Haithabu, a Viking trading post located just south of the Danish border. It was there he first met Himmler, who toured the dig in March 1937.55 The SS chief took a keen interest in the site, offering to heavily subsidize the excavation. He confirmed Jankin as the leader. 56 A few months later, Jankin joined both the SS and the Ananurb. 57 Himmler came to prize his careful scientific approach and his extensive knowledge of the ancient world. The senior scientific staff at the Ananurb also welcomed Jankin into their midst. Bruno Schweitzer, Himmler's childhood friend, picked him as the leading archaeologist for the ill-fated Iceland expedition. In 1940, Himmler appointed Jankin head of the Ananurb's prehistory and excavations department, making him, as one scholar recently observed, the most powerful archaeologist in the Third Reich 58 from this August position, Jankin supervised German scientific research at major archaeological sites throughout the Reich. And as Hitler's empire expanded, so, too, did Jankin's field of activity. Just weeks after German forces invaded Norway in 1940, Jankin traveled to Oslo to inspect the nation's rich Viking sites and assist the SS security service in its futile attempt to win over the Norwegian population. 59 Soon after the evacuation of the British expeditionary force from Dunkirk, and the fall of France in June 1940, he toured the new occupied zone, examining the major archaeological sites and gathering information for the security service on the degree to which French peasants accepted German political ideas. 60 Like many Germans, Jankin believed that Britain was on the verge of capitulation. The end of the war, he concluded, was imminent, 
so he confidently proposed postponing the stock taking of French museums and private collections until after the armistice, when he would have more workers and greater financial resources at his disposal. 61. But Britain did not capitulate. The Luftwaffe's devastating blitz on London had failed to break the British spirit as Hitler had hoped. Moreover, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor had brought the United States into the war, greatly adding to the strength of the Allies. German casualty lists grew longer by the day, and in recognition of this fact, Himmler had recently urged his senior SS officers to send all able-bodied men on their staffs to military duty at the front. 62 but he did not apply this injunction to the senior scientists of the Annenerb, who were spared military service. In the summer of 1942, Himmler dispatched Jenkin and two colleagues Dr. Karl Kirsten, an expert on the Northern European Bronze Age, and Baron Wolf von Seefeld, a young ethnic German archaeologist from Latvia who spoke some Russian to the Black Sea region to search for the treasures of the Goths. Himmler considered this work to be of prime importance. Indeed, he asked that Jenkins' reports be forwarded directly to him, although he was mired in work supplying Waffen SS and police divisions to the Great Summer Offensive in the East, eliminating political opposition within the Reich administering his vast empire of concentration camps and lucrative SS business enterprises, and proceeding as quickly as he could with the extermination of the Jews. Jankin informed his two colleagues that they would be traveling light with knapsacks rather than suitcases, and with steel helmets rather than SS hats. 63 The three archaeologists departed on July 21, 1942, for the field headquarters of the SS Panzer Division Viking. Jankin had learned that the major Crimean museums had crated up their most important collections and shipped them to the Northern Caucasus before the arrival of the German army, hoping to protect them from theft. 64 Jankin was stubbornly determined to find and seize them, however, even if this meant traveling to the front itself, for he believed the artifacts to be of great scientific worth. 65 He hoped to catch a ride with Viking Division, which was advancing across the Northern Caucasus toward the rich oil fields of Mako. The three archaeologists endured a hot and dusty train trip to the Eastern Front, reaching the Viking command post at Starobesheve in the Ukraine on August 1. To Jankin's disappointment, however, the division commander, SS Gruppenführer Felix Steiner, had just departed on a mission to the front, forcing the archaeologists to cool their heels for five days at Starobesheve. While marking time at the camp, Jankin, an immensely intelligent and observant man, must have discovered that the division was traveling with Einsatzkommando 11 one of the roving killing units in Einsatzgruppe D as well as a gas wagon to facilitate the slaughter of Jews. 66 If Jankin found these traveling companions repulsive, he gave no indication of it in his surviving letters to the Annenerb. Indeed, Jankin seems to have befriended some of the senior officers of the murder squad. The new head of Einsatzgruppe D, for example, made a point of passing on information and advice to Jankin concerning the holdings of museums in the region. 67. Jankin yearned to get to work tracking down the treasures of the Crimea. Tired of marking time at Starobesheve, he ventured off to find Steiner at the front. When the two finally met, the commander explained that the Caucasus campaign had reached a critical stage. He did not want any distractions from the work at hand, but he reluctantly agreed to cooperate with Jankin. He advised the archaeologist to be cautious. 68 The military situation in the region, he noted, remained volatile and required clarification. Jankin, however, was not deterred by the prospect of danger. He, Kirsten, and Seefeld prepared to head south immediately with the Viking division and its accompanying Einsatzkommando. The journey to Mako must have been memorable for Jankin. Viking division took few prisoners, generally executing captives and suspected partisans on the spot. 69 Its tank drivers tended merely to run over refugees and others on the roads, instead of stopping or going around them. 70 And if the senior officers of the accompanying Einsatzkommando behaved like those of better known killing groups, they made little secret of their work, even casually posting notices of their murderous assignments on bulletin boards in their quarters for anyone to see. 71 Traveling with the division did not appear to disturb Jankin, however. 
As the tanks fought their way toward Mako, Jankin and his two colleagues searched the passing countryside for ancient grave mounds, secured local museum collections, and kept their ears open for rumors about the Kerch treasure. On August 9, German forces captured Mako as Hitler had directed, but it was a Pyrrhic victory. Before retreating, the Soviets had sabotaged the oil refineries, shutting down their production. As Jankin waited to enter the city, he received a radiogram from Sievers, relaying urgent orders from Himmler. Himmler had recently obtained from Ludolf von Alvensleben, the SS and police leader of Turian, a description of an ancient Crimean site known as Manhupkale. 72 Alvensleben had toured the Crimean mountain fortress with two companions, a historical novelist and a physician, and the trio had become convinced that Manhupkale was once the residence of Gothic princes. 73 Himmler wanted an immediate investigation. Jankin, however, was loath to abandon his search for the Goth treasures that the Soviet army had spirited away from Kerch. So he ordered Kirsten to depart immediately for the Crimea to start archaeological surveys of Manhupkale and other possible Gothic sites. On August 26, Jankin obtained a truck from the division and set off into Mako. Already, the Einsatzkommando had set up a killing facility in the city. 74 As eyewitnesses later recalled in court depositions, the SS and police forces had plastered notices on lampposts and storefronts, ordering Jews to gather in the courtyard of a building formerly belonging to the Soviet State Security Service, a place of ominous reputation. They were told to pack one suitcase in preparation for resettlement. In the courtyard, an Einsatzkommando officer greeted the crowd in a friendly way, patting one of the Jewish girls on the shoulder. This helped break the tension in the air. Someone then asked the assembled families to enter the building. Inside, men in uniforms ordered the crowd to strip and submit to an inspection to ensure they concealed no valuables. When this terrible indignity was over, the troops herded the frightened families into a gas wagon hidden away in a smaller courtyard. 75 By such assembly line methods, the Einsatzkommando methodically murdered the city's Jewish men, women, and children. Jankin and Seefeld made their way across Mako to the museum, where they proceeded to conduct a leisurely inspection. Jankin was very pleased. The Red Army had failed to ship off to safety some of the most important valuables and while the building had sustained some damage, much of its collection escaped unscathed. The display cases still gleamed with the splendid grave goods of an ancient Scythian noble a bronze helmet, basin, and cauldron which delighted Jankin, for he considered the Scythians, like the Goths, to be ancestors of the Germans. 76 He and Seefeld also spotted dozens of other desirable antiquities, including a Greek bronze helmet, decorated bronze mirrors, bronze equestrian gear, two war axes, two iron swords, bronze figurines, and paleolithic stone tools. 77 to Jenkins' disappointment. However, he could see nothing made by goth craftsmen. Nevertheless, after sizing up the value of the collection, he decided to ship off the most important antiquities to Berlin. He discussed the problem of transporting these valuables with Dr. Werner Braun, the commander of Einsatzkommando 11B and the man who had supervised the massacre of Jews at Simferopol six months earlier. 78 Braun took an avid amateur interest in archaeology and had even worked with the Annenerb at one time on educational reforms in Germany. 79 He had often talked to his troops about finding the Gothic treasure of Kerch and was clearly delighted that Jankin had turned up something valuable. He ordered his men to assist Jankin. They found a large crate and Jankin proceeded to pack up the objects that were scientifically and artistically the most important. A.D. Jankin was immensely grateful for Braun's help, praising in his final report the total support of the Einsatzkommando. 81 When Sievers learned of this assistance, he sent Braun a photo of the bronze helmet that Jankin had seized at Mako. This memento, wrote Sievers in an accompanying note, was supposed to serve as a nice reminder of this part of his work in the mission. 82. Jankin was still anxious, however, to locate the prize museum collections from Kerch. He and Seefeld kept their eyes and ears open, hoping that they might track down the hiding place, but increasingly Jankin worried that the treasure had been shipped off beyond reach. On August 28 in Armaver, 
an important railway junction in the Northern Caucasus, Seefeld received a key piece of intelligence. A medical warehouse in the city had received a transport of 72 wooden crates. They were reputedly filled with museum treasures from Simferopol, Sevastopol, and Kerch.83. Seefeld hurried to track down the crates, greatly excited by the thought of the treasure he was about to find. When he arrived at the warehouse, however, his heart fell. The depot had been reduced to a smoldering ruin. He got out of his car and took a look around. Out in the courtyard, he discovered twenty sealed crates and several others that had been pried open and plundered. Point eighty four. He notified Jankin of his discovery, and when the senior archaeologist arrived, they proceeded to pour over the contents of the sealed crates, artifact by artifact. They unwrapped ancient Greek vases, Greek terracotta statuettes, pearl necklaces, important Stone Age artifacts, ancient coins, a marble relief, valuable geography books on South Russia, Tatar mother of pearl chests, and carved marble reliefs. 85. But there was not a single Gothic artifact to be found amid the rubble there. Jankin gazed up with immense disappointment and frustration. The precious boxes concealing the treasure of Kerch had eluded him. Nevertheless, he and Seefeld packed up 14 crates of the most valuable antiquities and dispatched them back to the Ananerv offices in Berlin. 86. 17 Lords of the Manor. In the last week of August 1942, members of the SS High Command were much struck by the exceptionally high spirits of their leader. As Himmler strode purposefully between the airfields, meeting rooms, banquet halls, and elegant homes at Hagewald his secret field headquarters in northeastern Ukraine he greeted his senior officers with a smile and spoke warmly, even jovially at times, to his aides. On one memorable afternoon, he took time out from the briefings and telephone calls to play a popular European game, fistball, with some of his staff at the Sportplatz in the compound. Point one he believed, as Hitler did, that competitive sports honed and strengthened the human body, making it more fit for warfare. Point two later, he spent an hour in Hegewald's shooting gallery, practicing his marksmanship with a pistol. Part of Himmler's happiness stemmed from the satisfactory way that he had finally managed to arrange his personal life. His marriage to Marga had long been a source of frustration and acrimony. His 50-year-old wife had given him a blonde-haired daughter, Gudrun, whom he adored, and the couple had adopted a son. Often when Himmler returned to Germany, he visited his family in their chalet near Gmund. But his relationship with Marga had long ago dissolved, and it was exceedingly unlikely, given her age, that she would produce any more children. This greatly troubled Himmler. So he chose a willowy young blonde secretary on his personal staff, Hedwig Pothast, twelve years his junior, to become his mistress. He had installed Pothast, whom he affectionately referred to as Haskin, or Little Bunny, in considerable luxury in House Schneewinkelehen, near Birch Teskeden, not far from Hitler's mansion. The two were happy together, for they saw eye to eye on a great many things. Pothast, for example, saw little amiss with her lovers in human treatment of Jews. On one occasion, when her friend Gerda Bormann and her children dropped by for a visit, she offered to show them something very interesting. Three she led her guests up to the attic and ushered them into a small room. Inside, she pointed to some furniture a chair made from the polished bones of a human pelvic girdle, and another made from human legs and human feet. Then she picked up a copy of Main Kampf, explaining clinically and medically that its cover was made from human skin. Point four the Borman children shrunk back. They were horrified by the ghoulish display. In February 1942, Pothast gave birth to her first child by Himmler, a boy named Helge. Point five Himmler was delighted. Three years earlier, just shortly after the war began, he had issued an order to all SS men on the subject of fathering children. In a directive set in an old-style German typeface, he ordered all members of the SS to produce as many children as possible within marriage or outside of it, it made no matter. Only in this way, he declared, could the superior bloodlines of the SS survive the misfortunes of war. 
the old wisdom that only he who has sons and children can die peacefully must in this war again become reality for the Scoot Staffel the SS, he asserted six it was advice that many of his senior officers in Germany including Wolfram Sievers and several other senior Ananerb staff gratefully took to heart, acquiring lanky, blonde-haired mistresses and fathering second families. Point seven. The birth of a son contributed considerably to Himmler's buoyant mood in the summer of 1942. But beyond his personal situation, Himmler believed in mid-1942 that his cherished dream the creation of an SS-landed nobility in the East was at last within reach. Ever since he had embraced the goals of the agriculturally oriented Artemanian society in his twenties, he had dreamed of founding settlements of perfect young Nordic men and women who would defend the Reich from its enemies to the east and who would return to the pure ways of their ancestors. In these feudal settlements of Werbaren, or soldier farmers, Nordic families would till the earth, sow ancient grains, tend antique cattle breeds, live in medieval-style houses, heal the sick with traditional plant remedies and age-old magical incantations, play time-honored musical instruments such as the la practice the old Germanic religion, and generally follow the traditions of their ancestors as revealed by the scholars of the Ananerb. Himmler believed that SS colonization of the Crimea and other select regions of the Soviet Union was not far off, and in his field headquarters in the Ukraine he marveled at the speed with which his most cherished dream was unfolding. Who would have dreamed ten years ago that we would be holding an SS meeting near the Jewish-Russian city of Zhydemir, he gloated before a gathering of his SS officers in September. This Germanic East extending as far as the Urals must be cultivated like a hothouse of German blood. The next generations of Germans and history will not remember how it was done, but rather the goal. 8. Himmler was, of course, not the only one contemplating the future. For some time, Hitler had been mulling over the disposition of prized territories in the East. In the summer of 1942, he had read a paper on the Crimea that interested him greatly. Point nine. The writer, Alfred Frauenfeld, advocated resettling the region with ethnic German families from an ancient borderland between Austria and Italy. The region, known as the South Tyrol, was a restive place. Long part of the Austrian Empire, South Tyrol had been given to Italy at the end of the First World War. A few years later, Mussolini had tried to impose the Italian language on all of its residents. Point 10 He failed miserably. To calm growing dissent, he and Hitler agreed to allow the South Tyrolese to choose their own fate in a vote in 1939. Most of the region's German speaking residents opted to migrate to the Reich, an outcome that delighted many high ranking Nazis. Legend had it that the South Tyrolese descended from the wandering Goths. Indeed, one German writer dubbed them Goths conserved in glacial ice 11 but many questions remained about the origins of the South Tyrolese. After the vote, scholars from the Ananerb conducted detailed studies of their folk customs, music, house markings, clan symbols, architectural styles, folk art, and prehistory. They concluded that the ethnic Germans in the region were a valuable racial stock of ancient Werbaren. Point 12. Hitler had little intention, however, of settling tens of thousands of immigrants from South Tyrol on valuable farms in the German heartland. He much preferred to plant them elsewhere. Frauenfeld's plan to transport South Tyrolines more than a thousand miles east to the Crimea a foreign land situated on a dangerous border appealed to him greatly. It never occurred to Hitler that the South Tyrolines might have something to say about such a plan. Their transfer to the Crimea presents neither physical nor psychological difficulty, Hitler blithely informed his guests one night at Wolfskans. All they have to do is sail down one German waterway, the Danube, and there they are 13. All this talk at Wolfskans of new eastern settlements seems to have delighted Himmler. He had been waiting for just such a moment. For many months, he and his staff had labored over the master plan east, channeling all his dreams for the future onto paper. They had drawn up fanciful maps of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union dotted with proposed villages and Werbaren settlements, future forest sites and industrial areas, all linked by a vast new system of Autobahnen, or expressways. Himmler was convinced that Germany's future lay in such settlements, and he presented his ideas as forcefully as possible to Hitler. Point 14 To his astonishment, 
The German leader listened attentively, barely interrupting the presentation a rarity in his dealings with others. In mid-July 1942, Hitler approved these settlement plans. Point 15 Himmler was euphoric. Writing after the war, his personal physician Dr. Felix Kirsten recalled Himmler's mood when he arrived for a therapeutic massage not long after he had spoken to Hitler. It was, Himmler explained, the happiest day of his life. Everything I have been considering and planning on a small scale can now be realized. I shall set to at once on a large scale and with all the vigor I can muster. You know me, once I start anything I see it through to the end, no matter how great the difficulties may be. I asked Himmler to lie down so that I could begin the treatment. He did not even listen to me, but continued, the Germans were once a farming people and must essentially become one again. The East will help to strengthen the agricultural side of the German nation it will become the everlasting fountain of youth for the lifeblood of Germany, from which it will in turn be constantly renewed. These phrases opened my remarks to the Führer and I linked them with the idea of defending Europe's living space, which I knew lay very close to the Führer's heart. Villages inhabited by an armed peasantry will form the basis of the settlement in the East and will simultaneously be its defense, they will be the kernel of Europe's great defensive wall, which the Führer is to build at the victorious conclusion of the war. Germanic villages inhabited by a military peasantry and filling a belt several hundred miles wide just imagine, Herr Kirsten, what a sublime idea. It's the greatest piece of colonization which the world will ever have seen, linked to with a most noble and essential task, the protection of the Western world against an eruption from Asia. When he has accomplished that, the name of Adolf Hitler will be the greatest in Germanic history and he has commissioned me to carry out the task. 16. As Himmler was well aware, such sweeping plans for Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, involving the relocation of millions of people, could not possibly be carried out during a world war. They would have to wait for victory. In the meantime, however, Himmler proposed founding a small German colony around his own field headquarters at Hagewald, not far from the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. 17 such a colony, he argued, would serve a sound military purpose, for the settlers could grow grain and tend livestock to feed local SS and police forces. Himmler proceeded with his customary blend of brutality and efficiency. On October 10, 1942, his troops began forcibly rounding up 10,623 Ukrainian men, women, and children from family homes in the region, cramming them into boxcars destined for labor camps in the South Point 18 by the middle of the month, most of their houses stood eerily empty. Their dishes still sat on the kitchen table and their linen lay folded in the cupboards. Their livestock ran loose in the fields. When they were gone, trains began disgorging thousands of new settlers ethnic German families forcibly removed from villages and towns in the northern Ukraine. The bewildered newcomers stretched their legs and stared at the unfamiliar surroundings. Local SS officers left no doubt, however, as to who controlled the new colony. SS agricultural specialists doled out parcels of land to the new arrivals, giving most families small blocks of 14 acres as well as a promise to add to these modest allotments when the settlers proved their abilities as farmers. 19 The specialists also notified each family of the SS quotas of milk and produce that they would be required to meet, and informed the settlers that they could expect to have their crops confiscated when the SS had need of them. In addition, the specialists took note of all honorable blocks of land and set them aside for SS factories, where Ukrainian slave laborers would soon be put to work. Point 20. It was not quite the SS settlement that Himmler had originally dreamed of, but he intended to set matters straight as soon as Germany won the war, bestowing large parcels of land in the east on his SS men and officers. Members of his staff were well aware of this plan and frequently argued over the size of their own future country holdings. As Himmler's physician, Felix Kirsten, recalled after the war, they all dreamed of the grand estates in the East that had been promised to them as the first fruits of victory. They waxed hot and eloquent on the subject. There were even quarrels, occasionally, over the exact dimensions of the farms that should be allotted to them, the comparative wealth of the reward according to the years of their service. 
one man would say he expected to receive a gift of a thousand hectares, at least. Another would pipe up with, but I've been in the party a year longer than you. If you get a thousand hectares, what about me? I ought to receive in all justice, two thousand hectares. And a third, what about me? I got this wound in my arm during the putsch. And a fourth, well, I was photographed twice with the Fuhrer. And for a deed of bravery, I was awarded this party emblem in gold. I should have, by the way you all rate yourselves, at least five thousand hectares. Twenty-one. Few lands would better suit the new SS gentry than the Crimea, with its languid shores and pretty vineyards and sunny fruit orchards. The new Nazi governor of the Crimea, Alfred Frauenfeld, had described it as a paradise that rivaled the Alps, the French Riviera, and Sicily. 22 Well aware of its many attractions, Himmler was anxious to begin staking the SS claim to this Garden of Eden. On September 17, 1942, Dr. Karl Kirsten received a letter from the commander of the security police and the security service in the Crimean city of Simferopol. Kirsten had just arrived from the Caucasus, where he had accompanied Herbert Jenkin on the search for the ancient treasures of the Goths. The archaeologist was expecting to begin a detailed survey of the Crimean cave cities in preparation for major Ananurb excavations, but the letter in his hands contained new orders. Himmler, he learned, was planning to visit the Crimea in the fall and intended to take this opportunity to visit the Gothic cities of the Crimea. 23 The SS command ordered Kirsten to draw up a suitable itinerary. In civilian life, Kirsten was an expert on the Northern European Bronze Age and a curator at the Prehistory Museum of Kiel. 24 He was a clever, reserved man with hooded, deep set eyes and a long, sharp nose and the look of someone not easily deceived. He had met Jankin as a student in 1929, and the two men became fast friends. To pursue his studies, Kirsten had traveled to Eastern Europe and conducted research in Russia. In 1937, he had taken out a Nazi party membership, but he had defended ultranationalist policies for years. He was a strong anti-Semite, and his political attitude, vouched Jankin in one official report, was irreproachable. 25. A diligent man, Kirsten recognized that he knew very little about the complex prehistory and history of the Crimea, with its thousands of years of war and diplomacy, piracy and trade by a rich blend of cultures the Goths and Sumerians, Scythians and Sarmatians, Greeks and Alans, and Hazars, Huns, and Turks. So after receiving his new orders, he spent six days in the Simferopol Museum, poring over photographs of ruins and skimming the available scientific literature on the most important sites. On September 23, he set off with a driver and a translator to hunt for the imperial cities of the ancient Goths. 26. As beautiful as the Crimean countryside was, with its grassy plateaus and steep mesas, it was not a relaxing place to travel in the early fall of 1942. Although Manstein's army had dealt a decisive defeat to the Soviet forces at Sevastopol, many of the local inhabitants had joined partisan groups who had begun carrying on a bloody war of attrition against the Germans. Some hid from time to time in the old cave cities of the region that perched high atop the local mountains. Kirsten had no particular desire to surprise them while drawing up an itinerary for Himmler. He called in at local police stations to check on partisan activity before heading into the countryside. Kirsten chose the old totter town of Bakkisaray as his base and arose each morning to the unfamiliar call of the muezzins from the local mosques. Notebook in hand, he headed out in a private car after breakfast, rummaging for traces, any traces, of an ancient Gothic empire. He trekked up to the old ruins of Bakla, wandering among the wild roses and the hawthorns, and roamed about the old cave city of Shufut Kale, puzzling over its small cliffside dwellings and taking note of an old totter courtroom and prison where torturing and killing took place 27 but sprawling as it was, Shufut Kale could not be the old Gothic capital, Doros. Its earliest known construction, he noted in his report, was not Gothic at all, but a Byzantine chapel dating to the 6th century.28. He spent a morning in the prehistory museum tucked away in the old Khan's palace in Bakkisaray, 
examining carved stone reliefs taken from several of the old cave settlements of the Goths, and for a day and a half, he roved the ancient fortress of Teep Kerman, rubbing dirt from the pottery shards he found and hunching over graves in a Gothic cemetery. He recommended that the Ananurb conduct excavations at the site. There should be no doubt as to the Gothic origins of the city, he observed in his report, because of the situation of the caves and the form of the graves 29. But he had still not seen anything that resembled the capital of a great Gothic empire, so he resumed his survey. On September 30, he set off to see the famous ruins of Eski Kerman. The old Crimean cave city was a formidable fortress, perched along a steep mesa top, below ran an old military road and trade route to the ancient ports of Inkerman and Balaklava. Russian archaeologists had spent five field seasons at Eski Kerman in the late 1920s and early 1930s. They had surveyed its walls, excavated one of its gates, and studied its graves. They concluded that it was quite likely the old city of Doros mentioned in the histories of the classical world, but they made no mention of a vast Gothic empire. Point 30 Kirsten was keen to explore the shadowy hollows of Eski Kerman. He slowly tramped up the steep, serpentine path to its southern gate, gazing up at the high cliffs and the chambers there where sentries once guarded the approaches. He spent nine hours rambling through the old city, or rather what remained of it. He marveled at some of the 356 caves, casements and defensive towers, which have been built directly into the cliff and which have been erected exactly at those points where footpaths lead through small gaps in the cliffs and into the inner city. 31 He traipsed through stables and granaries and found the spot where the city's basilica once stood and roamed through its graveyard. But what he most hoped to find was some trace of imperial splendor, the remnant of some mighty Gothic palace. In this he was disappointed. The old catacomb city bore no resemblance at all to the glories of Imperial Rome, with its Colosseum and its Pantheon and Hadrian's Villa. If Himmler hoped to gaze upon the Gothic counterpart of ancient Rome, then Eski Kerman would be a disappointment. But Kirsten refused to admit what other scholars had long known that the cave cities and fortresses were merely part of a Gothic province that was subordinate to the great Byzantine Empire, whose capital lay in Constantinople. 32 Kirsten firmly adhered to the Nazi party line. At Eski Kerman, he concluded, the Goths founded the main city in the Crimean Gothic Empire in the 5th century 33. The archaeologist continued his survey. He was particularly keen to see the old cave city of Manhup Kale, the one that Himmler's former aide, Ludolf von Alvinsleben, and two associates, had visited a few months earlier. To Kirsten's disappointment, however, Manhupkale had become too dangerous a place to visit. Someone in a nearby village had spotted partisans taking shelter in the ruins. He resumed his journey, continually stopping in to inspect potentially promising sites as he headed west. He took careful notes of all that he saw, and in early October he dutifully dictated short, plotting reports on all the major sites for Jankin and the local SS authorities. Then, before heading north to survey sites along the Dnieper River, he carefully drew up an itinerary for Himmler's forthcoming visit to the Crimea. 34. The SS leader flew into Simferopol on October 27, 1942. He had arrived to see for himself the future colony of Gatenga and to ensure the successful conclusion of a major SS and police operation against the Crimea's partisan forces. 35 from bases tucked away in the mountains. The partisans had succeeded in miring German army and police forces in an ugly little war, preventing the military from handing over responsibility for the region to a civil administration. Their operations had greatly perturbed Hitler. Over dinner one night, Hitler insisted that Germany would not be denied its possession of the Crimea. The struggle we are waging there against the partisans resembles very much the struggle in North America against the Red Indians, he explained. Victory will go to the strong, and strength is on our side. At all costs we will establish law and order there. 36. 
to impose that law and order a necessary prerequisite to the resettlement of the Crimea local SS and police forces had drawn up plans for something they called Operation Leatherstocking.37 informants in the region had told them about a small airfield in the mountains near Alishta where Soviet pilots were secretly landing supplies for the partisans. Based on this intelligence, senior German officers in the region had drawn up plans for a counter-offensive. It called for capturing the airstrip, destroying the supplies hidden nearby, and surprising a large number of the partisans who had gathered in the area. While waiting for his forces to deal a crushing blow to this local resistance, Himmler had decided to tour the Crimean countryside and inspect the ancient Gothic sites that Kirsten had described in his official reports. So on the morning of October 28, he set out from Simferopol on a grand tour of his future German colony. He journeyed first to Bakkisaray, and visited the old Khan's palace, with its pretty grounds and its harem rooms and its museum with the carved relief stones from Manhupkail and Eski Kerman.38 Then in the bright sunlight, so different from the damp and cold and grey of a Berlin fall, he drove to Sevastopol to see the devastated battlefield, and stopped to view the old Gothic port of Inkerman, one of the cave cities that Kirsten had described briefly in his report.39. Almost certainly Himmler expected to hear good news from his men that evening about the resistance fighters. But there was no word of a decisive defeat, not that day, or the next, or the next. As it soon became clear, Operation Leatherstocking was a failure. The SS and police forces managed to capture the airfield, as well as a broadcast station and the storage facilities, but they failed to surround the partisans themselves. Point 40 indeed. The local fighters eluded them entirely, melting back into the mountain country that they knew so well. For all of Himmler's careful planning, and all the long hours he spent contemplating the maps of the master plan east and reveling in the future of Gatenga and its villages of SS farmers, the Crimea remained unconquered. Angered and troubled by the turn of events, Himmler made no further attempt to visit the other Gothic cave cities on Kirsten's itinerary. The golden moment of triumph he craved the contemplation of which had constituted the happiest day of Himmler's life had been snatched from his hands. 18 Searching for the Star of David Sitting in their orderly offices in Berlin, SS racial experts were greatly troubled by the extraordinary cultural richness of the Soviet Union. Surrounded by neatly arranged card indexes and carefully alphabetized file folders, they had never grasped before the unruly complexity of the world. They had never understood that a nation such as the Soviet Union could be so vast, so complicated, so chaotic, or that human beings could be so diverse, so exotic, so difficult to pigeonhole. More than 80 different ethnic groups resided in the country from the Belarusians to the Moldavians, the Ossetians to the Chuvash, the Kazakhs to the Mongols, the Tungus to the Darjins, the Chechens to the Kavardash, the Mordvins to the Mansi, the Ninets to the Karayaks.1 and this posed serious questions for the racial specialists of RUSHA. Who among all of these peoples was Aryan? And exactly who was Jewish? Each day seemed to bring new doubts. German racial scholars, after all, had still not devised a way of identifying members of the supposed Jewish race. In their scientific papers, they struggled in vain to define the physical characteristics of Jews. More often than not, they had fallen back on old anti-Semitic stereotypes. They talked about the short stature of Jews, about their flat breasts and rounded backs and weak muscles, their large, fleshy ears and hooked noses and yellowish skin, about the way they shuffled when they walked and the way they mumbled when they talked, and their great susceptibility to schizophrenia, manic depression, and morphine addiction.2 But in reality, German racial experts could not separate the fictional Jewish race from its fictional Aryan counterpart. Indeed, one famous anthropological study conducted among German school children had revealed that 11.17% of Jewish children possessed fair skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Point three Nazi researchers lacked a biological equivalent of the yellow star of David. Point four nothing offered itself, and this failure deeply troubled racial scholars in the SS. Already, the uncertainty was stirring up confusion where Himmler least wanted to see it in the minds of the SS killing squads. Just six months after the Russian campaign began, one of the Ansatzgruppen leaders, 
Otto Ohlendorf, had thrown up his hands in the Crimea, unable to determine what to do with two local groups the Krimchuks and the Karaites. Point five reputedly, the Krimchuks descended from Jews who fled the Spanish Inquisition, but they closely resembled their Muslim neighbors, the Tatars. They spoke a variant of Tatar, lived in Tatar-style houses, married into Tatar families, and followed many Muslim customs. Their women, for example, wore veils in public. Point six. The second group, the Karaites, equally confounded the SS. They were a Turkish people who spoke a Turkish language, but they practiced Judaism devoutly. Point seven was either truly Jewish. This conundrum seems to have sparked great anxiety in the SS headquarters in Berlin. Hitler had frequently likened the Jews to a dangerous microbe that threatened the rest of humanity, and he had become increasingly incensed by the Jews of the Soviet Union. Russia, he had observed in one venomous conversation in July 1941, has become a plague center pest herd for mankind. For if only one state tolerates a Jewish family among it, this would provide the core Bacillus bazillin herd for a new decomposition. Eight well aware of these views, Himmler intended to wipe out every last Jew in the German-occupied territories of the Soviet Union. He solicited the opinions of various self-proclaimed SS authorities on Judaism, for their views on the Krimchuks and Karaites. Point nine. He then resolved to eradicate those belonging to the fictive Jewish race in the Crimea, and turn a blind eye to those who followed the Jewish faith. He ordered Ohlendorf and his men to liquidate the Krimchuks, who followed all manner of Muslim customs, and to spare the Karaites, who were devout Jews. Point 10. Perhaps Himmler hoped he had seen the last of such troublesome problems. But the confusion had only just begun. As the murder squads moved eastward into the Caucasus a borderland between East and West, Europe and Asia the lines between ethnic groups and tribes became more and more blurred. SS troops stumbled upon villages of the Christian Ossetes, who physically resembled their Jewish neighbors, lived in villages with Jewish names, married their sons and daughters off in Jewish-style marriage ceremonies, and buried their dead in Jewish-style funerals. Point 11 And they met mountain Jews who rode their horses superbly, bred fine cattle, and seldom stirred anywhere without strapping on their daggers and guns all qualities greatly admired by SS men. Point 12 who was who in this great ethnic bedlam? Who was Jewish and who wasn't? All the old certainties were slipping away. At times like this, Himmler counted upon science and scholarship to show the way. On December 10, 1941, Wolfram Sievers welcomed SS racial specialist Bruno Beger to his office in the Annenerb headquarters in Berlin. Although most young German men had been called up to active service patrolling the waters of the North Atlantic in U-boats, battling British tanks in the bleak desert of North Africa, or navigating across the frozen forests of the Soviet Union in Stuka dive bombers and Messerschmitt sievers had managed to obtain exemptions for many of the Annenerb's young scientists and scholars. This he did largely by transforming the research organization itself. While the Annenerb had long supplied scientific camouflage for Nazi racial policies and furnished blueprints for future SS farm settlements, it had, since the onset of the war, taken an increasingly active part in the wartime crimes of the SS. These illegal activities had begun with the plundering of foreign museums, galleries and private homes, but in recent months they had taken a far more deadly turn. With Himmler's encouragement, a senior Annenerb researcher, Dr. Sigmund Rascher, was preparing to investigate the far limits of human endurance at extremely high altitudes. Point 13 British fighter planes had pushed German aircraft to higher and higher elevations, and the Luftwaffe command feared for the safety of its air crews. Rascher, a medical doctor, proposed testing the problem by replicating the effects of extreme high altitude on human beings placed in a vacuum chamber. Knowing that the experiments would inflict great suffering and kill some of the subjects, he had requested the use of concentration camp prisoners a suggestion that Himmler readily approved. While Sievers waited for Rascher's high-altitude trials to begin at Dachau, he began planning one of the most notorious mass murders of the Second World War. Like many other senior SS officers, Sievers knew all about the difficulties German racial scientists were having in defining the racial characteristics of Jews. Indeed, 
he had long hoped that the Ananerb could play a key role in solving this problem. Since 1939, one of the Ananerb's department heads, biologist Walter Greet, had been studying racial measurements that he and a team of assistants had conducted in Vienna in 1939 on some 2,000 Jews anxious to emigrate from the Reich. But the project was an embarrassing fiasco. 14 Greet had assigned the important and tedious task of statistically analyzing the measurements to his secretary, and had failed abjectly in coming up with anything new. 15. If the Ananerb intended to make any headway with this problem, it clearly needed someone more reliable and energetic to handle the Jewish file. Beggar, the ambitious young Rasenkunda scholar from the Tibet expedition, must have seemed a logical choice to Sievers. In their December 10, 1941, meeting, the two men discussed Jewish research. 16 Beggar seems to have taken an interest in the subject. He had, after all, worked for four years for RUSHA, a deep mire of anti-Semitism where researchers had helped draft the Nuremberg race laws and continued to churn out studies to expand the Holocaust. 17 Moreover, he had risen to the position of division head at RUSHA before he set off to Tibet. Since his return, he had continued working for the department in an honorary capacity. 18. In the meeting with Sievers, Beggar seems to have discussed going about the Jewish research in a completely different way. To study Jews thoroughly and to search for that elusive feature that would define and label Jewishness the shape of the ears, perhaps, or the arch of the cheekbone he would need a good reference collection of Jewish skulls, one that contained as wide a variety of Jewishness as possible. Point 19 If the Ananerb wanted to ensure that its findings would apply to the disparate Jewish communities of the Soviet Union, the collection would have to include a representative sample of Jewish skulls from across the nation, from the remote mountain villages of the Caucasus to the bustling streets of Murmansk in the north. Acquiring such a collection would be difficult. Few if any universities or museums in the Reich possessed large numbers of Jewish skulls. Devout Jews had long regarded tampering with the dead as a terrible sacrilege. They looked with horror upon autopsies which they believed mutilated the deceased and cherished cemeteries as holy ground. As a result, few European anthropologists had dared to collect scientific specimens of Jewish skulls. The world-famous Museum of Natural History in Vienna, for example, possessed only 22 of these crania, and had searched far and wide for others to display in a planned exhibit on the mental and racial characteristics of the Jewish people. 20 To expand this collection, curator Joseph Wastel had proposed digging in Vienna's old Jewish cemeteries in 1939, but Austrian officials had denied permission for the dig not out of any sense of decency, it seems, but because property developers were hungrily eyeing the land. Point 21. So intense was Wastel's desire to study the Jews, however, that he eventually ended up purchasing Jewish skulls by mail order from the Anatomy Institute of the Reich University of Posen, a new creation of the Nazis in occupied Poland. 22 The director of this Anatomy Institute, Dr. Hermann Voss, had made a bargain with the local Gestapo. In exchange for the use of his institute's incinerator, he received bodies of some prisoners who had been guillotined or hung. These cadavers he rendered into anatomical specimens that could be sold to interested parties. The porter at the institute later recalled how the system worked. The heads of the transported victims were thrown into a basket like turnips, and brought in the elevator to the third floor for maceration, he explained. Here they were prepared and later used in our Institute of Anatomy, where some can still be found, or sent to various universities in Germany, or sold to the students 23. Voss made a tidy profit from the business. He sold individual Jewish skulls for 25 Reichsmarks or $130 in today's currency and agreed to furnish the victim's date and place of birth, information considered vital for many scientific studies. He also offered a small range of other similar wares. Together with these Jew skulls, Voss wrote to one potential customer, I am able to supply plaster death masks of the individuals concerned at RM15 of especially typical Ostjuden Eastern Jews. I can also prepare for you plaster busts, so that one can see the shape of the head, before dissection, and the frequently rather unique ears. 
The price of these busts would be 30 to 35 RM but because of a scarcity of time and plaster I could not supply very many. 24. For statistical reasons, Beggar needed a minimum of 120 Jewish skulls to produce significant results. 25 to obtain such a large number could be costly, and there was no guarantee that he could find a broad diversity of Jews. So Beggar and Sievers conferred, contemplating ways of laying hands on a large and diverse collection, and at some point in the conversation, Sievers seems to have mentioned the name of Dr. August Hurd, the German director of the Anatomical Institute at the New Reich University of Strasbourg. 26 Just two and a half weeks earlier, Sievers had dined with Hurt at the university's official opening ceremonies, and it seems to have occurred to him that Hurt could help obtain a collection of Jewish skulls. As fate would have it, Beggar knew the anatomist well. He had met Hurt while serving in the SS in Heidelberg in 1934 and both men had worked for the RUSHA in 1937, becoming good friends. 27 Beggar welcomed the anatomist as a collaborator. Hurt was 13 years older than Beggar and was a man that many found impossible to forget. As a young teenage soldier during the First World War, he had received a severe gunshot wound to his upper and lower jaw. 28 When the injury finally mended, his face took on a fierce, scarred, rather cavernous look that tended to unsettle people. Hurt tried to compensate for this with a jocular, friendly, outgoing demeanor. 29 Some people found this bluff manner charming and were greatly drawn to him. 30 But others were unable to get beyond his scarred appearance. 31 Despite his terrible injury or perhaps because of it Hurt studied medicine at university, becoming a talented anatomist. He specialized in the human nervous system, and together with a Jewish colleague, he pioneered an early form of medical imaging that permitted researchers to inject dyes into the organs of living animals and study their function under fluorescent light. 32 But the long hours he sunk into his research did not stop him from getting involved in extremist politics. While he was a member of the medical faculty at the University of Heidelberg, he joined the SS, swiftly becoming its campus leader and on the strength of his research and the strong connections he was beginning to forge to the SS, he rose to prominence in the German medical establishment. In 1939, shortly before the German invasion of Poland, Hurt joined one of the army's panzer divisions as a military doctor and spent the next two years tending the wounded in a series of field hospitals. After Germany's annexation of the long-disputed French territory of Alsace-Lorraine in 1940, he received an important new position in Strasbourg. The Reich Ministry of Education had transformed the city's 400-year-old university into a new type of educational institute, the Reich University of Strasbourg. Staffed with German scientists and scholars, the university was intended to be a showcase of Nazi research and pedagogy. 33 It hired Hurt as the director of its anatomical institute. From the start, he paraded his authority as an SS officer, turning up at classes dressed in an SS uniform complete with a revolver slung in his holster. 34. In Strasbourg, Hurt began searching for war-related research projects. He believed that a dye he used in his medical imaging research tropoflavine might help heal the terrible burns suffered by soldiers caught in a mustard gas attack. 35. The German army had employed mustard gas in the First World War, and many Germans feared that the Allies would one day turn the tables. Hurt wanted to test the dye treatment, claiming that he had enjoyed some success with it while assisting a pharmacist accidentally exposed to mustard gas. But the treatment had no scientific merit. Tropoflavine is in itself a toxic substance so much so, in fact, that researchers handling the chemical today in laboratories are warned to wear a long-sleeved laboratory coat or gown, rubber gloves, safety goggles, and a face mask as a minimum standard of safety. 36. Nevertheless, Heard proceeded. 37. He exposed laboratory rats, as well as dogs and pigs, to mustard gas, then attempted to treat them. The experiments ended badly. Hurt was so careless with the poison gas that he developed serious lung lesions himself, landing in a hospital in Strasbourg. Despite this failure, however, he wanted to move on to human trials. He recognized that volunteers for such research would be scarce, so he began casting around for other options. 
the growing SS network of concentration camps seemed to him an obvious source of expendable human beings. So while dining with Sievers in Strasbourg in November 1941, he broached the matter. 38. Sievers relayed the substance of this conversation to Himmler on his return to Berlin. The SS leader was greatly interested in the idea of finding an antidote for mustard gas burns, for Hitler himself had fallen victim to a gas attack during the First World War, becoming temporarily blinded. 39. So in late December 1941, Himmler agreed to furnish Hurt with prisoners and professional criminals, who would not be given their freedom anyhow, as well as people who are scheduled to be executed. 40. And it may have been at this time that Sievers brought up the problem of the Jewish skull. Collection. Certainly Hurt readily agreed to assist. In all likelihood, the physician saw the endeavor as a way of building a new anatomical collection for his institute at Strasbourg. Perhaps he even harbored thoughts of getting into the skull mail order business himself. The only question that remained was where to obtain the necessary variety of Jewish skulls from the Soviet Union. None of the three collaborators Sievers, Beger, or Hurt knew of any such collection in the Reich. But one of them secretly came up with a grisly alternative. 41 under a directive known as the Commissar Order, the German military was expected to execute without trial any Soviet commissars that it captured. 42 as was so often the case in the Third Reich, the language of the order was euphemistic. By commissars, the army actually meant Jews. Nazi propagandists had skillfully portrayed Soviet political officers and officials as Jews for years, and so deeply ingrained was this notion in the minds of many SS and Wehrmacht officers that they simply accepted it as fact. 43 While some army officers refused to carry out the infamous order, others began executing Jewish civilians as they advanced across the Soviet Union. So in February 1942, Hurt or Beggar or possibly both men together wrote a proposal for a new research project. Hurt then seems to have forwarded it to Sievers. Subject, securing skulls of Jewish Bolshevik commissars for the purpose of scientific research at the Strasbourg Reich University. There exist extensive collections of skulls of almost all races and peoples, Volkern. Of the Jewish race, however, only so very few specimens of skulls stand at the disposal of science that a study of them does not permit precise conclusions. The war in the East now presents us with the opportunity to remedy this shortage. By procuring the skulls of the Jewish Bolshevik commissars, who personify a repulsive, yet characteristic subhumanity, we have the opportunity of obtaining tangible, scientific evidence. The actual obtaining and collecting of these skulls without difficulty could be best accomplished by a directive issued to the Wehrmacht in the future to immediately turn over alive all Jewish Bolshevik commissars to the field MP. Feld Belize. The field MP. Feld Belize in turn is to be issued special directives to continually inform a certain office of the number and place of detention of these captured Jews and to guard them well until the arrival of a special deputy. This special deputy, commissioned with the collection of the material, a junior physician assigned to the Wehrmacht or even the field MP, or a medical student equipped with a car and driver, is to take a prescribed series of photographs and anthropological measurements, and is to ascertain, in so far as is possible, the origin, date of birth, and other personal data of the prisoner. Following the subsequently induced death of the Jew, whose head must not be damaged, he will separate the head from the torso and will forward it to its point of destination in a preservative fluid within a well-sealed tin container especially made for this purpose. On this basis of the photos, measurements, and other data on the head and finally, the skull itself, the comparative anatomical research, research on race membership Rassenzug-Horikait, the pathological features of the skull form, the form and size of the brain and many other things can begin. In accordance with its scope and tasks the new Strasbourg Reich University would be the most appropriate place for the collection of and research upon these skulls thus acquired. 44. Himmler read this proposal with immense interest. A month earlier, in a large villa overlooking Grosser Wannsee, the SS had sought and obtained official government approval for a policy that it had already secretly adopted and embarked upon. 45 This was the final solution the seizing and murdering of all Jews in the territories under German control. 
During the meeting at Wanzi, officials had debated at some length the problem of the miskling, or part Jews, and the measures to be taken against them. Himmler was keen to take action. He wanted RUSHA to racially evaluate all children of mixed marriages and their progeny for three or four generations, just as agriculturalists did when attempting to breed superior varieties of plants and animals. 46 descendants who exhibited Jewish traits could then be at least sterilized, if not murdered. For this, the SS needed a much clearer picture of the Jewish race. Beyond all these official reasons, however, Himmler was intrigued by the idea of a Jewish skull collection. He believed that a man's character and criminal nature could be clearly read in the assemblage of his bones and he sometimes gave little lectures on this theme to his SS entourage. While touring Poland aboard his private train in September 1939, for example, he had instructed his men to bring forth some of the criminal specimens from among the local Jews. 47 with a stick in his hand, he would then point out certain facial features and skeletal characteristics of old men who were visibly quaking with fear. These people, he concluded, were vermin 48. So at the end of February 1942, he instructed his personal administrative officer, Dr. Rudolf Brandt, to inform Hurt that he would place at his disposal everything he needs 49. Two months later, over the Easter holidays, Sievers attended an evening meeting with Himmler and a certain SS Sturm Banfuhrer Petra.50 over a leisurely dinner, Sievers discussed with Himmler the possibility of archaeological research in Bulgaria, and the current state of Rascher's high-altitude experiments at Dachau. The young SS physician had embarked with great relish on the tests killing several of his subjects and this news and the recent proposal from Hurt had given Himmler a new idea. 51 The Nazi leadership had long regarded modern medicine as a degenerate science due to the great influence of Jewish physicians. 52 In its place, many prominent Nazis had embraced all manner of alternative medical treatments and drugs. During the war, Hitler had criticized German physicians for not doing enough to save the lives of soldiers at the front. 53 So Himmler decided to take matters into his own hands. He instructed Sievers to found a new research organization within the Annenerb to oversee medical experiments performed on concentration camp prisoners. 54. Three months later, the Institute for Military Scientific Research was born. Walther Wust, the cautious superintendent of the Annenerb, assumed direct responsibility for the new institute. 55 but was seems to have distanced himself from its day-to-day -day activities. Instead, Himmler appointed Sievers to the position of director and approved the creation of two divisions one headed by Rascher, the other by Hurt. Financing was to come directly from the Waffen SS. As the new division head, Hurt began rethinking plans for the Jewish skull collection. Transporting human heads all the way from the Soviet Union would be extremely troublesome. A more practical solution was to find subjects in the extensive network of German concentration camps. In this way, Beggar could personally select the victims and perform a first set of racial measurements while the individuals were still alive. When this was done, camp guards could murder the subjects in a tidy manner, making sure that they did not damage any bones. Hurt then could dispatch an assistant to pick up the remains and transport them to his lab in Strasbourg. There his staff could proceed to deflesh the bodies and produce skeletons suitable for a reference collection. Although Beggar insisted vociferously after the war that he knew nothing of this plan until it was too late to save the victims, he may possibly have been aware of it from the start. Point 56 there was, after all, no obvious reason to keep secrets from him. The honorary RUSHA staff member seems to have long agreed with SS plans to eliminate the Jews. Indeed, he later advocated conducting research on the characteristics of the Jewish spirit so that even this ephemeral influence could be rubbed out of German life. As he explained in a letter to Himmler's personal assistant, I take the view that the complete extermination of the Jews in Europe, and beyond that, in the whole world if possible, will not mean that the spiritual elements of Jewry, which we encounter at every turn, are fully eradicated. The important role of research on racial souls stems from this fact. 57. Before Beggar and Hurt could get down to work, Sievers had to tackle a number of complex logistical problems. 
he quickly discovered that Auschwitz would be the best place to send Begur, for the sprawling prison served as a major death camp for prisoners from the east. But Auschwitz was located in southern Poland a long, unrefrigerated train trip away from Strasbourg and Hurt refused to work with half-decayed bodies. So Sievers set about obtaining permission to ship the selected prisoners alive from Auschwitz to a camp much nearer to Strasbourg Nat Seiler. This new plan solved many logistical problems, but it created a new one. Nat Seiler was one of the smallest camps in the German system, with a large cohort of prisoners who were members of the French resistance. Point 58 It did not possess a gas chamber. So the SS leadership seems to have ordered the construction of one to accommodate Hertz work. Point 59. Hurt needed additional equipment and facilities in Strasbourg, too. He requested a special elevator for corpses to be built at the Anatomical Institute. Point 60. He also ordered custom made equipment for rendering in a sanitary way entire human corpses, with their hair, nails, tendons, cartilage, muscles, and other soft tissues down to pristine skeletons. Point 61 Museum preparators had devised several methods over the years for defleshing animal cadavers for scientific and educational collections. Point 62 To strip soft tissue from large mammals, they sometimes buried cadavers in the ground to allow soil bacteria and chemicals to eat away the flesh, but the process could easily take more than a year and the resulting skeleton often smelled horribly, making it totally unsuitable for display indoors. It was also possible to remove flesh from cadavers by placing them into containers inhabited by colonies of dermistid beetles. But this procedure required large crawling masses of beetles, something rather at odds with the image of an antiseptic medical institute. So Hurt chose a third and more sanitary method that of maceration. Point 63 The bodies would first be immersed, one by one in a large tank filled with a substance such as lime chloride. Point 64 This would dissolve all the soft parts. Then they would be placed in a second solution such as gasoline to remove all traces of fat. A corpse treated in this way would be flensed within a matter of weeks. Point 65 The result would be a bleached skeleton that still contained much of its cartilage, but emitted no foul odor an important consideration in an anatomical laboratory. Chemical maceration required a large steel tank and a heat source, as well as special equipment for bone degreasing, all of which had to be custom manufactured. This would be no easy matter in wartime Germany, where most factories were dedicated to churning out munitions of one sort or another. Hurt had already ordered the equipment from the German manufacturer Bergmann und Altmann, but the company had made little progress in delivering point 66 to speed matters up. Sievers handed the file over to his personal assistant Wolf Dietrich Wolf, who began doggedly following up on the order. So deeply did Wolf fall into the spirit of the project that he soon began referring to the future victims of the project as Object 67. With Sievers's immense talent for organization, the necessary preparations were rapidly forging ahead by the end of September 1942. But on October 3rd, Beggar learned of something worrying. A typhus epidemic had broken out at Auschwitz. He immediately discussed the problem with her to see what should be done, then wrote to Sievers. It is, of course, very important to establish if this is true before the ordered racial examinations and recordings are done, he declared, because otherwise there is a risk that typhus will be brought back into the Reich. Professor Hurt specifically pointed this out to me. 68. Beggar's information proved correct. In an effort to stamp out the plague, the Auschwitz authorities began marching off all infected prisoners to the gas chambers. Point 69 In addition, they prohibited prisoners from traveling outside the camp boundaries, even when requisitioned as slave labor for various work projects. 70 It would be impossible under this ban for Hurt and Beggar to convey their subjects from Auschwitz to Nat Seiler. So the two men were forced to put their plans for the Jewish skeleton collection on hold for the next eight months. The delay must have been a particular frustration for Beggar. In August 1942, as the Wehrmacht began advancing toward the mountains of the Caucasus, Himmler had issued orders for two detailed scientific studies of the Middle East. Point 71 He had directed Walther was to prepare a team of eight researchers, including a racial anthropologist, 
to conduct archaeological, racial, and other studies in Iran. 72 And he had commanded biologist Ernst Schaefer, the leader of the Tibet expedition, to head a military and scientific mission to the Caucasus known as Special. Command K.73 Schaefer in turn had promptly named his old colleague, Bruno Beger, as the deputy leader of the mission and placed him in charge of the racial exploration of the Caucasian tribe 74. Schaefer had spent most of the war at Himmler's beck and call. Apart from a brief and nearly fatal stint as a soldier on the Finnish front in 1941, he had spent the war in offices and hotel rooms advising the SS leader on the design of winter uniforms for German troops serving in Poland, testing new varieties of grain for the eastern settlements, and lecturing in occupied Europe as a kind of official poster boy for science in the Third Reich. 75 he had felt trapped behind a desk, but in early 1942 he saw an opportunity to escape. 76 as the German army advanced toward the oil fields of Mako, he proposed leading a scientific survey to the Caucasus so that the region's natural resources could be suitably exploited after the war. In the late summer of 1942, Himmler ordered him to organize a military and scientific mission to the area. Schaefer grandly sketched out his requirements. He wanted a team consisting of dozens of scientists from geophysicists, geologists, geographers, and paleontologists to plant geneticists, livestock experts, zoologists, entomologists, parasitologists, and herpetologists. He also requested page after page of equipment tropical uniforms, mountain troops uniforms, leather jackets, lederhosen, klepper jackets, fur vests, pullovers, bathing suits, hiking shoes, Africa boots, helmets, 72-man tents, 250-man tents, skis, Hindenburg lamps, snow glasses, sunglasses, ice axes, five gramophones with records, ten travel typewriters, and mosquito nets. Point seventy-seven on and on it went. He had, it seems, quite forgotten there was a war going on and that the German military was stretched to the limit, battling Stalin's massive forces in the Soviet Union, occupying much of Europe and a vast swath of the Soviet republics, defending Europe from an Allied invasion, combating local partisans and resistance groups, waging war against British forces in North Africa, and searching out and destroying enemy ships in the Atlantic and in European waters. Himmler's personal administrative officer, Rudolf Brandt, soon brought Schaefer crashing back down to earth. I have already let him know, through SS Obersturmführer Mean, explained Brandt in a letter to Sievers, that at the moment his plan for an expedition in the Caucasus area, as he imagines it, is out of the question. Dr. Schaefer is to be ready only for a military assignment in the realm of this current operation. Here and there he will surely be able to conduct some scientific work in his area of interest while completing the assignment, but in no case is this his main goal. 78 In aid of this plan, the SS leadership agreed to supply Schaefer with a small group of researchers and 97 SS men armed with pistols, machine guns, and grenades. 79. Schaefer told American interrogators in 1946 that the purpose of this special command was to win over to the German cause the tribes in the Caucasus Mountains 80 but little evidence of such an assignment exists in the surviving documents. What can be said without a doubt, however, is that racial research lay close to the heart of the Operation. 81 Beggar and a hand-picked team of Rasenkunda experts planned to conduct extensive studies of the native tribes of the Caucasus in order to facilitate a racial diagnosis of the population. 82 They seemed particularly anxious to diagnose the Mountain Jews, one of the tribal groups likely to confuse SS killing squads. 83 During questioning in 1970, Schaefer suggested that the fate of this group their liquidation or survival would depend on Beggar's team and on their conclusions. At the time, Schaefer confessed, it was known that the Jewish people were to be annihilated. 84. The Mountain Jews, or Dag Shufut, lived mainly in the northern and eastern Caucasus. They had by all accounts resided in the rugged region for 2,500 years and were descendants of several waves of Jewish immigrants including captives whom Nebuchadrezzar bestowed upon the tribal leaders of the Caucasus, and refugees who fled from the destruction of the first and second temples in Jerusalem. 85 They spoke a Persian dialect, 
which they had once written in Hebrew characters, and they kept their ancient Judaic beliefs alive. While the rulers of many other lands forbade Jews from owning land, the potentates of the Caucasus were more tolerant. They permitted the mountain Jews to farm. In the 19th century, before Soviet collectivization, these Jewish families reaped wheat, corn, and rice crops from mountain fields others thought honorable, and tended vineyards that were famous. They observed nature closely, rode well, and cared for their guns lovingly. By 1942, they numbered about 30,000 people. 86. But the lines between the mountain Jews and many of their neighbors were very fuzzy. The young men often purchased wives in marriage from surrounding Muslim families and insisted that their new spouses dress in modest Islamic fashion. Young and old wore talismans and amulets, believed in demons and black magic, and celebrated agricultural festivals all customs borrowed from others. The local Muslims returned the favor. Neighboring tribes proudly boasted of Jewish ancestors and took pains to preserve ancient Hebrew Bibles in their families. Several tribes in the region the Tats, Kumiks, Avars, and Tabasarans, to name a few clearly descended from mixed Jewish and Muslim ancestry. 87. Bijer's assignment was to neatly pigeonhole all these tribes in a way the SS leadership could understand. 88. To do this, he began assembling a team of racial specialists. 89. He immediately chose two veteran colleagues from RUSHA Dr. Hans Fleischhacker and Dr. Heinrich Rubel. Fleischhacker had taken a keen interest in Jewish peoples, and was writing a thesis on Jewish skin color. 90 His comrade, Rubel, had studied Rasenkunda at the University of Cologne. 91 After the invasion of Poland, the SS sent both men to Litzmannstadt. 92 As Einungsprüfer, or aptitude testers, there, they performed racial measurements on ethnic German residents assessing whether they were racially valuable and therefore worthy to be sent as colonists to the German territories in the East. Or whether they should be relegated to starvation, slavery, and extermination. 93 So adept did both men prove at this work that their superiors recruited them to train and develop educational programs for other aptitude testers. 94 In addition to the RUSHA specialists, Beggar managed to obtain two other qualified scientists for his team. Dr. Rudolf Trojan had studied under the prominent German anthropologist Dr. Theodor Mollison, whose most famous pupil was Dr. Joseph Manchel, the physician who conducted the infamous twins research at Auschwitz and who came to be known as the Angel of Death 95 under Mollison's guidance, Trojan had taken up racial blood studies and conducted racial research on ancient skeletons. Rounding out Beggar's core team was Dr. Hans Endres.96 a scholar with many interests, Andres had studied philosophy, psychology, education, and psychiatry in addition to anthropology. Beggar had recruited him to study the racial psychology of the Caucasus tribes. 97. Throughout the fall of 1942, as the team waited for its orders to depart, Beggar drew up a detailed research plan. He proposed taking the team on an inspection trip through the Caucasus soon after their arrival. As they journeyed from one village to the next, the racial specialists could take the lay of the land and calculate the minimum number of men and women they would need to measure in each ethnic group. 98 Then the team would get down to work in a mobile examination facility a large field tent that could be divided into four separate sections, including a room for disrobing. 99 Almost certainly, the team planned on using trickery and deception to obtain the cooperation of their subjects. RUSHA racial examiners were accustomed to donning white laboratory coats and masquerading as physicians conducting medical examinations. 100 They had discovered over the years that subjects were far more willing to undress and less inclined to make a scene when they thought they were receiving medical attention. Moreover, Beggar had already practiced a similar form of duplicity in Tibet. 101 Beggar's racial specialists proposed conducting a wide battery of tests and measurements. As a matter of form, they intended on describing the exact hue of their subjects' hair, skin, and eyes, performing an assortment of racial measurements, and snipping hair samples for later study. They also planned to photograph and film particularly interesting individuals, for German racial experts claimed that Jews moved differently from others, 
dragging their feet along the ground. Point 102 The team sculptor would produce casts of the head or the whole body of representative types or entire families of each ethnic group and each race. 103 In addition, Andres would conduct a series of racial intelligence examinations, employing games, colored glass beads, crayons, watercolors, and a variety of testing machines. Point 104 Beggar also planned to put the special command K doctor to work, conducting studies on racial anatomy, racial physiology, and racial hygiene. Point 105 To carry out his duties, the physician requested three tattooing needles on his equipment list. Point 106 His reason for this request is unclear, but shortly after the invasion of the Soviet Union, one RUSHA scientist, SS Obersturm Banfuhrer Walter Schultz, proposed sending racial examiners into Russian prisoner of war camps in order to test the inmates. Divide them into racial categories, and tattoo each prisoner's ear with a letter rather as ranchers do with cattle as a permanent visible record of the classification. Point 107 and E, for example, would indicate a prisoner who was supposedly of Nordic blood and who would be sent to one of the new German colonies. An R would mark someone who purportedly exhibited a balanced mixture of European races and who was therefore suitable to join the workforce in European Russia. An A would identify a prisoner who was Asian or a mixture of Asian and Middle Eastern ancestry. Schultz proposed that these individuals be extinguished 108. Beggar labored over Special Command K for months in Munich, consulting with his fellow racial specialists and preparing as best he could for all the unknowns that the Caucasus would present. But the order to depart did not arrive. Indeed, Oktoberfest came and went and the great chestnut trees in the Munich streets lost their leaves. Families opened their advent calendars and lit candles on their Christmas trees, but Beggar and Schaefer and their teams were still waiting. The order from Himmler that they were all expecting, indeed anxiously anticipating, did not arrive. Nor did it appear as the new year approached, 1943. The reasons were becoming increasingly obvious. Something had gone badly wrong on the Eastern Front. Hitler's plan to drive south and east through the Caucasus to capture the rich oil fields of Baku and safeguard the pipeline to Batumi had stalled, due to a stunning military catastrophe at Stalingrad. Hitler had vowed to destroy the city, ordering his troops to slaughter every male resident and deport every female. 109 But his staggering indecisiveness and his refusal to recognize the realities of the campaign had left some 200,000 German troops badly undersupplied. On November 22, 1942, Soviet forces had completely surrounded Germany's 6th Army, cutting off its remaining supply lines. In the dreaded cold of the Russian winter, German soldiers starved and perished in great numbers. We're completely alone, wrote one of the desperate troops, without help from the outside. Hitler has left us in the lurch. 110 As the temperatures plunged lower and lower and the winds howled ever louder, Hitler sat grim-faced over the dinner table at Wolfskans. The little man who once sat discreetly in the corner, jotting notes, had vanished. Hitler wanted no record preserved of the gloom settling over many of his military guests. On February 2, 1943, Germany's Sixth Army surrendered. Nearly 100,000 German and Romanian soldiers lay dead in the grey streets of Stalingrad and the white fields of the countryside. 111 Another 113,000 were captured by the Soviets. Three days later, Himmler wrote to Schaefer, postponing Special Command K. It would be totally impossible, he explained, to start the mission within the next few months due to the military situation. 112. 19 The Skeleton Collection on a bright June day in 1943, Sophie Boroschek stood in front of an Auschwitz barrack, waiting for someone important to appear. Like the other prisoners assembled there, she did not know who the person was or why he was important. Boroschek was 33 years old. Point one in a previous life, she had lived in the villa of a prominent cigarette manufacturer and worked as a nurse in the hospital of the Jewish community in Berlin a little-known haven for Jews. Point two, but in mid-May 1943, the authorities had forced her parents, Abraham and Lies Chen, onto a transport bound for Auschwitz. Five days later, Boros Czech boarded a freight car headed for the infamous camp. On her arrival at Auschwitz, 
a doctor had looked her up and down with a bored glance, then selected her for work in the camp. Since then, Boroschek had learned a great deal about survival. That morning, she and some 150 other prisoners had been excused from their work details and daily routines and dispatched to an area outside Block 28, a red brick barrack officially described as an infirmary 3 it was an ominous corner of the camp. As many of the prisoners were well aware, Block 28 was an infirmary in name only. Far from caring for the seriously ill, its staff specialized in conducting gruesome medical experiments on the healthy point 4. Boroschek and her fellow prisoners waited uneasily. Finally, a tall, blonde, athletic-looking SS Hauptsturmführer arrived and instructed the prisoners to undress. Point five. The officer was Bruno Becker. He unpacked several shiny steel instruments, various kinds of calipers and compasses. Point six. Some of those standing beside Boroschek blanched at the sight of the metal instruments. Point seven. They did not know what would happen next. Becker beckoned first one prisoner then another, forward. He stared at them intently for a minute or two, studying their faces, and ran his eyes down the length of their bodies. Silently, he arrived at some decision. Some of the prisoners he immediately dismissed, as if to say they were not worthy of his attention. Others, however, he began to measure, sliding his calipers across their heads. Then he called out the numbers tattooed upon their arms to a prisoner assistant, who carefully recorded them in pencil on a form.8 Those prisoners whose survival instincts had been stropped to razor sharpness by long months of imprisonment at Auschwitz suspected no good could come of it. Finally, Boroschek heard her own name called. She walked over to the blonde-haired man and stood in front of him. Beggar stared hard at her, sizing her up. Then he reached for his calipers. Satisfied, he called out Boroschek's number. Bidger had arrived in the town of Oswisim on the morning of June 7.9. His civilian assistant, Wilhelm Gable, had already spent a night there. Point 10 sturdily built at 39, Gable worked for the Ananurb as a sculptor, creating museum dioramas from the casts Beggar had taken of Tibetans. He had agreed to assist Beggar making casts of the Jewish prisoners at Auschwitz. Beggar was also expecting another colleague a hard-looking man of 30 with a long face, metal-rimmed spectacles, and a pair of heavy eyebrows that merged over the bridge of his nose. Point 11 Dr. Hans Fleischhacker, an SS Obersturmführer, was one of the officers Beggar had chosen for the Caucasus research. His research specialty was Jewish skin color. Before heading off to the camp, Beggar looked for a hotel room in Oswe Sim. SS officers of the day were particularly fond of the Hauster Waffen SS, Located near the railway station. Point 12 The facility had a lovely garden for sunbathing, and its comfortable restaurant served excellent dinners of roast pork and chicken, fresh vegetables, and, according to one SS officer, a magnificent vanilla ice cream luxuries unheard of in most other parts of the Reich. Point 13 Beggar checked in there. Point 14 After stowing his bag, he set off to the camp to introduce himself to the commandant and his staff. Point 15 SS officers generally regarded Auschwitz as a choice tour of duty. The camp was a good deal safer than a posting to the Eastern Front, which many saw as a death sentence, and Auschwitz offered daily opportunities to steal jewelry, watches, and other treasures from the condemned. Moreover, the rank and file guards shared the sense of enthusiasm for the posting. Indeed, they often competed to take part in the actions, the mass murders that featured so prominently in Auschwitz life. Point 16 For this, they received a bonus one-fifth of a liter of vodka, five cigarettes, and 100 grams of sausage and bread. Point 17 Beggar presented his orders, and soon after, camp officials sent him off to get a vaccination against typhus, for the threat of epidemic was still present at Auschwitz. Point 18 Then they escorted him inside the electrical fences to the men's camp. Some of the buildings standing there were part of an old factory formerly owned by the Polish tobacco monopoly, while others had once served as barracks for the Polish army. Point 19 And even in the summer of 1943, Auschwitz retained a few ironic vestiges of a happier past. Along the grounds, tidy red brick barracks stood neatly in long rows intersected by paved streets that went nowhere, each with a pleasant-sounding name, 
such as Cherry Street.20 but its bland appearance was an illusion. Each morning, prisoners were rousted from their beds at 4.30 and forced to don uniforms caked with dirt and sweat.21 they were ordered to stand for hours outdoors in meaningless roll calls, no matter what the weather, and then put to work for 12 hours each day. Everywhere they went, they carried a red bowl and tin spoon in the vain hope that they would receive something more substantial than the thin, watery soup dispensed from the camp kitchen. They lived in a state of constant fear. At any moment, an SS guard could haul them from a line and beat them brutally or drag them off to the gas chambers, the gallows, or one of the camp's other execution grounds. Throughout the summer of 1943, flames literally leapt from the tall chimneys of Auschwitz's crematoria. The stench of burning hair and scorched human flesh hung over the camp. Point 22. Amid all this horror, Beggar quickly settled down to work, selecting prisoners for the skeleton collection from among those assembled in front of Block 28. He looked for relatively healthy, robust young people who had not yet lost too much soft tissue from starvation. Point 23. This meant selecting people in the prime of life who had arrived at Auschwitz within the last few months. He also wanted to find as many varieties of Jewishness as possible 24 so he chose Jewish prisoners men, women, and children alike from across Europe, Greece, Germany, Poland, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and Norway. The majority came from the northern Greek city of Salonika, where the SS had only begun deporting Jews on March 15, 1943. In addition to these prisoners, Beggar also selected two Polish Christians and four Asians two Uzbeks, one person of mixed Uzbek Tadzik ancestry, and one Chavash. The Asians, he observed later in a letter to Schaefer, were selected just on the side, for the benefit of the Ananerbs new Department of Inner Asian Research and Expeditions, headed by Schaefer. 25 Beggar was particularly pleased to have found them at Auschwitz. One Uzbek, a big healthy guy, could have been Tibetan, he exclaimed in a letter to Schaefer. His way of speaking, his movements, and his manner were simply delightful, inner Asian 26 in all, Beggar picked 115 individuals from the prisoners assembled in front of Block 28. At least five of them were teenagers. Point 27 The selection took just three quarters of an hour. Point 28. According to witnesses, camp authorities housed the selected women in Block 10, a two-story barrack whose windows were kept permanently shuttered or boarded to ensure that no one could see inside. Point 29 The building hid laboratories, X-ray facilities, and rows of crowded wooden bunks for the subjects of Auschwitz's grisly medical experiments. It also provided bunks for the female prisoners forced to work in a camp brothel. As one prisoner who spent a year working in Block 10 recalled later, it was a horror place that rivaled Dante's Inferno. Point 30 Many of the selected male prisoners were similarly housed. They were sent to Block 21 and Block 28.31 both served as camp infirmaries, and the latter confined men forced to participate in experiments that damaged their livers or in tests of toxic chemicals that provided data on possible techniques mailing earths might use to elude military service. 32. Over the next few days, Beggar proceeded with his studies performing detailed racial measurements in a small room in one of these blocks. 33 As the prisoners filed in, the sculptor Gable stared at their faces. When I found a Jew who was especially interesting or remarkable, he later recalled, Dr. Beggar agreed that I should also make a cast of them. 34 In all likelihood, Gable chose individuals who possessed one of the supposed Jewish traits short head, fleshy lips, large ears. 35 As Gable and Beggar must have realized, Plaster likenesses of these individuals would be highly marketable as teaching aids in Nazi universities and as exhibits on Rassenkunde.36 Gable took 20 casts at Auschwitz.37. Focused as Beggar was on completing his work, he could not help but notice the cruel, inhuman conditions in the camp and the terrible toll they were taking on the prisoners. At one point during his stay, he happened upon SS guards dragging out a large pile of corpses from a barracks. 38 The scene disturbed Beggar not, it seems, because so many Jews were dying daily at Auschwitz, but because the SS officers in the camp, the future lords of Europe, were dirtying their hands with this foul business. I spoke with the adjutant about this, Beggar observed in a later court statement, 
and mentioned I was concerned that it was specifically the SS who were involved with this. He told me that they would have had so many prisoner transports that they would not have been able to cope with them all. 39. After finishing with each of his subjects, Beggar passed the individual on to Fleischhacker, who had finally arrived in Auschwitz and who performed the measurements again to ensure their accuracy. Beggar wanted no errors. The two men seemed to have worked together amicably, but on June 15, Beggar departed abruptly, placing the remaining subjects in Fleischhacker's care and returning to Munich. Point 40 he explained after the war that he was horrified by the barbaric conditions at Auschwitz and had left in disgust at the earliest opportunity. But correspondence from the time paints a different picture of his motives. Shortly after his hasty departure, Beggar informed Sievers that he had finished up early because of the existing risk of an epidemic 41 moreover, his subsequent correspondence shows little trace of compassion for Auschwitz's inmates. Indeed, when he received news a few weeks later about the death of several of the selected prisoners, he offered no comment about their plight. Herr Gable, he wrote to Sievers, is once again in Munich almost 14 days after the examinations in Auschwitz. He cast the heads of 20 prisoners I had chosen and examined. He told me that the number of examined people has once again declined because of deaths. The head casts that he completed turned out excellently. 42. Beggar's worries about a possible epidemic at Auschwitz were well founded. By early July, typhus was spreading rapidly through the camp, greatly worrying authorities. To combat the outbreak, SS physicians began killing prisoners who turned up in the infirmary admissions area with symptoms. They injected phenol, a common disinfectant also known as carbolic acid, directly into the hearts of the ailing inmates. 43 to ensure that the prisoners Beggar had selected would pose no threat to the outside world when they were shipped to Nat Seiler, camp authorities placed them in quarantine for two to three weeks and ordered blood tests to determine whether any were infected. 44 in addition, Sievers wrote to request that the individuals be issued clean prisoner clothing. 45. Only when the quarantine had ended in late July did guards at Auschwitz begin loading beggar subjects onto a train heading west toward Nat Seiler. 46 in Berlin, Sievers' assistant dispatched a deliberately cryptic telegram to Beggar, notifying him that the wheels were once again in motion. Transport from Auschwitz 30.7 Get into contact with Hurt concerning the beginning of the work. Arrival of transport Nat Seiler presumably 2.8 47. Nat Seiler concentration camp was a place of dark, ominous reputation. It sat on a high, forested slope of the Vosges Mountains, 31 miles southwest of Strasbourg, the capital of Alsace. 48 before the war, skiers and hikers had flocked to the region, reveling in its solitude and pristine beauty. But in 1940, after France capitulated and Germany annexed the old border province of Alsace, the SS had arrived in the Vosges Mountains on a very different mission, to make money. 49 The local cliffs gleamed with a rare red granite that greatly appealed to Nazi architects. Himmler immediately recognized the potential of the stone. He had founded an SS enterprise, the German Earth and Stone Works Limited, which used slave laborers from concentration camps to perform the backbreaking work of quarrying rock. So Himmler ordered the construction of a concentration camp in the Vosges Mountains to house the slave laborers needed to mine the rock. Nat Seiler soon became a grim hell for prisoners. Many were forced to haul large slabs of granite up the slopes until they died from exhaustion and starvation. Others were subjected to harrowing and often lethal medical experiments. Himmler had constructed and outfitted a special laboratory at Nat Seiler for August Hurt, and the anatomist had begun his monstrous mustard gas experiments. Point 50 He and his assistants administered drops of a liquid form of mustard gas to the arms of prisoners, or forced his victims to inhale or gulp down a venomous brew. Fifty men one of every three subjects in his experiments perished in agony, suffering severe burns on their skin or fatal internal injuries. Those who survived often went blind or suffered other debilitating conditions, and in the days before Nat Seiler acquired its own gas chamber, officials disposed of them by shipping them to other camps, earmarked for death. It was an appalling situation. 
but Himmler and Sievers greatly admired the doctor responsible for all this human suffering. Indeed, they came to see Hurt as a martyr for science, placing his own health in peril for sake of the dangerous experiments, and in the spring of 1943, when the anatomist developed intestinal problems, they arranged for him to holiday at a luxury resort at St. Lambrecht in the Austrian Alps. 51 Hurt, observed Sievers in a letter to Himmler's personal administrative officer, has not spared his own health and can even be considered a victim of his own science because his research work is in such a new field that dangerous risks cannot be avoided. 52. By the beginning of August 1943, however, Hurt was sufficiently recovered to carry out the orders for the Jewish skeleton collection. Nearly everything was ready. The forced laborers at Nat Seiler had completed construction of the gas chamber. Sievers's assistant, Wolf Dietrich Wolf, had obtained a bottle of a hydrogen cyanide salts for use in murdering the selected Jewish prisoners in the chamber. This he had passed on to Herd. 53 Wolf also provided the physician with vouchers for 50 liters of gasoline so that the camp could deliver the corpses to Strasbourg. All that was lacking, it seemed, was the maceration machine. Through much dexterous paper shuffling, Wolf had obtained 15 kilograms of steel an immensely precious commodity at the height of the war for the manufacture of the machine. He also managed to register the equipment as an urgent army commission 54 the machine was now months overdue, but Hurt was hopeful that it would soon arrive. 55. On Monday August 2, a train carrying the prisoners from Auschwitz rolled into Nat Seiler. A guard unlocked the door to a freight car, and the passengers climbed down stiff-legged and cramped from four days of travel. Hurt was anxious to get down to work. The original plan had called for Fleischhacker and a second Caucasus team member, Dr. Heinrich Rubel, to travel to the camp to take blood samples as well as skull X-rays for additional osteological measurements. 56 But neither man could obtain a release from his other duties. So Beggar, who was visiting his wife and children in a hunting lodge in Ruthnik in northeastern Germany, was forced to take their place. He departed for Strasbourg on the morning of Saturday, August 7 and presented himself at the camp a day or two later. 57. In a rough wooden barrack, Beggar proceeded with his final studies, taking two X-rays of each of the prisoners' skulls. 58. By then, Hurt had decided to extract additional medical data from the group. As a senior SS physician, he had learned of Himmler's keen interest in finding cheap new techniques of human sterilization that could be applied in future to many Germans of Jewish mixed blood as well as to the large numbers of Jewish, Russian, and Polish forced laborers in the East. 59 So medical researchers at Auschwitz and other concentration camps had already begun testing a wide range of potential sterilization procedures on human subjects, from injecting caustic substances into women's cervixes to exposing men's penises and scrota to dangerous levels of X-rays. 60 These tests inflicted immense human suffering. So intense was the radiation, for example, that many of the victims developed severe burns along the groin and buttocks, and some died soon after. Moreover, the researchers made little effort to spare their subjects additional humiliation. To test the effectiveness of the technique, assistants collected sperm from the irradiated men by rubbing their prostate glands with pieces of wood inserted rectally. Later the men were subjected to orchiectomies, in which the researchers removed one or both testes. Hurt had devised a new variation on this theme. He wanted to inject a foreign chemical quite possibly the toxic ditropoflavine into the men's testicles in hopes that this would lead to infertility. 61 So he had male prisoners brought to him, one by one, and proceeded to give them the injection. 62 His own ghoulish appearance added to the horror of the experiment, and the result was both humiliating and debilitating. As two French pathologists testified after the war, assuming the most favorable hypothesis, that is to say that the injections were given under anesthesia, the secondary reaction of congestion and edema must have been very painful 63. After administering the injections, Hurt wanted to wait at least eight days before testing the effect of the chemical on the men's ability to produce sperm. 64 so he permitted the male prisoners to live a while longer. 
but neither he nor Beggar seems to have had any further reason to keep the women alive after the racial measurements were completed. So on August 11, the killing began. Point 65. The commandant of the Nat Seiler camp, Joseph Kramer, took personal charge of the slaughter. He was a notoriously brutal man, whom newspaper reporters later dubbed the Beast of Belsen after his barbarous behavior at the Bergen-Belsen camp. The son of an accountant, Kramer had joined the Nazi party in 1931 and had spent nine years working his way up through the concentration camp system, learning to inflict misery on old Jewish men and split the skulls of Jewish women with one expert blow from his truncheon. Point 66 At the age of 36, he was a hardened killer. His deep-set eyes glowered from a stern face shaded by a heavy five o'clock shadow, his mouth pressed into a tight, hard line of determination. Kramer waited until around nine in the evening on August 11 to begin carrying out his orders to kill the female prisoners. He and a few of his SS men gathered together some 15 of the women beggar had selected and forced them into a small van. Point 67 I told these women that they had to go to the disinfection chamber and I did not tell them they were going to be asphyxiated, Kramer recalled after his capture at the end of the war. Point 68 They drove a short distance outside the camp fences and pulled up by the new gas chamber. The SS officers pushed the women roughly inside and ordered them to take off their clothes. By then, at least some of the women knew what was coming next, but Kramer and his men showed no pity. Helped by a few SS, he later remembered, I undressed them completely and I pushed them in the gas chamber when they were completely naked. 69 Then he closed and locked the gas chamber door. The women, he noted, started to howl. 70. He retrieved the bottle of hydrogen cyanide salts that Hurt had given him. He opened it up and poured its contents into a funnel located above and to the right of the chamber's observation window, then closed the funnel. This sent the salts and a supply of water flowing down toward an opening in the chamber. As the salts mixed with the water, they formed a deadly gas that began to seep into the chamber below. The women inside pounded the door frantically, screaming and pleading to be let out. Kramer watched through the glass, taking it all in. I lit the inside of the chamber with a switch plate near the funnel and I observed through the observation window what was going on inside of the chamber. I have seen that these women continued to breathe about half a minute and then they fell on the floor. 71. Two days later, Kramer executed the remainder of the women by the same method. He then ordered the bodies from both executions to be loaded into a small van and driven to the Anatomical Institute in Strasbourg. Two years later, he recalled for investigators his own personal reaction to these mass murders. I have not felt any emotion in doing these acts because I had received the order to execute these 80 inmates, sick, according to the way I have spoken to you 72. The van carrying the women's bodies arrived at the Anatomical Institute in Strasbourg at 7 the next morning. Located near the old southern wall of the city, the institute was dark and quiet. Hurd had already instructed his staff to clean out the laboratory tanks they regularly used for preserving cadavers and to fill them with a solution of 50% alcohol. He informed them erroneously as it turned out that they would be receiving 120 cadavers. 73 The laboratory assistant, Henry Henry Pierre, a forced laborer, did not think there was anything particularly odd about this order. Strasbourg's Anatomy Institute regularly received shipments of dead bodies. Anatomists were in the habit of dissecting cadavers for medical research, preserving diseased or deformed human organs for teaching specimens. And students at the institute regularly dissected the dead as part of their medical training. For these purposes, Hurd had previously purchased through his SS connections the emaciated cadavers of Russian prisoners of war, who had perished of starvation and natural causes. The cost was 10 Reichsmarks per cadaver. 74. The new shipment from Nat Seiler was not like the others, however. It consisted entirely of women, one of whom still modestly wore a brassiere. 75 Henry Pierre was shocked to see the condition of the women, most were young, healthy individuals under the age of 32, all of a commanding appearance, as he told investigators after the war. 76 Moreover, some of the bodies were still warm to the touch and their eyes shiny. 
Henry Pierre guessed that they had perished no more than three hours earlier and he was certain they had not met a natural end. Some had clearly been beaten and abused. All had bled from the mouth and nose, which made Henry Pierre think that they had been gassed or poisoned. When he tried to discuss the matter with Hurd, the gaunt anatomist fixed him with a chilling look and warned that if he did not keep his mouth shut he would end up just like the women in the containers. Henry Pierre was stunned. I knew then that these people were killed for that purpose 77 but the fact that Hurt had arranged the murder of 29 females for the purposes of research did not disturb Hurt's other assistant, Otto Bong, a German preparator that the anatomist had brought from Frankfurt. As the two men cleaned and prepared the women's bodies, Bong told Henry Pierre not to fret, the women were, he said, only Jew 78 Henry Pierre could not stop thinking about their criminal deaths, however. He noticed that each woman had a long number tattooed on her left arm. When no one was watching, he wrote down a list of the tattooed numbers.79. Four days later, the driver from Nat Seiler appeared again at the institute, bringing the corpses of a large group of men. Soon, the driver returned with the third and last shipment. Henry Pierre examined the men's bodies, once again secretly jotting down their tattooed numbers. Like the women, they were generally young and healthy, and they had been murdered in the same manner. But there was one important difference. Before the French preparator was allowed to immerse the bodies in alcohol, Bong insisted on taking tissue samples. With a scalpel in hand, he severed a testicle from each of the male cadavers.80. He placed the organs in a container and sent them on directly to Hertz personal laboratory. 20 Refuge there was no mistaking the tense atmosphere in Himmler's field headquarters in the late summer of 1943. A string of recent military and political disasters had sent the German high command reeling, and it was impossible to keep all the bad news from the German public. Allied troops had crushed the Wehrmacht in North Africa in May and then promptly turned their attention to Italy. Under the cloak of foul weather, the British Army had landed tanks and heavy artillery along the southeastern coast of Sicily on July 10, while American forces had succeeded, against stiff resistance, fighting their way onto the island's southwestern beaches. Less than two weeks later, the Allies had captured the Sicilian capital and were plotting their route west and north. The news had badly rattled the confidence of the Italians and precipitated a coup d'etat in Rome. The Italian king had ordered Benito Mussolini to step down as prime minister on July 25, curtly informing him that one of his most prominent critics, Marshal Pietro Bataglio, would be replacing him. Then the king arranged for Mussolini to be put under house arrest on the Mediterranean island of Ponza. The abrupt shift in leadership had sown much uncertainty in Germany on the eve of the Allied invasion of Italy. Moreover, the crisis had raised serious doubts in the minds of ordinary Germans about the stability of the Nazi regime. As one secret security service report noted, the idea that a similar coup d'etat could take place in Germany can be heard constantly one. All this was cause enough for concern to Himmler, but a further disaster had followed. In late July, the British Bomber Command had launched a major offensive on Hamburg. Dubbed Operation Gamara, the attack was intended to lay waste to Hamburg, residential districts, and all, crushing the German will to resist. The British had discovered a technique for confusing German radar releasing strips of aluminum from their planes that acted as decoys and their bombers had begun slipping more easily past German defences. So over a period of seven days beginning July 24, 1943, British planes brought a terrible apocalypse to Hamburg, unlike anything German civilians had previously seen. On July 28, for example, British high explosive and incendiary bombs ignited a mammoth firestorm in the city. The flames towered more than a mile in the air and spread across eight square miles, whipping up hurricane force winds that dismantled roofs, uprooted trees, and flung human beings through the air. Operation Gamara killed an estimated 30,000 people. It left another one million homeless, fleeing in horror into the German countryside. Point two. A day after the Hamburg firestorm, on July 29, 1943, Himmler ordered the immediate evacuation of the Annenerb with its extensive library, archives, 
museum casts, and trove of documents from Berlin. Point three Sievers had already picked out a modest refuge in the German countryside for the staff, for it was a small group, for many researchers had been called up to military service, while others had opted to go their own way. The Institute for Inner Asian Studies and Expeditions, headed by Ernst Schaefer, for example, had already begun moving from Munich to a castle in the Austrian countryside. Point five and Walter Wust, the head of the Annenerb, intended to stay in Munich, he had been appointed rector of the university there. This had left Sievers with just 30 or so people to worry about. After careful deliberation, he dispatched the Annenerb's prized library to safekeeping in a castle in Ulm. Then he moved the Annenerb's much depleted staff and documents into a derelict 17th century building known as the Steinhaus or Stone House, in the tiny village of Weiskenfeld.6 and it was there in the quiet German countryside that he secretly signed the papers for and orchestrated some of the Annenerb's most terrible war crimes. Weiskenfeld is situated in the northern Bavarian countryside, just a short drive away from the city of Bayreuth, home of the famous Wagner Festival. But in the summer of 1943, the village was a remote backwater that lacked both a rail connection and good roads to the outside world. 7. It possessed few cultural amenities no theaters, libraries, symphony orchestras, museums, and little in the way of cafes or newsstands, and as such it came as something of a shock to the Annenerb staff. Their sense of isolation was further compounded, moreover, by the wary attitude of Weiskenfeld 700 residents who had little use for the SS. During the mid-1930s, SS men stationed in the Steinhaus had bullied the villagers, attacked the local Catholic church, and beaten one local man so badly in a street fight that he later died of his injuries. After that, relations between Weiskenfeld's inhabitants and the SS were strained. In their first few weeks in Weiskenfeld, Sievers and his staff worked to convert the dusty Steinhaus into a functioning government office. The cramped, primitive conditions were a far cry from the luxurious villa in Delem, but Sievers managed to obtain approval to construct a barracks to house staff members. To pass the long evenings, some of the staff formed a choir and staged occasional evening entertainments of music and dance. But many of Sievers's colleagues had trouble settling in. The Steinhaus, they complained, was cold and drafty. It was infested with mice. It lacked dependable telephone connections and was plagued with electrical problems. As Sievers's own personal assistant confided in one letter to a friend, it is not so easy to one, bring everything together under one umbrella and two, to up and move overnight to the country and entity that is accustomed to the city. Even the lack of a barber in town is a big stumbling block, to say nothing of the lack of functioning, running water, a decent oven, etc. 8. It was becoming painfully obvious that few Annenerb employees were really cut out for the country life that Himmler fondly envisioned for the SS. Sievers, however, seemed to welcome the isolation. He moved his wife and children into rooms in the Steinhaus, and continued to proudly wear his SS uniform about the streets of Weiskenfeld. He took pains to keep the villagers in the dark about the nature of the Annenerb's work. He refused to allow local people to enter the kitchen of the Steinhaus to deliver groceries, the food had to be left inside the guard room. He also forbade his children to bring their friends from the village home after school. There was a reason for this mania for privacy, however. With most of the Annenerb senior research staff serving in the thick of battle, Sievers had begun devoting more and more of his time in the small bucolic village to arranging and overseeing the Annenerb's top-secret medical experiments. With Sievers's gift for administration and with Wust's support behind the scenes, the Annenerb had greatly expanded its medical research program at Dachau and Natzeiler, inflicting terrible human suffering. At Dachau, Dr. Sigmund Rascher had completed his high-altitude tests and had moved on to a new round of experiments. In search of data on how long German aviators could survive in the North Sea after parachuting from a downed aircraft, he inserted electrodes into the rectums of prisoners and then immersed them for as much as three hours in a tank filled with ice and water. As the men shuddered uncontrollably, lost consciousness, and succumbed to hypothermia, he looked on with clinical indifference, charting their rectal temperatures and failing pulses. 9. 
Rasher then attempted to rewarm his subjects by a variety of methods with mixed success. Several of his subjects died. In some cases, he placed the frozen men in hot baths or heated sleeping bags, or tried wrapping them in covers, but it was often a case of too little, much too late. For others, however, he obtained four women prisoners from Ravensbrück, adding intense humiliation to the pain of freezing. Point ten. He brought a spacious bed into his laboratory, and laid the body of a frozen man in between two of the naked women, instructing them to nestle up as closely as possible and engage the man in sexual intercourse if they could. Point eleven. Rasher closely observed the behavior of the three, later calling these crimes of sadistic voyeurism experiments for revarming of intensely chilled human beings by animal warmth. 12. He then rounded out his data by placing naked prisoners outdoors in the dead of winter for up to 14 hours. Point 13. He paid no heed to their screams of pain. In all, as many as 108 of Rasher's 360 human subjects died in the various freezing experiments. Point 14. Sievers also obtained approval for Rasher to conduct experiments on a possible styptic for staunching the gunshot wounds of soldiers. The substance in question was called polygal. Made from beets and apple pectin, it was a gelatinous substance generally used in the manufacture of marmalade. 15 A prisoner at Dachau had proposed making polygal in tablet form, and Rasher was keen to see whether an oral dose would help coagulate the blood flowing from open wounds. To test this premise, he proposed shooting prisoners at close range. In one documented case, he asked an SS guard to climb atop a chair and shoot a Russian commissar standing directly below. Point 16 The bullet entered the unfortunate man's right shoulder and exited near his spleen. Over the next 20 minutes, the victim twitched convulsively, then slumped into a chair and died. Point 17 Rasher then had the body carried to his autopsy table, where he searched for evidence of any ruptured organs that might be tamponed by hard blood clots. 18. Rasher's experiments were monstrous, and he was by no means the only Ananerb physician meeting out great suffering. August Hurd, the physician who had helped plan the deaths of the Jewish prisoners for the skeleton collection, continued to expose camp inmates to poisonous mustard gas in order to test potential new treatments. And under Hurd's direction, two other German physicians had joined the Ananerb's medical program. Dr. Niels Eugen Hagen, one of Germany's leading experts on viral diseases, performed medical tests on a group of 100 healthy prisoners at Natseiler. 19 He inoculated these victims with an experimental typhus vaccine and tested its effectiveness by exposing them to the potentially lethal disease. Meanwhile, a second physician, Dr. Werner Bickenbach, ran tests with phosgene gas, a substance used in chemical warfare. He hoped to develop an antidote. 20. Bickenbach used the small gas chamber at Natseiler for the experiments, and one survivor later recalled how they worked. Point 21 Bickenbach, he said, injected some of the men with a mystery substance and gave others medicine to drink. He blithely assured them that no one would die and that all would receive first-rate medical treatment. Then he led them, four at a time, into the gas chamber. After instructing them where to stand, he walked toward the door, threw two small capsules onto the ground, and quickly exited. Before long, colorless phosgene gas filled the air and the men began coughing and choking. One man died immediately in the chamber. The other three were retrieved and sent to a barracks near the crematorium. Three days later, a second man from the group perished in agony. He coughed up pink-red blood, recalled a survivor, and the longer it took, the more bits of lung tissue came out of his mouth. He was aware of everything the whole time, until the end. We were not allowed to drink anything the water faucet was turned off. Xtine died in my arms. 22 in all Bickenbach subjected 150 people to these murderous experiments. An estimated 35 to 40 died. Point 23. Sievers made certain that the experiments ran smoothly and that researchers had everything they required. From time to time, he and Himmler paid visits to the laboratory at Dachau. These were more than formal inspections. Both men seemed to have relished watching the experiments. As the inhabitants of Weiskenfeld whispered about Sievers and his secretive work, 
people in the small Austrian town of Mittersil worried about another group of Annenerb officers lodged in the nearby castle. Point 24 The castle of Mittersil had once been a fashionable resort for Europe's titled and moneyed set. Point 25 Perched on a mountain slope overlooking the scenic Pinskaw Valley, some 70 kilometers from Salzburg, the 16th century castle commanded a stunning view of the Austrian countryside. It lay in some of the best hunting and fishing country in Europe and offered luxury accommodations. When Princess Juliana of the Netherlands married in 1937, she and her husband planned to spend ten days of their honeymoon at Mittersil, they ended up lingering for six weeks. But the Anschluss had cast a heavy shadow on Mittersil. The castle's owner had fled to America, and a mysterious fire had swept through the premises, leaving behind a good deal of smoking rubble. Nazi officials had stolen the fine furniture, rugs, and porcelain. Point 26 Still, parts of the castle were salvageable, and in the summer of 1943, as the tide of war began turning strongly against Germany, the Annenerb's largest research department obtained a lease for the palatial dwelling and moved in. Led by Ernst Schaefer, the department consisted of nearly a dozen scientists, and was known to outsiders by the name of the Sven Hedin Reich Institute for Inner Asian Studies, after the famous Swedish explorer and Nazi sympathizer. 27. Himmler had supplied the institute with everything it needed money, plenty of gasoline vouchers, vehicles, and a dozen or so workers' concentration camp prisoners and forced laborers from Russia. These were ethnic Germans who had been uprooted against their will and put to work in the Reich. 28 While this labor force cleaned and repaired the castle, the senior researchers set about furnishing the drafty rooms. Much to beggars' annoyance, they raided the Tibetan ethnographic collection, stirring trays of chemicals in the institute's darkroom with small arrows that Tibetans had used for warding off ghosts, and drying their feet on rare Tibetan carpets that doubled as bath mats. 29. In his office at Mittersill, Beggar toiled away on the Jewish skeleton project. The maceration machine for rendering the cadavers of the murdered Jews into tidy skeletons had failed to arrive in Strasbourg quite possibly because Allied bombers destroyed the factory where it was supposed to be manufactured. Point 30 But the setback did not stop Beggar. 31 He had managed to lay hands on some Jewish skulls, perhaps from a museum or a university department anxious to stow a precious collection in a safe place or possibly from the Strasbourg preparator Otto Bong, who may have begun defleshing a few of the murdered Jews by other maceration methods. 32 Either way, Beggar had obtained a collection of Jewish skulls, and he seems to have been working on them. His assistant Wilhelm Gabel was finishing off the head casts of the murdered prisoners. 33. And although little good news made its way from the Eastern Front, Beggar's mind still buzzed with racial research projects. He wanted to send one of his Mittersil colleagues, Rudolf Trojan, to measure and examine Russian prisoners of war. 34 He was also keen to examine the behavior of different races on the battlefield research he believed would prove of immense importance to the Wehrmacht. 35 He could not stop churning out these ideas, and day after day, he dreamed of new projects for parsing and classifying humanity. In the midspring of 1944, Himmler himself chose to pay a visit to Mittersil. He arrived quite suddenly on May 12, without giving any advance warning. 36 Ernst Schaefer's second wife, Ursula, was sitting in her family's private apartment, chatting with her mother, when the SS leader suddenly walked in through the door. She was shocked to see one of the most powerful men in the Reich cross the room. Attentive as he often was to social pleasantries, he kissed her mother's hand, but he offered no such gallantry to Ursula Schaefer. Himmler had already conducted his own silent racial test on her. He thought her too Slavic in appearance, with her high, broad cheekbones. 37. When Schaefer arrived to greet Himmler, the two men headed off on a tour of the castle. Himmler seemed pleased by what he saw, remarking with genuine interest on the Institute's racial work. 38. Later in the evening, Schaefer accompanied Himmler on a stroll along the castle walls at Mittersill. Himmler gazed down contentedly at the quiet Austrian town below. Although it was still early in the evening, most of the lights in the houses below were out a good sign, in Himmler's view, that the townspeople were busy conceiving more sons for the Reich. 39 Soon after this, Himmler left. 
Schaefer later told his wife that he thought the SS chief had paid them a visit in order to size up Mittersil as a possible hiding place for the end of the war. Tucked away in the Austrian Alps, the castle must have seemed an appealing lair. In the early morning of June 6, 1944, Allied troops slid into the cold waters off the Normandy coast, ducking heavy enemy fire. The German military had prepared for months for just such an invasion in Normandy, planting deadly underwater mines and an assortment of treacherous metal obstacles in the shallow waters. Along the shore, the Germans had installed a ribbon of pillboxes and machine gun nests, intent on annihilating Allied troops as they waded through the shallows. The Normandy beaches were terrible death traps, and some of the German infantry divisions stationed nearby knew exactly how to use them. But despite their heavy and very precise fire, American, British, and Canadian forces managed to clamber to shore, and by 11 in the morning, a few German defenders were spotted abandoning their posts and surrendering to American troops. 40 that evening, the heaviest fighting was over on the shores of Normandy, and the Allied armies had established their beachheads. Over the next three months, Allied troops liberated much of France, rapidly advancing toward the green valleys of Alsace. Unable to stop them, the SS evacuated the concentration camp at Natseiler, marching the feeble survivors eastward toward Dachau. In Strasbourg, August Heard paced anxiously across the floor of his office. He was a worried man. His assistant Otto Bong had yet to finish making casts of the prisoners killed for the Jewish skeleton collection. Worse still, he had failed to deflesh most of their corpses, and the Allied forces were now heading toward Strasbourg. For Heard, this posed a great dilemma. He was keen to complete his work on the skeleton collection. But he knew that if the Americans or the French found readily identifiable corpses, he risked arrest for war crimes. What was he to do? Unable to see his way clear, he took up the matter with Sievers, who referred the problem to Himmler's personal administrative officer on September 4, 1944. Should the collection be preserved? Or should Hurt render the bodies virtually unidentifiable by removing all the soft tissue? Or would Himmler prefer more drastic action the complete destruction of the bodies, 41 Himmler and his staff seem to have dithered over the problem, but in mid-October, a certain SS Hauptsturmführer Berg issued orders to destroy all the bodies if Strasbourg should be endangered because of the military situation. 42 To soften the blow, Sievers assured Hurt that it was only a temporary setback. He and his team would be able to repeat the study, Sievers promised, if they were permitted to work and research peacefully. 43. Thus mollified, Hurt instructed his assistants to dissect the remaining cadavers, place them in coffins, and consign them to the incinerator, just as the corpses used in anatomy lessons were. But before he released the bodies to his assistants, he committed a final indignity. He pried loose the mouths of the dead prisoners and pocketed their gold teeth. 44 Then he prepared to flee eastward to the German city of Tübingen, just across the Rhine. A few days later, on October 21, Sievers notified Himmler's staff that Hurt had complied with the orders, completely destroying the Jewish skeleton collection. 45. French troops liberated Strasbourg a month later, and it was not long after this that French authorities learned that a scientific institute at the Reich University of Strasbourg had been in constant contact with the Natseiler concentration camp. Investigators quickly descended upon Hurt's Anatomy Institute, combing the offices and laboratories for evidence of war crimes. In one of the labs, they discovered 16 cadavers of young and relatively healthy-looking men and women floating naked in containers filled with an alcohol solution. They also found remains from another 70 bodies, including 54 glass microscope slides containing human testicular tissue. 46. Suspecting the worst, the investigators fished the bodies from the tanks, one by one, examining them carefully for clues to their identities. Someone had cut off a patch of skin from the left arms of 15 of the bodies. But along the arm of one male, a tattooed concentration camp number could be clearly seen. In early January 1945, French and British journalists began filing the first newspaper stories on Hertz atrocities at Natseiler. Sievers was stunned to read their reports. 
For weeks, he had tried keeping up the old appearances at Weiskenfeld, sitting in his office, reading official letters and dictating replies to his secretary as if everything were under control. But the charade had become increasingly difficult to maintain. Point 47 telephone calls from the outside world had tapered off noticeably, and the courier brought fewer letters to the office in Weiskenfeld. Food was growing scarce, and soon there would be no fuel left for the vehicles. The Ananerbs' connection to the world was growing more tenuous by the day. Sievers hated it. He had pinned everything on Himmler and Hitler and their seemingly boundless power, and he was beginning to see just how foolish he had been. The Reich's foreign affairs ministry proposed fighting the ugly stories coming out of Nat Seiler, hoping even then to paste together the tattered facade of Nazi respectability. Point 48 It requested a statement from Hurt that would somehow explain away the evidence of the atrocity, and Sievers dutifully relayed the request to the anatomist, who was safely lodged, along with many of his former university colleagues, in Tübingen. There was talk of resurrecting the Reich University of Strasbourg just as soon as military conditions permitted, and the administration had appointed Hurt as its new dean of medicine, the former dean having been captured. As a result, Hurt was keeping busy, searching for accommodations for the exiled faculty, but he still hoped to resume the experiments at the earliest opportunity. Sievers believed that the newspaper reports of Hurt's work were mere propaganda, based solely on rumors and suspicion. Hurt, after all, had informed him that all material evidence of the skeleton collection was destroyed. Point 49 So he encouraged Hurt to pen a strong denial. The anatomist followed the advice, for he feared that an international scandal would damage his scientific reputation in Germany and abroad. Point 50 In his statement, he described an article in the Daily Mail disparagingly as a typical atrocity story. 51 The corpses discovered in the Anatomical Institute, he declared, were simply bodies used to teach medical students the practice of dissection. They had been obtained from the same legal sources that French anatomists had previously used to obtain cadavers. He also observed that he had conducted only animal experiments at Nat Seiler, and he completely denied any involvement in Rassenkunde studies. I do not know anything about racial research and have never received such an order, he stated. The only thing which has to do with race in my institute is the large anthropological collection of skulls which was built prior to the First World War 52. Sievers thought Hertz's blatant lies were excellent 53 but the experience seems to have instilled in the official a new sense of caution. He ordered the staff at Mittersill to destroy all correspondence, photographs, and other materials related to the matter Auschwitz slash Professor Dr. Hurt Strasberg 54 He then began burning boxes of incriminating documents in the courtyard of the Steinhaus itself. Point 55. 21 Thor's Hammer In all the years Hitler had known Himmler, he had always counted upon the younger man's deep, unwavering sense of loyalty. Since the two men had met in Bavaria in the mid-1920s, Hitler had come to recognize his subordinate's remarkable skills as an administrator and his zealous dedication to Nazi party doctrine. But what finally bound the two men irrevocably together was Himmler's personal allegiance. He had guarded Hitler's life assiduously from assassins and built a personal bodyguard service, the SS, which was second to none. He had daily carried out Hitler's dirty work the mass executions, the liquidations, the slaughter without objection. His fealty seemed beyond question so much so in fact that Hitler had entrusted one of the most dangerous weapons of the Nazi state, the police, to Himmler alone. Moreover, as the war dragged on, and as the early victories turned sour, Hitler had heaped new powers under true Heinrich, loyal Heinrich. He named Himmler Germany's new interior minister in the summer of 1943. The following year, he placed him in charge of the reserve army, then called the People's Militia, which proceeded to conscript all men between the ages of 16 and 60 not already in military service. His faith in Himmler's ability to get a tough job done seemed unshakable. In November 1944, he had handed him a major military post, appointing him commander-in-chief of the army group Upper Rhine, responsible for holding a key German bridgehead south of Strasbourg and west of the Rhine. By early 1945, 
the clerkish-looking SS leader had emerged as the second most powerful man in the Reich, far outstripping Goring, Goebbels, and Bormann. With each new appointment, Himmler's hopes for personal advancement grew and he dreamed of one day inheriting Hitler's empire. As such, he stubbornly searched for a way any way of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Himmler had never forgotten the old Norse legends that his father had once read to him, the tales of Thor and his magical weapon, a deadly hammer that struck like lightning. He had persuaded himself long ago that the Edda was literal truth and that Thor's hammer was in fact a sophisticated piece of electrical engineering developed by Aryans to vanquish their enemies. So in November 1944, Himmler directed his staff to examine a bizarre plan to build a modern version of Thor's hammer a mammoth electrical weapon capable of shutting down all the electrical systems of Allied troops, from their radio communications and radar to the ignitions of their tanks. Point one. A great irony lay in this last-minute quest to develop a wonder weapon to save Germany from its enemies. Some two and a half years earlier, in February 1942, the Reich Research Council had organized a private day-long presentation in Berlin on uranium. One of the speakers, Nobel laureate physicist Werner Heisenberg, had described for the audience the process of nuclear fission and the devastating potential of an atomic bomb. Pure uranium-235, Heisenberg observed, is an explosive of quite unimaginable force, something that had occurred to many nuclear physicists. To harness this power, he noted, American scientists were apparently pursuing this line of research with particular urgency too. Building a German atomic bomb would cost billions of Reichsmarks, however, and require the expertise of many thousands of German scientists and technicians. To gather support for the idea, the Reich Research Council had sent Himmler and many other high-ranking Nazis personal invitations to attend the February 1942 meeting. But a secretary at the council had mistakenly tucked a program for another, far more technical meeting into the envelope. As a result, Himmler and his colleagues turned down the invitation, fearing a tedious day of it, and Heisenberg's ideas for a potent new explosive failed to win broad support in the Nazi leadership. Point three when Albert Speer raised the idea of such a bomb with Hitler a few months later, he shrugged it off, seeing little to be gained. Point four the idea, noted Speer, quite obviously strained his intellectual capacity. Five and the project suffered a further heavy blow over the next year and a half, as Allied. Saboteurs and bombers incapacitated a heavy water plant in Norway needed to produce weapons-grade raw material for the bomb. So it was that Germany failed to develop a major atomic weapon. Point six. As a result, Himmler turned at the end of the war to a far-fetched scheme for a bizarre electrical weapon. An obscure German company, Elamag, had put the plan forward in mid-November 1944. According to the firm's engineers, Existing technology could be used to transform the Earth's atmosphere into a giant remote control device capable of flipping the switch on the Allies' electrical equipment. It is established, explained the Elamag engineers, that by removing the insulating effect of the atmosphere, one makes it impossible for any electrical device of a familiar construction and implementation to function. The present state of technology offers the possibility of influencing the insulating material of the atmosphere for the task at hand. It is well known that ultra-shortwave electrical vibrations of certain frequencies also develop the ability to ionize the atmosphere they permeate, thus causing a reverse electrical reaction. In other words, they transform the insulating material of the atmosphere into a voltage conductor. 7. Himmler eagerly referred this proposal to his SS technical office. Aware no doubt of the Reichsführer's peculiar interests, the SS scientists examined the proposal carefully. As Himmler waited, he could not refrain from boasting to associates such as Adolf Eichmann and others about a new weapon that would render the Allies literally powerless. His personal physician, Felix Kirsten, recalled one such occasion. When I returned to Himmler's headquarters in December I found him singularly optimistic. Once again he was prophesizing a German victory. Germany was in ruins, the bombardment was ever more intense, Germany was almost encircled and Himmler was talking of victory. I could hardly believe my ears. One day, in a particularly expansive mood, 
he hinted at the reason for this presumably unfounded optimism. Very soon we shall put our last secret weapon into use. And that will change the war situation entirely. 8. The SS Technical Office mulled over the blueprints for the giant voltage conductor for weeks, searching, it seems, for some way to deliver the bad news to Himmler. But on January 8, it was forced to issue its verdict. The mammoth remote control was simply a fantasy one well beyond Germany's capabilities. Indeed, the SS staff warned, all the means to be made available to the research would have to be designated as lost in advance 9. Himmler, however, refused to believe it. Despite all his heavy responsibilities as a military commander, all the briefings and field reports, all the tactical and strategic planning with his officers, he immediately dispatched the proposal to Dr. Werner Osberg, head of the planning office of the Reich Research Council, requesting another opinion. Osberg, accustomed to dealing with serious physicists, must have been astounded by the document crossing his desk. But he clearly understood the importance that Himmler placed on the plan. He referred the matter to two prominent German scientists one of whom was an expert on electromagnetic waves. All three men submitted their reports in early February. The idea of such an electrical weapon, noted Osberg dryly, is unrealizable, given the present stage of technology. Elamag's statements themselves lack any deep understanding of the technological and physical processes involved. 10. By the end of March 1945, Allied bombers had reduced much of Berlin and Munich to smoking heaps of debris, leaving inhabitants to fend as best they could. Total destruction seemed only a few weeks away. In the West, Allied troops had bridged the Rhine and were now driving hard toward Germany's industrial heartland, the Ruhr Valley. Toward the east, the Soviet army was preparing to cross the Oder River, less than 100 kilometers from Berlin. The city's inhabitants shuddered to think what would happen then. For weeks, they had seen and heard terrible reports of the vengeance that Soviet troops were taking as they moved westward, burning and looting German homes, beating and gang-raping German women as a payback for the atrocities Hitler's forces had committed on Soviet soil. Some of these reports were frighteningly accurate. Point 11. Save for the time being in his new field headquarters a convalescent hospital just outside Berlin whose roof was conveniently painted with red crosses Himmler had begun examining his own options. As a military commander, he had failed to live up to Hitler's expectations, and much to his humiliation, he had been relieved of his army group command not, however, before receiving the full brunt of Hitler's fury. This failure and the hard words that had followed had greatly strained the old understanding between the two men. Hitler had found Himmler seriously lacking as a subordinate, and now that defeat was looming, Himmler had begun to seriously question Hitler's judgment, his military acumen, and his fitness to serve as Germany's leader. In defeat, they had fallen out like a pair of wolves. Hitler, after all, was prepared to go down in flames like an old Norse god, taking all Germany with him if need be. He angrily refused to capitulate to the enemy, no matter what terms might be offered. Himmler, however, wanted to live and he had already coldly turned his mind to a future without Hitler. Point 12 Indeed, he hoped to play a pivotal role in post-war Europe. He believed he could persuade the Allies to overlook his terrible crimes by handing over to them some of his SS divisions, thereby bringing the war to a speedier end. Himmler had grown accustomed to power, and he desperately hoped to hold on to it, perhaps as the new anti-communist leader of Germany. Point 13 If that meant betraying Hitler, the man he had served so obediently for nearly two decades, then he was fully prepared to do so. Already, he had dispatched a secret proposal to the Western Allies. Point 14 They had briskly turned it down, but he intended to try again. As he stood over the future in his field headquarters, however, Himmler followed the reports from the battle lines carefully. In the final days of March 1945, he realized with grim certainty that the Americans would soon capture Wulsberg, the SS castle where Weiligut had once pontificated on ancient runes. He was loath to let the castle, his Nordic Academy for senior SS officers, pass into enemy hands. So on March 30, 
he ordered Voelsberg's staff to evacuate, leaving behind only a detachment of SS guards. 15 a day later, at 3 in the afternoon, a member of Himmler's personal entourage, SS Hauptsturmführer Heinz Macker, appeared in the village with a small demolition squad. Macker ordered his men to place dynamite in the castle's west and south towers, as well as in two other adjoining staff buildings. 16 But the squad lacked what was needed to blow up the entire building, since the SS was running short of explosives. So Macker instructed his men to set fire to the curtains and other flammables. As flames began to dart from the windows, the SS officer set off the charges. The two towers buckled and sagged, then slumped in a dense cloud of dust and debris. From the safety of their homes, residents of the adjacent village of Wulsberg peered out at the spectacle. Macker and his men then finished off the work, firing anti-tank grenades at the stronghold, and after leveling as much as they could, they and the remaining SS guards departed for Paderborn. Just two hours had elapsed since they arrived. The villagers waited until Macker and his men were safely out of sight. Then they began pillaging the burning castle. In the last hours of daylight and over the next two days, they scrambled across halls and up burning staircases to plunder guest rooms, libraries, workshops, storage rooms, kitchens, and, of course, Himmler's own personal study. They helped themselves to expensive carpets and carved chairs, inlaid tables, and china plates decorated with Weilagut's faux runic symbols. Some broke into the castle's sprawling wine cellar, which was reputed to stock nearly 40,000 bottles, many almost certainly stolen from the finest cellars of Europe. As Wulsberg burned, the revelers grabbed bottles of champagne, Bordeaux, port, and schnapps, breaking so many on the way back up the narrow staircase that they had literally to slop through puddles of wine, their pant cuffs stained a deep red point 17. Others stumbled upon what remained of the castle's museum a glorified ancestor room to educate the SS leadership in the ways of their Aryan forebears. 18 Since the beginning of the war, Himmler had added dramatically to its collections, acquiring crates of plundered artifacts from Viking swords and golden helmets to Bronze Age belts, mirrors, Scythian bronze arrowheads, and classical Greek terracotta figurines. 19 In addition, foreign governments had learned that the surest way to curry favor with Himmler was to present him with a rare antiquity. When the new fascist regime of Spain wanted to court his support, for example, the Spanish foreign minister bestowed upon him a pair of artifacts excavated from an old West Goth grave in Segovia. 20. Vuhlberg's staff had taken pains to hide some, if not all, of these antiquities, knowing that the Allies were closing in. They ordered false walls to be built in a former Augustinian monastery known as Gut Bodican, located a few kilometers from Wulsberg, and stowed an unknown quantity of prehistoric treasures behind them. 21 But in the chaos that followed the abrupt departure of Himmler's troops from the region, someone seems to have divulged the location of this secret cache. Looters soon descended. The first American troops reached the charred ruins of Wulsberg on April 2 and occupied the village the following day. They picked up a few odd souvenirs from inside the raised castle a box of silver rings here, an SS typewriter there and saw the splintered remains of a large reptilian fossil in the courtyard. But there was little sign of the treasure that the castle had once housed. And there were few valuables remaining at the old monastery of Dickon. When Allied art experts arrived to inventory what was left from Himmler's plunder in hopes of returning it to its rightful owners, they found only a small pile of swords, shields, crossbows, and ancient helmets, all that remained of Himmler's prize collection of prehistoric weapons. 22. Early in the morning of May 1, Himmler received word that Hitler and his new bride, Eva Braun, had committed suicide in the bunker below the Chancellery building in Berlin. Although Himmler had once hoped to be named Hitler's successor, the German leader had coldly passed him over. Hitler had learned from a series of foreign media reports a few days earlier that Himmler had betrayed him. The SS chief had entered into private negotiations with the Western Allies, offering to bring the war to a quick end something Himmler believed he could enforce. 23 At first Hitler could scarcely believe the news. But as he mulled over the way that he had been mollified and gulled by Himmler, he had exploded with fury, 
calling it the most shameful betrayal in human history 24 soon after, he had named Admiral Karl Dönitz as his successor. Dönitz, the commander-in-chief of the German Navy, was as surprised as any by this choice, but unlike his predecessor, he did not intend to stand back watching Germany's annihilation. He transferred his headquarters to a naval cadet school near Flensburg, not far from the Danish border, and dispatched his representatives to France to see General Dwight Eisenhower. He wanted to sue for peace. On May 7, 1945, his representatives signed Germany's official unconditional surrender, and the following night at 11 o'clock all hostilities officially ceased. In the last months of the war, the Allies had agreed among themselves to establish an international military tribunal to try Germany's major war criminals. Although Hitler had escaped arrest, the other senior Nazi leaders were still at large, and the Allies were determined to bring them to justice. At the top of their list was the man who had meticulously planned, down to the last finicky detail, the industrialized slaughter of Jews and others categorized as enemies of the Reich. Well aware of this, Himmler began making plans to escape. He had already pocketed the identification card of a field police officer, Heinrich Hitzinger. He now shaved off his mustache, removed his famous glasses, slung a black patch over his right eye, and assumed Hitzinger's identity. For the first few days, he kept to himself at Flensburg, where he had brought his young mistress Hedwig Pothast and their two children. Point 25 on May 10, however, he decided to strike out south with a small entourage. Several of his senior SS officers had already departed for the Alps, where they planned to launch a new Nazi guerrilla movement, codename Werewolf. Himmler, it seems, had decided to cast his lot in with Werewolf. He donned civilian clothes and set off by automobile with his personal administrative officer, Dr. Rudolf Brandt, and a few other senior SS officers. The small group crossed a bridge over the Elbe River without attracting the suspicion of guards, then lit out on foot. Over the next week or so, the men lived on the Lam, a novel experience for Himmler. They joined the churning flood tide of people on the roads refugees and former soldiers, newly liberated slave laborers and recently freed concentration camp prisoners and at night they made their beds in farmers' haylofts or slept on benches in railway stations. Meanwhile, Allied intelligence officers searched for Himmler. In the House of Commons in London, a member of the opposition asked Winston Churchill pointedly where the SS leader was. Churchill expertly deflected the question. I expect he will turn up somewhere in this world or the next, and will be dealt with by the appropriate local authorities. The latter of them would be the more convenient to His Majesty's government. 26. On May 21, British troops stopped three German field police at a bridge outside of Bremerverd, a small town west of Hamburg. 27 They failed to recognize Himmler, but they were under orders to arrest all German police officers and so they dispatched the trio to a nearby internment camp. Interrogators there found Himmler's papers suspicious. The documents had been issued in Flensburg, where Dönitz and senior Nazi advisors had fled in the final days of the regime and where, According to recent reports from the Danish resistance, the SS leader had gone into hiding. 28 So the British sent him on to a second camp at Lüberg. By this time, however, Himmler had grown tired of all the skulking about. He had come up with a plan to offer Churchill the services of the werewolf guerrillas to aid in the coming fight against communism in the East. 29 So after arriving at the Lüberg camp on May 23, 1945, he told the guards who he was and asked to see the commanding officer, Captain Tom Sylvester, who was apparently at lunch. As Himmler waited, he doffed the eye patch and dug a pair of spectacles from his pocket and put them on. The transformation was startling. The British camp commander knew at once that he was speaking to Heinrich Himmler. Sylvester called in an intelligence officer to strip search the prisoner. The examination produced two curiosity small brass cylinders, each one half inch long and about the diameter of a cigarette. Point 31 of the cylinders was empty, the other contained a small blue glass vial, most likely a poison. Two days earlier, a senior SS officer had killed himself by swallowing a hidden vial of cyanide. 
the intelligence officer then compared the prisoner's signature to a known sample from Himmler, and asked Himmler a number of questions. Convinced that he was looking at one of the most notorious figures of the Nazi regime, the officer proceeded to show Himmler photographs of emaciated concentration camp prisoners and the huge mounds of corpses that Allied troops had recently discovered at Buchenwald. Himmler merely glanced at the pictures and shrugged. Am I responsible for the excesses of my subordinates? he asked. 31. That evening, Colonel Michael Murphy, chief of intelligence on the staff of British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, took custody of the prisoner. He shoved Himmler roughly into a car, and drove him to an interrogation center just outside Lubery. There he curtly ordered Himmler to strip and directed an army medical doctor to conduct a second examination in hopes of retrieving a missing poison vial. Himmler undressed meekly enough, but the display of photos from Buchenwald and Murphy's abusive manner seemed to have unsettled him, revealing all too clearly the futility of offering werewolf services to Churchill. He had at last run out of options. There was no future but ignominy at the hands of his captors, no escape but death. The army doctor peered into Himmler's mouth. He thought he saw something dark lodged in the lower molars. He beckoned Himmler toward better light and positioned his head for a better look. But Himmler suddenly wriggled free, snapping his mouth shut and grinding the cyanide capsule between his teeth. He quickly lost consciousness. Horrified by the turn of events, Murphy and an associate hoisted Himmler upside down by his legs, and shook him frantically. Then the army doctor tried pumping his stomach. But the prisoner did not regain consciousness. Heinrich Himmler, the chief architect of the Holocaust, had stopped breathing. He was pronounced dead at 11.04p.m.32. For two days, Himmler's body lay on the floor in Lüberg. Russian and American officials traipsed by and peered down at it to confirm the identification, then a medical person appeared and made plaster casts of Himmler's head and removed his brain and took it away.33 Finally, a British officer wrapped Himmler's body up in camouflage netting knotted with army telephone wire, and hauled it out to a truck with the help of a few soldiers.34 Together they drove to the nearby wilderness of Lubery Heath, where they dug a hole and secretly buried Himmler in an unmarked grave. They left nothing behind for Nazi loyalists to turn into a shrine. 22 Nuremberg In April 1945, a prominent American journalist wrote a story for Collier's magazine describing a series of conversations with ordinary Germans at the end of Nazi rule. Martha Gellhorn was a veteran war correspondent who had spent six years penning dispatches from the front lines. An elegant chain smoker who customarily dressed for battle in her Saks Fifth Avenue best, she had long made a point of avoiding the honeyed lies of generals in favor of the plain, unvarnished words of soldiers. She hungered for the truth, and on D-Day, she braved enemy fire to walk upon the beaches of Normandy, while her famous husband fellow war correspondent Ernest Hemingway contented himself with what he could see from the bridge of a landing craft. In the spring of 1945, Gellhorn had traveled with American forces as they pushed their way into Germany's Ruhr Valley. En route, she had chatted daily with German citizens she encountered. She was stunned by what she heard. Not one person she met would confess to being a Nazi. No one, moreover, would admit to knowing any Nazis, past or present. And no one she talked to had a bad word to say against the Jews. On the contrary, Nearly everyone had a story about saving a Jewish neighbor or acquaintance from the camps. Gellhorn was deeply dismayed, she heard the same lies over and over again in a terrible refrain. I hid a Jew for six weeks. I hid a Jew for eight weeks. I hid a Jew, he hid a Jew, all God's chillin' hid Jews. We have nothing against the Jews, we always got along well with them. 1. This seeming amnesia distressed the plain-spoken writer. She had traveled to Germany in the early years of the Third Reich with a group of French pacifists and seen for herself the feverish worship of Hitler and the country's appalling depths of anti-Semitism. And in the spring of 1945, she found it disturbing that no one she talked to was prepared to own up to the past or admit the terrible error of Nazism, much less shoulder any of the blame for the war that had destroyed much of Europe. 
To see a whole nation passing the buck, she observed, is not an enlightening spectacle too. Such brazen attempts to conceal the past posed a serious problem for Allied forces intent on bringing Nazi war criminals to justice and rebuilding democratic institutions in Germany. Nazism had deliberately cultivated a culture of lies, equivocation, and fantasy, and at Potsdam in July 1945, Allied leaders agreed that the occupation forces had to publicly expose the errors and crimes of the former regime in order to convince the German people that they cannot escape responsibility for what they have brought on themselves. 3. To succeed in this, the Allies had to denazify Germany. They had to eradicate the Nazi party and root out Nazism from the German courts, press, and schools. First, however, they had to bring all those guilty of war crimes to justice, beginning with the most senior offenders. To try the accused, the four major Allied powers established an international military tribunal at Nuremberg, a city replete with symbolism. Before the war, Hitler had presided over annual Nazi party rallies and mass parades each year at Zeppelin Field in Nuremberg, and it was at one of these rallies that party officials had enacted the Nazis' notorious racial legislation, the Nuremberg Laws. In preparation for the trials, the tribunal's document division set to work in the city's palace of justice, sorting through the towering piles of government records in search of evidence. The sheer quantity of documentation was overwhelming, but on November 14, 1945, guards led 22 of the Nazi regime's senior leaders from Hermann Göring and Joachim von Ribbentrop, the former foreign minister, to Julius Streicher, the former publisher of the anti-Semitic newspaper Der Sturmer, and Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the former head of the Reich Security Office into the courtroom. Over the next 11 months, as reporters from around the world flocked to cover the trial, American investigators began preparing for 12 more major prosecutions of Nazi war criminals at Nuremberg. Top on the docket was the medical case. Investigators had uncovered shocking evidence of the complicity of senior German doctors in Nazi atrocities committed in mental hospitals and concentration camps. Some of the most chilling evidence came from a thick sheaf of documents describing the Annenerb skeleton collection and medical experiments. American authorities had discovered the Annenerb files in a dark cave near the small Bavarian village of Pottenstein. In the final weeks of the war, Wolfram Sievers had resolved to save documents concerning some of the Annenerb's atrocities, hoping, it seems, that the researchers could one day pick up where they had left off. On the advice of a cave expert, Sievers had decided to conceal them and many other Annenerb records in a cave known as Klein's Teufel's Lock, or Little Devil's Hole, which was situated near the neighboring village of Pottenstein. Point four, he obtained a crew of concentration camp prisoners to transport the boxes, and he saw to it that the records were safely stowed behind the blast rubble in the cave. Point five. Then he and his assistant, Wolf Dietrich Wolf, set off from Weiskenfeld to join a nearby SS detachment. On April 14, 1945, the first American tanks appeared in Weiskenfeld. A young villager on a bicycle came out to greet them, waving a white flag. Most of the locals had fled so the troops moved into the official-looking Steinhaus, turning it into a temporary administrative center. Soon after, they received a tip-off about Nazi files hidden in the Little Devil's Hole. A small detachment of American troops went out to retrieve them. The boxes contained many thousands of Annenerb documents letters, personnel records, memoranda, orders, maps, handwritten notes, and official reports, some clearly stamped Geheim, or secret. They recorded in minute detail the war crimes of the Annenerb the greedy plundering of museums and private art collections from Poland to the Caucasus, the cold brutality of human medical experiments at Natseiler and Dachau, and the conspiracy to murder Jewish concentration camp prisoners for their skeletons. By this time Sievers had returned to Weiskenfeld in hopes of seeing his family. He hid in a village barn for a few days, where he was spotted by some of the local inhabitants. They had never much liked Sievers' high-handed manners, nor the way he had paraded through town in his SS uniform, so they reported him to the new authorities. On May 1, an American patrol captured him and took him into custody. Impressed by his high rank as an SS standartenfuhrer, they photographed him, 
asked him some preliminary questions, then shipped him off to nearby Bamberg for a brief hearing. Point six. Soon after that, Allied investigators dispatched him to an internment camp in England. Over the next 18 months, American intelligence officers poured over the captured documents, studying their contents and selecting correspondence of evidentiary value. A team of translators then rendered into English clinical reports of freezing experiments, mustard gas tests, and skeleton collections, and passed the finished documents on to the team of prosecutors, who were stunned by what they read. Their own reports illustrated with pictures are far better than any of the studies we have compiled on the persecution of Jews, crimes against humanity, etc., noted one prosecutor. The Germans certainly believed in putting everything in writing 7. With such detailed evidence before them, prosecutors charted the senior chain of command responsible for the Annenerbs atrocities at Natseiler and Dachau. They were particularly interested in four of the Annenerbs staff, Walther Wust, the superintendent, Sievers, the director of the Institute for Military Scientific Research and the official who had directly overseen the experiments, and the Institute's two senior researchers, Dr. August Hurt and Dr. Sigmund Rascher. The two physicians, however, lay well beyond the reach of the Allies' justice. In February 1945, just shortly before the war ended, German police had arrested Rascher for his role in a bizarre child abduction scheme. According to the original investigators, Rascher's wife Nini had kidnapped a series of infants after discovering that she was unable to conceive children of her own. Point eight. Rascher himself had gone along with the scheme, proudly representing three of the stolen babies as his own newborn sons to Himmler. But in 1944, Munich investigators uncovered the truth. When Himmler learned of the deception, he sent Nini Rascher to Ravensbrück concentration camp and eventually dispatched her husband to Dachau, the camp where Rascher had once reveled in conducting his experiments. Just a few short days before American forces liberated Dachau, an SS officer shot and killed the physician in his cell. Point nine. Hurt was similarly unavailable. In February 1945, he had suddenly left his office in Tübingen and journeyed secretly to the Black Forest. There he cached food and hid out in a hut in the woods. From time to time, he slipped down to a local farm, hungry for news of the war, until the farm's inhabitants eventually invited him to stay. And it was there that Hurt heard the news of Germany's surrender. Fearing arrest by the Allies, he borrowed a pistol from the farmer, then returned to the forest. He shot himself on June 2, 1945. The farmer who had sheltered him recovered his body and reported the death to authorities. Point 10. That left the Nuremberg prosecutors with just two senior Nazi officials to try for the Annenerbs atrocities Wust, the scholar who had overseen all of the Annenerbs scientific research, and Sievers, the organization's managing director. But in all the thick files of Annenerb correspondence, they could find little clear evidence of Wust's complicity in the experiments. They regretfully struck his name from their list. That left them with just one senior official, Sievers. On December 9, 1946, 23 defendants dressed in civilian clothes and military uniforms carefully stripped of all badges of rank filed into a courtroom in Nuremberg. Taking their places along two long wooden benches, they listened in silence to the charges laid against them. Twenty of the defendants were medical doctors accused of war crimes ranging from planning the mass murder of the mentally handicapped and others deemed unworthy of life to forcibly performing medical experiments on concentration camp prisoners. The remaining three were Nazi officials. Point eleven Sievers numbered among them. Prosecutors had indicted him on four counts, including unlawfully, willfully, and knowingly committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. The indictment specifically detailed his role in aiding and abetting the skeleton collection and the human medical experiments at Dachau and Nat Seiler. The Chief of Counsel, Brigadier General Telford Taylor, outlined the critical importance of the trial in his opening statement. The defendants in the dock are charged with murder, but this is no mere murder trial. We cannot rest content when we have shown that crimes were committed and that certain people committed them. To kill, to maim, and to torture is criminal under all modern systems of law. 
these defendants did not kill in hot blood, nor for personal enrichment. Some of them may be sadists who killed and tortured for sport, but they are not all perverts. They are not ignorant men. Most of them are trained physicians and some of them are distinguished scientists. Yet these defendants, all of whom were fully able to comprehend the nature of their acts, and most of whom were exceptionally qualified to form a moral and professional judgment in this respect, are responsible for wholesale murder and unspeakably cruel tortures. It is our deep obligation to all peoples of the world to show why and how these things happened. It is incumbent upon us to set forth with conspicuous clarity the ideas and motives which move these defendants to treat their fellow men as less than beasts. This case and others which will be tried in this building, offer a signal opportunity to lay before the German people the true cause of their present misery. The walls and towers and churches of Nuremberg were, indeed, reduced to rubble by Allied bombs, but in a deeper sense Nuremberg had been destroyed a decade earlier, when it became the seat of the annual Nazi party rallies, a focal point for the moral disintegration of Germany, and the private domain of Julius Stryker. The insane and malignant doctrines that Nuremberg spewed forth account alike for the crimes of these defendants and for the terrible fate of Germany under the Third Reich.12. Over the next nine months, the tribunal examined nearly 1500 documents and listened to the nightmarish testimony of 62 witnesses, many of whom recounted in hideous detail the experiments performed on prisoners in German concentration camps. Throughout the trial, Sievers sat impassively on the defendant's bench. On the witness stand, he insisted that he was innocent of all crimes. I always tried to prevent the Ananerb from becoming involved in medical research, he asserted under oath.13. In the evenings in a small 6 foot by 12 foot cell at Nuremberg, Sievers taught himself English and French and read widely.14. He reassured his wife that he would be released when all the facts of his case were made public.15. He based this belief on a bizarre set of circumstances. Since 1929, he had enjoyed a close personal relationship with Dr. Friedrich Hielscher, the leader of a secret resistance group that had fought Nazism in Germany. 16 Indeed, Sievers declared, Hielscher had recruited him as a member of the group, and during the ten years that he had served as the managing director of the Ananerb, he had led a double life, covertly supplying information to the resistance fighters. Hielscher was an immensely complex, charismatic man, a bisexual who seems to have once written love poetry to Sievers.17 He agreed to testify on Sievers' behalf and took the stand on April 15, 1947. Under oath, he explained that he had sent Sievers to work for Hermann Wirth in April 1932, believing that Wirth was a rising star in the Nazi firmament.18 He also testified that he had later encouraged Sievers to join the Ananerb as a Trojan horse, so that he could funnel secret information from SS and police contacts to the resistance group and eventually help assassinate Himmler. Hielscher then recounted some of Sievers' successes as a resistance worker. He had, Hielscher testified, passed on vital information about the movements of the Waffen SS during the war. In addition, he had assisted several prominent people to elude arrest and imprisonment by the Gestapo. These included the Nobel Prize-winning physicist Niels Bohr. Moreover, he had proven to be such a valuable asset to the resistance group that Hielscher had insisted that Sievers keep his post at the Ananerb even after the medical experiments began. Sievers had been desperate to quit, Hielscher claimed. And in the summer of 1944, the two men had plotted an assassination attempt on Himmler, which had unfortunately come to naught. Hielscher, however, could produce little evidence for these remarkable assertions, and it later emerged that he had greatly exaggerated the truth. Point 19 He was very fond of Sievers and owed the Nazi official a large debt of gratitude. Sievers had obtained his release from a Gestapo prison during the war and Hielscher clearly wanted to return the favor. While Sievers had supplied some of Hielscher's group with travel documents, and had even allowed them to meet from time to time in the Ananerb offices a cooperativeness that likely arose from his old sense of loyalty to Hielscher most of the witnesses other claims were fictional.20 Sievers played no part in Boer's escape.21 and he and Hielscher had never conspired to assassinate Himmler. The truth was far more sinister. While Sievers had assisted a minor resistance group from time to time, 
ladling out small favors in order to impress an old friend, he had planned and organized some of the most heinous crimes of the war, and served as a very lethal instrument of the Nazi state. He was, as the prosecution concluded in its final statement, an unresisting member of a so-called resistance group 22. On August 21, 1947, the tribunal judges handed down their verdict, they pronounced Sievers guilty on all four counts. Soon after, they sentenced him to death. Ten months later, Sievers climbed the stairs of the gallows in the courtyard of Landsberg Prison, only a few paces away from where Hitler had written the first volume of Mein Kampf. 23 Secrets The trials at Nuremberg riveted the world with their gruesome testimony of slave labor factories, mobile gas chambers, forced deportations, and massacres in the East. They resulted in the convictions of several hundred senior Nazi officials and succeeded in exposing some of the most repellent crimes of the Nazi regime. But as dramatic as the trials were, they failed to convince many Germans of the great error of Nazism. Some 40% still looked favorably in 1951 upon the Hitler period of German history when the Allies' great goal of rooting out Nazi culture remained little more than a lofty ideal. Many of the guilty went free. In the months following the German surrender, Allied forces had attempted arresting all leading party and government officials. In the American zone, the new military government passed a law requiring each public office holder or each person aspiring to public office to fill out an extensive questionnaire concerning his or her past Nazi party involvement. Point two on the strength of the answers, American troops broadened their net, arresting tens of thousands of party officials and members of the SS, the Gestapo, and other suspicious organizations and imprisoning them in internment camps. Point three in Bavaria alone, American authorities fired or arrested 100,000 employees, leaving schools without teachers, telephone exchanges without operators, and post offices without postal workers. Point four life quickly ground to a halt, while the internment camps bulged at the seams. Thinking better of this approach, the new military governments established local denazification tribunals across Germany to sift through the vast numbers of suspects and identify the most dangerous Nazis. The local tribunals in turn hired nearly 22,000 people to assess the information from the questionnaires and classify those who had filled them out into one of five categories, depending on the degree of their involvement in the former regime from exonerated and fellow traveler, to lesser activist, activist, and major offender. For the three most serious categories, the tribunals were free to impose penalties ranging from modest fines all the way up to 10 years imprisonment in a work camp and the seizure of all personal property. Point five. The new system, however, was riddled with holes that allowed the great majority of senior Nazi officials to wriggle free. Some falsified their questionnaires, knowing that many government records had gone up in flames during the bombing attacks. Point six, or they offered discreet bribes a few pounds of butter or a burlap sack filled with flour to tribunal members known to accept such things. Point seven, often they traded favors or cash for the support of witnesses willing to testify that they had once helped a member of a resistance group or a Jewish family evade arrest a practice so common that cynical Germans soon coined a new word. Persilchin, or whitewashing certificates, for such statements.8 faced with such ploys, tribunal members exonerated both war criminals and those who had fostered and intensified the poisonous atmosphere of racism in Nazi Germany. The tribunals themselves became known as Mittlofer Fabriken, factories for mass-producing fellow travelers 9. Moreover, with the onset of the Cold War, the Western Allies lost much of their fervor for finding and prosecuting Nazi war criminals, focusing their attentions instead on the new communist threat behind the Iron Curtain. As a result, many important Nazis escaped virtually unscathed from denazification. They resumed their former jobs and picked up the pieces of their lives again, as if nothing had ever happened. At the end of the war, this is precisely what most of the Annenerb senior researchers attempted to do. Soon after American troops captured the city of Marburg, an eccentric, 60-year-old savant began besieging American authorities with petitions for their assistance. Dr. Herman Wirth, who had helped Himmler create the Annenerb in the mid-1930s and who publicly claimed to have discovered the cradle of a superior Aryan civilization in the High Arctic, 
was frantic to recover a large library of books and hundreds of plaster casts he had made of the Swedish rock art. Point ten worth had been forced to leave them behind in the Annenerv headquarters in Berlin after he was ousted as the research organization's first president, and he desperately wanted them back. He planned on resuming his research on ancient Aryan writings. American officials in Marburg had no idea who Wirth was. They were unaware that he had once lectured widely in Northern Europe, spreading the myth of Aryan supremacy to anyone willing to listen. They politely agreed to search for the material. Eventually, however, a neighbor denounced him and American intelligence officers clapped him in an internment camp while they decided what to do with him. Point eleven Worth became a barracks leader there. He changed his last name to Worth Roper Bosch and reinvented his Nazi past. He told authorities that he had fiercely opposed Nazism and the SS and had even been dismissed from his professorship at the University of Berlin because of it. Point twelve he neglected, however, to mention that he had repeatedly pleaded during the war for permission to give propaganda lectures in the Netherlands and Sweden only to be turned down. Cultural propaganda, wrote Sievers, is a delicate matter which Worth is not capable of performing in a skillful way. 13. Worth's disavowal of his Nazi past was masterful, however. American authorities classified him as a political victim of the Third Reich and displaced person and released him from internment in 1947.14 free again, he bundled up his wife and children and set off first to the Netherlands, the country of his birth, then to Sweden, the land of the rock art that so enchanted him. There he changed his name twice more to Felix Bosch and later to Heinrich Bosch and found work briefly at a private photographic institute in Lund.15 but despite his change of address, name, and employment, he was still the same old Hermann Wirth. One visitor to his home in Lund reported that a large oil painting of Wirth dressed in an SS uniform hung in the family's private library.16. Eager to be reunited with his large circle of admirers, he moved back to Germany with his wife in the 1950s.17 but he continued to study and make casts of the rock art of Bohuslan. His bumbling fieldwork infuriated Swedish officials. In 1964, they accused Worth and his assistants of permanently damaging two of the country's most important petroglyph sites.18 they contemplated levying a fine of 5,000 Swedish crowns for damages, but eventually settled on officially banning the 79-year-old Worth from cleaning, drawing, casting, or in any other manner altering the conditions of the rock art of Bohuslan or any other place in all of Sweden 19. Worth, however, was not so easily deterred. He continued to stage exhibitions and lectures, attracting a large group of followers who avidly lapped up his theories about an ancient Ice Age civilization in the far north.20 with the backing of powerful supporters, he drew up plans in the late 1970s for a new museum to showcase his collection of rock art casts and so charmed officials in Rhineland Palatinate that they agreed to put up 1.1 million marks for the project, which was to be installed in a castle in the small town of Thal Lichtenberg.21 in 1980, at the age of 95, Worth was poised on the brink of a remarkable resurrection, but just at this moment of triumph, a Spiegel reporter came snooping around. The resulting article exposed Worth's Nazi past and ridiculed his befuddled ideas, dashing any chance of success. 22. Worth died a year later, with hardly a penny to his name. 23. His admirers, however, stubbornly refused to let his ideas die. German publishers continued to produce pseudo-scholarly books on ancient symbol research, and some German documentary filmmakers touted the notion of a primeval high civilization in Northern Europe, even going so far as to borrow footage from old Nazi films to illustrate these ideas. And a former Annenerb colleague acquired part of Wirth's collection for a rock art museum tucked away in the small Austrian town of Spittel am Phrn.24 today, 14 of Wirth's large casts hang in a bright, well-lit room there. The exhibition makes no mention of Worth or his dark past. Even so, the casts remain a shrine to Worth's ideas and, as one Austrian scholar notes, a clandestine Nazi memorial 25. In the summer of 1946, a distinguished-looking Finnish nobleman paced the floor of a cell in Akershus prison in Oslo. Jerjo von Grunhagen, the scholar who recorded the magical spells of Finnish sorcerers for Himmler, 
and sought to bring Finland and Nazi Germany closer together during the war, insisted he was guilty of no crime. At the start of the war, he had joined the Finnish army, eager to defeat the invading Soviet forces, and when his homeland sued for peace in 1940, he returned to Berlin. There, as he later explained to his son, he worked for a time as an extraordinary representative of the Finnish foreign ministry, furthering German-Finnish cultural exchange 26 as part of this mission, he wrote a series of books on Finland for German readers, produced a German radio program on Aipuri, the old capital of Karelia, and finished a German propaganda film entitled Freedom for Finland.27 all stressed the strong cultural links that bound the two countries together. When the war ended, the Finnish foreign ministry transferred Grenhagen to Oslo, where he began repatriating prisoners of war.28 in the midst of this work, however, the Finnish security police began investigating the diplomat for his political activities. They arranged for him to be arrested and detained in Akershus prison, where the British security service held those suspected of collaborating with the Nazis. The British, however, uncovered nothing damaging against Grenhagen, he appears to have no connection with the Finnish or German SS, wrote one British officer blithely.29 The Finnish security police were much more suspicious. When Grenhagen returned to Helsinki, the investigation continued. Finally in early 1947, the court set him free.30. Grenhagen had hoped to return to his studies of Karelia and its rich folklore after the war. He was still keenly interested in the ancient songs of the Kalevala, although he seems to have lost the valuable sound recordings he had made in Karelia.31 to his dismay, leading folklorists in Finland shunned him.32 they were quick to snub a man who had accepted the tenets of Nazi Rasenkunda and alleged that the Finns were Aryans. And many were horrified by his close relationship to Himmler and the Ananerb.33 one prominent Finnish scholar, Dr. Kusta Vilkuna, publicly accused Grenhagen of being a German spy who merely masqueraded as a folklorist.34 one by one, the doors to Finnish academic life closed. For a time, Grenhagen worked as a Russian interpreter in a dockyard, then he purchased a tourist hotel in Lapland.35 in 1964, he became the general secretary of the Order of St. Constantine the Great, a Christian ecumenical organization dedicated to keeping alive the intellectual heritage of the ancient Greek and Byzantine civilizations. The former folklorist spent his summers in Lapland and his winters in Greece for more than 30 years, then finally returned to Helsinki in 2000. He lived quietly there until his death in 2003 at the age of 92. Dr. Franz Altheim, the charming classical historian whose mistress Erika Trotman was a close personal friend of Goring, was on the faculty of the University of Halle when the Soviet army arrived in the city. After the troops had established control, intelligence officers led the university's faculty and staff down into a basement for interrogation.36 during questioning, someone seems to have mentioned that Altheim was closely associated with the Ananerb and that some of his books even bore a preface written by Himmler himself. Four battle-hardened Soviet officers who would as soon string up an SS officer as look at him, this would have been a damning bit of news. Altheim, however, stuck firmly to the story that he was just a scholar. He said nothing of his work as an intelligence agent both before and during the war.37 in 1938, he and Trotman had gathered intelligence for Himmler in Romania and Iraq, two countries possessing oil reserves that would prove of critical importance during the war. And they had continued to collect and pass on secret information during the war.38 before the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, for example, they had submitted a detailed report outlining three routes for smuggling weapons to pro-Nazi supporters in Iraq.39 In addition, they also seem to have analyzed political, economic, and social conditions in Iran, supplying intelligence useful for a possible German invasion.40. Altheim made no mention of this work to the Soviets. He did, however, confess to straying into the political realm on two important occasions, Mixing a little truth into his lies.41 once, he declared, he had used his Ananerb connections to try to free the president of Oslo University from a German concentration camp, another time he had tried to win the release of a woman prisoner of mixed Jewish ancestry, 
the daughter of one of his closest friends. 42 Both of these assertions were true, and they seemed to have swung the balance in his favor. The Soviets arrested two of the university staff and deported them to Siberia. But they gave Altheim a clean bill. 43 The historian returned gratefully to his teaching. But he was not ready to settle back into the life he had previously known with Trotman. He seems to have found her too old to be desirable, and it may have occurred to him that a mistress with high Nazi party connections was more of a liability than an asset to a man with a past to hide. 44 As it happened, he had met someone else. At Halley, he had discovered a beautiful young student, Ruth Steele, with flowing red hair and a brilliant gift for languages and classical history. He fell in love with her, and when he escaped to the West in 1949 at the age of 51 to take up a professorship at the Free University in Berlin, Steele accompanied him. 45. Even so, Altheim did not abandon Trotman. He found a house on a quiet street in Grunewald Forest in Berlin, a lovely spot tucked away in the woods. There, in one part of the house, he lived with his new young mistress, collaborating on books and academic publications, just as he had once done with Trotman. In the other part, Trotman lived quietly, doing photography work for her former lover and cooking dinners and keeping house for him and his new mistress. 46 It was a curious menage a trois, one that puzzled Altheim's friends and students. But the historian undoubtedly had his reasons. He loved to shock bourgeois sensibilities. 47 And Trotman was likely the only person alive who knew about his past as a Nazi intelligence agent. Altheim went on to a brilliant career at the Free University, and an equally brilliant retirement in Munster. He authored or co-authored more than 250 publications, on subjects as diverse as Asian feudalism, the Arab world before Muhammad, and the history of the Huns. 48 He dazzled students with his wit and the vast sweep of his knowledge, and he rose to the top of his profession, becoming, as one obituary writer later recorded, one of the best-known scholars of German antiquity studies 49 even in his final years, he was a legendary figure. He drove to the University of Munster each day in a white Mercedes 220s coupe with steel, a beautiful woman dressed in a leopard skin coat and cradling a Pekingese in her arms. They looked like two mythical beings, recalled a former student with a laugh. 50. Trotman died in October 1968 and Altheim bought her an old Germanic-style gravestone, in keeping with her last wishes. 51 He died eight years later of cancer. Neither his friends nor his former students had any inkling of his past as an intelligence agent. As fond as Altheim was of attracting attention, he had never breathed a word of his clandestine activities. He filled the walls of his study with photographs of famous people he had known during his career. But there were no photographs of Himmler or Goring or colleagues from the Annenerb. That was a cleansed picture, noted one of his former students. He wanted to wipe it away, I think 52. In his laboratory at the University of Groningen, Dr. A. C. N. Bomers continued to pour over the strange stone spearheads of Mauern during the late 1940s. The scholar who had sought the origins of the Cro Magnon race in Germany and who had promoted Nazism along the northeastern Dutch coast, in hopes of one day becoming the Gauleiter of a Nazi Friesland, had landed neatly on his feet. He had convinced his allied captors to release him from prison after just nine months of internment by brazenly claiming to have been part of the same resistance group as Sievers. 53 He had then managed to land a position as a research worker at the renowned Biological Archaeological Institute at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, where he had taught as a lecturer during the war. Just how Bomers managed to finagle his way into a teaching position in a country that reviled the Nazis is very unclear. Bomers, explains one Dutch scholar who met the archaeologist after the war, was a very enigmatic man, and I think even his nearest colleagues didn't know him well. 54 But a former colleague of Bomers who has examined his case closely believes the prehistorian may have blackmailed the head of the institute, Dr. Albert van Giffen. 55 During the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, Bomers persuaded van Giffen, one of the country's foremost archaeologists, to remove his signature from a petition opposing the dismissal of Jewish university professors, 
and it seems likely that he threatened to expose Van Giffen's action and portray him as an anti-Semite. 56. At Groningen, Bomers went about his archaeological work with suitable professionalism, but his personal behavior grew increasingly furtive and erratic. During the saber-rattling of the Cold War, he became obsessed with the idea that the Soviet Union would invade the Netherlands. He was particularly worried about being captured. He sold his house and bought a large seaworthy yacht so that he could sail to Scandinavia should the Soviet army suddenly arrive. 57 He stocked the yacht with a bristling arsenal of firearms, all purchased illegally from an assistant who was stealing artifacts from the institute. After a police investigation, the University of Groningen suspended Bomers, and in January 1965, the archaeologist asked to be dismissed. He then turned his energies to marketing the crafts of traditional Dutch wood carvers. In 1972 he gave a talk to a group of Frisian University students about his years in the Ananurb. By that time, he had reinvented the entire history of the research organization. According to Dr. Bomers, one of the audience members later recalled, there was a group, a core in the Ananurb, of highly qualified scholars who formed a kind of secret society opposed to National Socialism, or maybe more accurately, to Hitler and his ideas 58 throughout the presentation, Bomer spoke of a certain Heine with admiration. At first audience members had no idea who he was talking about, but they eventually realized he was referring to Himmler. I was shocked to meet a man who had been so near to Heinrich Himmler, explains one of the audience members, Dr. Eb Brees, Today.59. Disenchanted with life in the Netherlands, Bomers moved to Sweden, and died in Gothenburg in 1988. Since then, his professional reputation has sunk lower still in the eyes of Dutch archaeologists. A prominent Groningen scientist, Dr. Chaling Waterbolk, who once headed the Biological Archaeological Institute, has since completed an extensive investigation of an archaeological forgery ring that tried to pawn off fake stone hand axes as Middle Paleolithic treasures in the mid-1960s. He concluded that Bomers was most likely the ring leader. Dr. Ernst Schaefer departed for the cloud forests of Venezuela in 1950, eager to return to his old life as a hunter and naturalist. He had served Himmler faithfully, searching for Aryans in the mountains of Tibet and touring occupied Europe during the war as one of the exemplars of Nazi science. He had put concentration camp prisoners to work at Mittersil and accepted the command of the Caucasus mission, which was designed in part to racially diagnose the mountain Jews prior to their liquidation. One knowledgeable witness, Walther Wust, even declared after the war that Schaefer had sat on the board of trustees for the Institute for Military Scientific Research, which had presided over the Ananurbs medical experiments. 60. But in the final days of the war, Schaefer had erased the official record of his deeds as thoroughly as he could. He carefully burned incriminating documents at Mittersill and destroyed other key pieces of evidence, including Gable's plaster casts of the Auschwitz prisoners, which could have been used to identify the victims. 61. During his denazification hearing, his attorney presented affidavits from more than 40 witnesses who stated that Schaefer had cooperated with resistance groups and assisted Jews and Polish scientists persecuted by the Nazis. On the strength of this evidence, the local denazification tribunal cleared him in June 1949, awarding him an exonerated classification. 62. By then, Schaefer was anxious to put Germany far behind him. Through a friend, he lined up a job as the director of Rancho Grande, a biological research station in Venezuela, and flew there with his wife and three children. 63 The station amounted to little more than a bizarre looking concrete bunker set at the top of a windy hairpin road in the middle of dense forest, but Schaefer was enchanted. The forest and the lowlands that surrounded it teemed with life howler monkeys, fertile ants, coral snakes, tapirs, pumas, giant anteaters and more than 500 species of birds. Ornithologists had yet to study or describe many of these species, so Schaefer spent the next few years observing the birds in their natural habitat and hunting specimens for the station's research collection. From time to time, foreign ornithologists dropped in at the station, keen to see the forest's rich fauna, 
and it was on one of these visits that Schaefer met the former Belgian king, Leopold. Leopold had been forced to abdicate the throne after his swift surrender to the Wehrmacht during the war, many Belgians thought him a traitor. To fill his empty hours, the former king had taken up ornithology and natural history. At Rancho Grande, he and Schaefer became fast friends, and he insisted that the German zoologist come to work as his scientific advisor in Belgium. Schaefer accepted the offer. He wanted to educate his children in Europe. Leopold lodged the family in luxury and gave Schaefer a big workspace in Castle Villers sur Les. He then commissioned him to make a film to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Belgium's annexation of the Congo. Leopold had raised 60 million Belgian francs the equivalent of $7.59 million today to make it point sixty four. Schaefer jumped at the chance. He roamed the Congo for months with a large film crew, shooting the Lords of the Ancient Forest. From time to time, Leopold and his wife Liliane flew in to see how things were going, and together they planned a grand premiere. Just before the film opened, however, veterans of the Belgium resistance announced that the director was a former Himmler man. The bombshell sparked a furor in Brussels. Leopold asked the Schaefers to leave the country quietly. He feared the scandal would bring down the royal house. Schaefer, however, countered with a lawsuit, eventually accepting a reported settlement of 2 million Belgian francs, the equivalent today of some $252,800.65. In Hanover, Schaefer landed a position as a curator at a prominent museum. He was immensely happy to be back on German soil, but during his lengthy absence, strange stories had begun circulating in high society about his wartime activities at Mittersill. Mittersill's owners had restored the property to its previous grandeur and opened it again as a sport and shooting club where the old European nobility could mingle happily with the likes of Clark Gable and Gina Lollabrigida.66 But according to one popular story, the castle's owners had found on their return thousands of skulls from Tibet, India and China eerily stored on new constructed shelves in all of the rooms 67 The tale aroused much comment and particularly intrigued one Mittersill. Guest Ian Fleming.68 After hearing the story, the creator of James Bond transformed Mittersill into the fictional scientific research station of Piz Gloria, the alpine lair of Bond's archenemy Ernst Blofeld. Schaefer, however, paid no attention to these tales. He continually reshaped his past to suit the times, editing out any parts that cast him in an unflattering light. He retired to the quiet spa town of Bad Bevensen in Lower Saxony, and remained an avid birder and naturalist until the end of his days. He died on July 21, 1992, at the age of 82. Edmund Kiss never did lead a great scientific expedition to the Bolivian Andes. The architect who searched for proof of an ancient Aryan high civilization at Tiwanaku and who penned fantasy and adventure novels to popularize Hitler's racial theories, remained in active military service throughout the war, first as an officer and later as the commander of an anti-tank gun division in Norway, East Prussia, and Poland. Near the end, he assumed command of the SS men at Wolfskans, guarding the dank bunker complex where Hitler had once mesmerized his dinner guests with table talk about the Crimea.69. Arrested and interned, Kiss entertained his fellow prisoners with stories of his travels in Bolivia and Libya. By the end of the war, however, the 59-year-old officer was suffering severely from diabetes, so American authorities released him from Darmstadt camp in June 1947.70 under the terms of his discharge, he was not allowed to take any form of work, except menial manual labor, and the denazification tribunal proposed classifying him as a major offender, noting that Kiss was a member of Himmler's personal staff and had received an honorary SS dagger. Alarmed by this, Kiss hired an expensive lawyer and countered the charge, pointing out that he had never taken out membership in the Nazi Party. 71. At his denazification hearing in 1948, Kiss tried to present himself as a reformed man. He explained, for example, that he had developed serious doubts about the world ice theory. Colleagues in England and the United States had mocked the theory, regarding him as the complete idiot from Germany. 72. Moreover, 
the new nuclear theory had given him pause for thought, he was revising his ideas accordingly 73 but Kiss refused to completely renounce other Nazi notions. On the stand, he declared his belief in Rasenkunda, stating there is something to racial theory, no question about it 74. The tribunal obligingly reclassified Kiss as a fellow traveler and fined him 501 marks.75 Kiss paid in full. Then, with the hearing behind him, he retired as a writer. In December 1960, he died. His fantasy novels of Tiwanaku and Atlantis were almost immediately forgotten, gathering dust on the storage shelves of libraries. But his research on the world ice theory and his crackpot theories on the sun gate of Tiwanaku stubbornly lived on. In the 1950s and 60s popular authors such as H. S. Bellamy and Dennis Sari published Kiss's ideas in a series of books. These in turn gave birth to a new generation of fabulists, whose numbers include such modern writers as Graham Hancock. One of Hancock's most popular books, Fingerprints of the Gods, devoted three chapters to wild speculations on the origins of Tiwanaku, selling more than three million copies after its publication in 1995. Art experts attached to the staffs of the Allied military commanders hunted determinately after the war for the treasures plundered from Poland and other European nations. They questioned German museum directors, coombed government records, and searched thousands of possible hiding places, from remote salt mines and barns to dusty medieval cellars. They inventoried rooms brimming with loot old masters, ancient gold coins, classical Chinese bronzes, ancient Scythian jewels and dispatched their contents to allied collection points so that they could be returned to their rightful owners. They became sleuths on a very grand scale, the war years had seen the largest plundering of artworks in history. Point 76. Dr. Peter Paulson, the archaeologist who stole the Weizstoss altar from Krakow and orchestrated the looting of Poland's archaeological treasures, did his best to bury his past. When the war ended, he spent three years in internment, then took a series of teaching jobs. In 1961, he landed a prestigious position as a medieval expert at the Provincial Museum in Wurtemberg. 77 he became an expert on the Alemanni, an ancient German tribe, and re-established his scholarly reputation. He was well regarded, recalled prominent German archaeologist H. M. Lub. Indeed Paulson remained active in archaeology until he developed eye problems in his old age. He died in 1985, at the age of 83. His obituary, like so many others of the time, skipped lightly over his wartime activities. It made no mention of his work for the SS and the Annenerb.78. Paulson's colleague in the plunder, the Austrian museum director Eduard Tratz, enjoyed an even smoother ride back to respectability. During the war, Tratz had personally ransacked the Natural History Museum in Warsaw, stealing specimens to mount Nazi racial exhibits in the museum he founded, Haus der Natur. A department head in the Annenerb and a major supporter of the Nazi regime in Salzburg, Tratz thought it important to educate the Austrian public in the theories of Rassenkunde. After the war, he spent two years in internment, receiving the lesser activist classification. 79 it amounted to no more than a slap on the wrist, for by 1949 he had resumed his old job as director of the Haus der Natur.80. Allied investigators forced the museum to return many of its looted artifacts and zoological specimens, but they could not induce Tratz or his successors to discard all the museum's Nazi exhibits. As late as the 1990s, the Haus der Natur exhibited racial castes of the supposed Nordic and Jewish races. 81 and even today, tours of school children gaze unknowingly at Tibetan mannequins created from the head casts made by Bruno Beger, one of the collaborators in the Jewish skeleton collection. Tratz, a highly respected member of Salzburg society, died in 1977. A bronze bust of the zoologist now adorns the museum's main foyer. Dr. Herbert Jenkin, the Annenerb archaeologist who fraternized with leaders of Ansatzgruppe 11 in the Northern Caucasus, and who sought evidence of a Gothic empire in the Crimea to bolster Nazi claims to the future Gatenga, spent the last years of the war as an intelligence officer with Viking Division on the Eastern Front. Like most German soldiers, 
he dreaded capture by the Soviet army, and was much relieved when his commanding officer decided in the dying days of the war to lead the Viking division on a hurried retreat westward. In this way, Jankin and his fellow Viking division officers managed to surrender to American troops entering Bavaria.82. The archaeology professor was interned in Allied camps for three years. When he was released, his 11-year-old son did not know who he was. He was a bitter man. His family possessed little money for the Persilchi needed to win a lighter sentence. As a result, the local denazification tribunal barred him for several years from holding a university teaching position, and Jankin was forced to hustle for work. Point 83 he sought out and received annual scientific research grants to continue his excavations at the old Viking site at Haithabu, near the Danish border, one of the most important sites in Germany. Point 84 in the winter, he analyzed the data, published his findings, and gave guest lectures at Hamburg and Kiel. Point 85. By such means, he supported his family and managed to advance his scientific reputation. In 1956, the University of Göttingen offered him a teaching position, which Jankin gratefully accepted. Point 86 His career at the university was meteoric. Ten years after his appointment, the university named Jankin the dean of the philosophy faculty. Point 87 While a few of his students and colleagues knew of his SS background, most at Göttingen were unaware of his work in the Ananerb and of the influence he once wielded as the most powerful archaeologist in Nazi Europe. 88. Scholars elsewhere, however, were a good deal more knowledgeable and far less forgiving. In 1968, for example, Jankin planned a trip to Norway and offered to give a public lecture at the University of Bergen. The university turned the suggestion down cold, Four faculty members still remembered his imperious manner as an SS archaeologist in Oslo during the war, and the way he had once denounced a Norwegian archaeologist, Anton Broger. Jankin was not welcome, recalls another Norwegian archaeologist, Anders Hagen, who was then on faculty at Bergen. He was a really intelligent man, but he couldn't understand these things. 89. Jankin later told his sons that he could not explain his behavior during the Nazi years, even to himself, but he never apologized. Indeed, he staunchly defended his old comrades. During an interview with historian Michael Cater in 1963, he declared that the SS was largely innocent of genocide. Only SS concentration camp guards, he stated, had truly persecuted Jews. It was an immensely cynical attempt at whitewashing given his association with the leaders of Ansatz Group 11 in the Caucasus. 90 Moreover, he never abandoned his ideas about German territorial claims in the East. In later life, he told his son Dieter that the world doesn't stop at the Iron Curtain. And anyway, these parts have been the settlements of our ancestors. 91. Jankin died in 1990, honored, respected, and eulogized as one of the deans of German archaeology. Walther Wust, the Aryan studies expert who led the Ananerb for eight years, from 1937 to 1945, and whom the Folkisker Biobotter once described as among the most loyal and dependable men to the Fuhrer, was interned for 40 months at the end of the war. 92 During this time, American intelligence officials attempted to build a case against him for trial at Nuremberg but they found it extremely difficult going. Wust had been very cautious in his handling of the Institute for Military Scientific Research, delegating operational responsibility for the medical experiments to Sievers. Adding to the difficulty of the case was the fact that investigators lacked Wust's own correspondence files from the Ananerb Bureau in Munich. The office had been hit in an aerial attack near the end of the war and the files seemed to have been destroyed or lost in the rubble. Point 93. Under interrogation, Wust claimed to know nothing at all about the human experiments or the skeleton collection, and insisted stubbornly that the Institute for Military Scientific Research was completely separate from the Ananerb, although this was patently false. 94 Moreover, he repeatedly claimed that the Ananerb was merely a conventional research organization, devoted to the scholarly pursuit of truth and knowledge. He stuck firmly to this story, much to the frustration of investigators 
who made note of his pathological attempts to whitewash himself of his clearly established responsibilities 95 in the end, prosecutors at Nuremberg chose not to put him on trial. The local denazification tribunal classified Wust in 1950 as a fellow traveler, and the University of Munich took him back as a professor in reserve, paying him a monthly salary of 494 marks.96 but Wust did not return to the classroom or the administration. He found work instead at the Bavarian State Library in Munich, where he could often be seen in the 1950s, a small man working on slips of paper for what he hoped would be his magnum opus, a dictionary of old Indo-Aryan. Many of his former colleagues were baffled by his apparent inability to reconstruct his academic career, when so many other Nazi scholars were slipping back effortlessly into their former posts. It is as if the earth had swallowed you and the research society, marveled one colleague, Gustav Freitag, who hoped that the disinfection would soon be over and that Wust would find a position suitable to his great skills 97 but Wust's isolation and the withdrawal from academic life may have been self-imposed. Some former colleagues thought that the scholar had gone a little funny after the war, working on strange new ideas, such as the role of bears in Paleolithic societies. 98. In 1958, the German federal states founded a new agency, the Zentral Stell, or Central Office, in Ludwigsburg, for investigating Nazi war crimes committed in concentration camps, Jewish ghettos, and other places that had no relation to military activities. The new agency had its hands full of crimes to examine, mounting nearly 400 major investigations in the first year of its operation. 99 But from the start, its staff took a keen interest in the Annenerb and its former head, Walther Wust. Document experts sifted through all available records of Wust's activities during the Nazi regime. Among the Annenerb papers, they found the office diaries of Sievers. These delineated Wust's responsibility for the Institute for Military Scientific Research, and revealed that the scholar had even attended official meetings with Himmler concerning the Institute's medical experiments. 100. But investigators from the central office were unable to find a smoking gun to link Wust clearly and directly to the crimes. 101 in 1972, the prosecuting attorney was forced to suspend the investigation. 102 current archival research, however, reveals that Wust was well aware of the nature of at least some of the medical experiments, while they were underway. In 1944, for example, as Hurd continued to subject concentration camp prisoners to lethal mustard gas experiments, Wust recommended that the anatomist be promoted to the rank of SS Sturmbannführer, referring specifically to his work on secret experiments on poison gases, etc. 103 In this letter, Wust observed that Hurd has taken on this task with selflessness and diligence, in such a manner that it has badly compromised the condition of his health, not the least of which is due to the use of poison during the experiments. To the end of his life, however, Wust proclaimed his innocence. He died on March 21, 1993, at the age of 92, never having finished his Indo-Aryan dictionary. American forces captured Bruno Beggar in Italy at the end of April 1945. The anthropologist who had collaborated with August Hurt and selected and measured Jewish prisoners for the Annenerb skeleton collection, had spent the last part of the war conducting racial research on a Muslim division of the Waffen SS. 104 He mulled over his future in a series of Italian and German prisoner of war camps, then was interned at Darmstadt for 14 months. 105 Intelligence officers interrogated him several times. In February 1948, a local denazification tribunal classified the anthropologist as exonerated unaware it seems of his exact role in the skeleton conspiracy. 106 Beggar returned home to his wife and five children a free man. He had few job prospects, however. His academic specialty Rassenkunde had disappeared from university syllabuses across Germany, and research grants for the moribund field had completely dried up. Beggar was forced to look for another line of work. He and an old friend, Dr. Ludwig Ferdinand Kloss, another racial researcher, found positions at a publishing house in Oberursel specializing in educational books. 107 After that, Beggar became a sales representative for a large paper company and went into the paper business. 108. 
All the time, however, he seems to have yearned to return to scientific studies. He traveled on a private research expedition in 1954 to Algeria and Morocco with Dr. Fokmar Verashi, an old colleague from the Ananurb Institute at Mitersil, and on a second trip to the Middle East in 1958 and 1959 with Klaus.109 a year later, he tried publishing a serialized version of his Tibetan diaries in a local Frankfurt newspaper, the Nordwest Spiegel. Less than a third of the diary appeared, however. Reader complaints seemed to have forced the editors to cancel the rest. Not only did I have to defend myself against unjustified reproaches, complained Beggar later, I had to concentrate on the earning of money and my worries about my large family 110. In 1960, the central office in Ludwigsburg began a preliminary investigation of all those involved in the skeleton collection conspiracy. The staff carefully poured through archival records and attempted to track down witnesses who knew about the collection or had observed the events that took place at Auschwitz, Natseiler, or Strasbourg. On March 30, 1960, the police took Beggar into custody. Four months later, he was released. Nevertheless, investigators continued to amass thick folders of evidence on Beggar and two colleagues Dr. Hans Fleischhacker, the anthropologist who had assisted Beggar in performing the measurements at Auschwitz, and Wolf Dietrich Wolf, the SS officer who had worked for Sievers. Eight years later, the central office had gathered sufficient evidence to press charges. So it handed over its files to prosecuting attorneys in Frankfurt, where Beggar then lived. 111. The trial opened on October 27, 1970. Throughout the proceedings, Beggar insisted that Sievers and Hurt had kept him in the dark about the ultimate fate of the selected Jews until after he left Auschwitz. When he had learned the truth, he claimed, he was horrified and had journeyed to Nat Seiler with the intention of confronting Hurt and dissuading him from killing the prisoners. Witnesses and surviving Ananurb documents, however, poked holes in this story. Evidence from Sievers's diary showed that the racial specialist had discussed a Jewish skull collection as early as 1941, two years before the murders. Moreover, Sievers's former personal secretary and mistress, Gisela Schmitz, testified that it was Beggar, rather than Hurt, who had written most of the notorious letter proposing that a Jewish skull collection be made from the heads of Jewish Bolshevik commissars. More damaging was the official expense claim that Beggar submitted for the trip to Nat Seiler. On it, he had noted that the purpose of the trip to the French concentration camp was to perform blood tests and take X-rays of the prisoners. 112 to refute this damaging evidence, the defense presented testimony from several old associates and friends of Beggar, who recalled that the anthropologist had been disturbed by conditions he had observed in the camp. It was a long and complex trial but it did not rouse the public furor that might have been expected. By the early 1970s, many Germans had wearied of newspaper articles about war crimes trials and Nazi atrocities. Moreover, a surprising number of Germans still sympathized with the Nazi cause. Indeed, one 1971 German survey showed that 50% of the population still held that National Socialism was fundamentally a good idea which was merely badly carried out 113. In early March 1971, the Frankfurt Court dismissed the charges against Fleischhacker. The prosecution was unable to prove that he had known ahead of time about the plan to murder the prisoners. 114 A month later, it suspended the charges against Wolf, noting that the former administrative assistant was guilty of little more than naivete. 115 But the prosecuting attorney claimed a victory in the case against Beggar. On April 6, the court in Frankfurt convicted the anthropologist of being an accomplice in the murder of 86 Jews in the gas chamber at Nat Seiler. 116. The judge then proceeded to deliberate on a suitable sentence. 117 He observed that the anthropologist had fallen as a youth under the influence of Nazi Party doctrine, which had clouded his critical judgment. He noted that Beggar had performed the research at Nat Seiler against his will, convinced that he could not prevent the slaughter. He also recalled that Beggar had written a letter to Sievers after his trip to Auschwitz, favorably mentioning four prisoner assistants by name. This, the judge stated, demonstrated that the anthropologist felt compassion for those imprisoned in the camp, 
although it is highly unlikely that any of the four listed prisoner assistants was Jewish. 118 Finally the judge noted that Beggar had been forced to wait 10 years for the trial, which had placed him under significant psychological stress, and had already endured internment after the war and four months in custody in 1960. On the strength of these factors, the court was inclined to clemency. It sentenced him to a three-year prison term and ordered that he pay the costs of the trial. 119. Beggar's friends were much disturbed by the sentence. They thought it unduly harsh and wrote letters of protest to the local newspapers, pointing out that the former SS officer was guilty merely of following orders. Beggar's lawyer filed an appeal. In 1974, a German appellate court reduced his sentence to three years on probation. 120. 24 Shadows of History In February 2002, I learned that Bruno Beggar was still alive. He was 90 years of age and living at the time with a daughter in the small German town of Konestein, so I wrote him a short letter, requesting an interview. Nearly 60 years had passed since Beggar had stood in front of the concentration camp barracks at Auschwitz, selecting men, women, and children for his research on Jews, and in that time, science had utterly repudiated the foundations of Nazi racial doctrine. Indeed, leading researchers from around the world had convened several times to set the scientific record straight on the concept of racial difference. At the invitation of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, for example, 12 of the world's leading physical anthropologists and geneticists had gathered in Paris in 1951 to review the scientific literature and to issue an official statement on race, the second since the war had ended. While the 12 scientists struggled to define precisely what race was noting that many populations could not be easily fitted into any existing racial classification they had no trouble at all in delineating what it was not. Muslims and Jews, they observed pointedly, are no more races than are Roman Catholics and Protestants one. They then proceeded to examine the basic tenets of Ras and Kunda, finding them severely flawed. There is no evidence for the existence of so-called pure races, they concluded, adding that available scientific knowledge provides no basis for believing that the groups of mankind differ in their innate capacity for intellectual and emotional development to the notion of superior or inferior races was mere fiction. And as for the perils of miscegenation something that had greatly troubled Nazi scholars the researchers simply shook their heads. There is no evidence that race mixture produces disadvantageous results from a biological point of view. 3. By carefully reviewing the scientific literature, the scientific community unmasked Germany's racial experts as mere bigots. It stripped away their scholarly pretenses and vanities, revealing the true nature of their work the advancement of racism and the dissemination of anti-Semitism. And as I reflected on this, I wondered what the senior staff of the Ananurb, men who had constructed their research on the treacherous ground of Ras and Kunda, might truthfully say about their research today. Could they admit to themselves and to others the errors of their scholarship? Could they explain why they had abandoned real science and scholarship for such a skein of lies? And would a distance of 60 years bring some clarity and light into the dark shadows of their lives? I could think of no better person to answer these questions than Bruno Becker. Interviewing the former Nazi racial expert would bring the entire story of the Ananurb from its mad and seemingly harmless global quest for ancient Aryans to its final years of barbarous cruelties out of the shadowy world of the past and place it firmly, immediately in the present. I was immensely curious to hear what Beggar might say today about his racial research in Tibet, his stint in the Ananurb, and his involvement in a major war crime, but I did not hold out much hope that he would agree to talk to me. It seemed highly unlikely that he would be willing to discuss such disturbing matters. So I was surprised when I eventually received word that he would see me. On a cool, damp April afternoon, a colleague and I took a train from Frankfurt to the small town of Konestein. I felt very uneasy about the appointment that lay ahead, and by the time we arrived my spirits were as leaden as the skies outside the train windows. Konestein is a pretty little Hessian town, a quiet suburban retreat for the health-conscious and the moneyed. In summer, Conestine's residents hike the nearby wooded trails and take the clean, bracing air. 
they wander the romantic ruins of Conestine Castle and plan day trips to the rustic vineyards of the Rhine to sample the latest vintage of their favorite Riesling or Mullerthurga. Conestine, in other words, is a very German kind of place. Just slightly off the main tourist path, it is a town where English is not often heard on the streets and where foreigners are unlikely to intrude, unless they happen to be relatives visiting from America or Britain. And the people of Conestine seem to like it that way. Certainly Bruno Beggar did. Just a month short of his 91st birthday, Beggar kept a low profile. He refrained from listing his name, as his neighbors did, beneath the row of door buzzers at the main entrance of his building a fact he omitted to mention, along with his suite number, when he agreed to see me. To enter past the building's security system and find Beggar, my colleague, and I were forced to wait patiently for a resident to happen by in the middle of the afternoon, someone who was willing to check for Beggar's name on the mailboxes inside. Only then were we able to proceed up the stairs to the fourth floor and down a narrow corridor to Beggar's apartment. And it was just at that last moment, when I stood at the doorstep, hand poised to knock, that Beggar subtly began to reveal his presence. Alongside his doorway, someone had tacked up four photographic prints glimpses, it seems, of Beggar's favorite mental landscapes. Two of these showed typically German scenes, rustic images of handsome farm folk going about their chores in Lower Saxony images that could have come straight from the pages of an SS calendar 60 years ago. The remaining two, however, showed something far more exotic, something strange and thrilling and rather mysterious, particularly for this stolid suburban apartment building. They were photographs taken half a world away of Tibetans staring into the camera's eye curious, puzzled, and bemused. Beggar's daughter, a snowy-haired woman in her sixties, answered the door and led the way into a cozy private study, a place that resembled a miniature Tibetan museum. Black and white photographs of shy Tibetan women and children stared down from the wall, just a few of the thousands of photographs that Beggar had taken during his travels across Tibet in 1938 and 1939. Stacks of papers about Tibet cluttered the top of an old wooden desk. Rich oriental rugs that might have been Tibetan hung from the walls. And some of the souvenirs from Beggar's famous trek to Lhasa were placed artfully around the room. One that caught my eye was a small Tibetan container. Its top was shaped like a whitened human skull. Beggar eased himself down a little stiffly into a straight back chair that his daughter had drawn up to a table. She sat down protectively beside him. I had expected him to be frail and withered and quite deaf, for this was the impression he had given on the phone. But in this I was mistaken, he was not at all ground down by time. Indeed, he looked almost preternaturally young hale, hardy, alert, and sharp, with a full head of hair and an almost roseate hue to his still full cheeks. He was without a doubt the fittest 90-year-old that I had ever met or seen. Moreover, there was something kindly and avuncular, something friendly and even a bit ingratiating about his manner, as if he had just stepped from a Norman Rockwell painting. Beggar seemed eager to see us, as if he had been looking forward to the meeting. Like many old people, he enjoyed talking about his youth. He relished chatting about his ancestors and his university years, and when we eventually brought out an assortment of photographs of the Tibet expedition that we had located in a German archive, he flipped through them with delight, describing some of the adventures that had befallen him in Tibet. To our astonishment, he casually boasted that he still possessed the calipers and sliding compasses that he had used to perform racial measurements in Tibet. Then, with no prompting at all, he asked his reluctant daughter to fetch one of the notebooks he had used to record racial measurements in Tibet. Such notebooks, he explained, were often used by anthropologists of the day. Indeed, he had received advice about using them from Theodore Mollison, the racial expert who had trained Joseph Mangel. Beggar, it transpired, was not hesitant to talk about old racial theories. He pulled out a still-treasured copy of one of Hans Gunther's books on Ras and Kunda from a book cabinet. He flipped open the pages and proudly pointed to a map that he had designed for the book as a young student. Nor did he particularly mind talking about his ideas on the origins of the Jewish race. Indeed, 
he still believed as he and other German Rassenkunde specialists had in the 1930s that the Jews were a mongrel race, with strong mongoloid elements, very strong mongoloid characteristics. Only when the conversation finally turned and reached at last its inevitable conclusion, the Jewish skeleton collection and his particular role in that crime, did Beggar's memory begin to falter. But he did not stop talking. He insisted, in a patter that sounded exceptionally well rehearsed, that he was an innocent dupe, a stooge really who had been much too trusting and naive in his dealings with Sievers and Hurd. When he finally learned the real plans for those he had measured, he explained, I was of course very angry. What a bad joke to be suddenly pulled into this. But in the awkward silence that followed, he expressed no regret, no sign of sympathy or compassion for the 86 Jewish men, women, and children whom he had helped consign to a gas chamber at Nat Seiler. He seemed to regard them as minor supporting characters in a greater tragedy. In the three and a half hours I spent with Beggar, his emotions only got the better of him once and that was when he began to describe his trial. It was, he said pointedly as if this would explain everything started by a Jewish lawyer. And it was obvious that he was still baffled by his conviction, unable to fathom how anyone could think him a criminal. Indeed he seemed to see himself as the real victim of the tragedy, a man much wronged by the judicial system and the politics of the day. They felt the need to convict someone, he muttered darkly. His lawyer had warned him about how the law is biased. This hideous self-pity was terrible to witness. We stood up and prepared to leave. But he refused to let us go until he had told one final story about the trial. When he was convicted, he explained, the court had ordered him to pay the costs of the six-month-long proceeding, a heavy financial blow to Baker. But despite months of waiting, he had never received the bill. The reason, he claimed, lay with the trial judge, someone whom he had come to regard as a secret sympathizer. He paused significantly, and permitted himself a smile. The judge, he said, was the son of a German official who attended the Wanzi conference in 1942 to discuss the coordination of the final solution. Back in Frankfurt, I turned the key to my small hotel room and sank down upon the bed, emotionally drained by my meeting with Beggar. I felt exhausted and worn down to the bone, but I could not manage to sleep. Nor could I put Beggar's words out of my mind. As I lay awake that night, I thought about those who had once worked for the Ananerb and the motives they had for doing so. Some of the scientific staff, including Beggar, were almost certainly true believers, susceptible men who had been swept up in the fervor of Nazism in their youths and who were later incapable of shaking off its hold even after witnessing for themselves the concentration camps, the terrified prisoners, the spiraling smoke of the gas ovens. These researchers had not flinched from hard acts, believing that they served a higher purpose and that their cruelties were part of the natural order of things. They were precisely the kind of men that Himmler had counted upon to carry out his bidding. But the others were much more of an enigma. What had driven men like Ernst Schaefer, the Tibet adventurer, Walther Wust, the Orientalist, or August Hurd, the anatomist all highly intelligent men capable of seeing beyond the Nazi rhetoric to cross such a terrible moral line. Why had they lent their names and their reputations to the Ananerb, cloaking it in scholarly credibility? What had persuaded them to forsake the traditional scholarly pursuit of the truth, distorting their research to fit Nazi party doctrine? And what had led them to serve a political system that they must have known to be rotten at the heart corrupt, cruel, and murderous? Such questions troubled me all that night in Frankfurt, keeping me restless and on edge until daylight, when I rose at last to prepare for another day of interviews. And even now, as I am about to close the last chapter of this book, they plague me still. After scrutinizing the personal files of these men and poring over the details of their life stories, after contemplating their academic work and talking to their families and friends, I still do not understand why they did what they did why they willingly contributed to such evil. No one, after all, forced them to join the SS and its research arm, the Ananerb. They had other choices. They could have contented themselves, for example, with modest university posts, 
avoiding the limelight and leaving the grander promotions and the important research grants to others. Many intellectuals survived the Nazi years in this way. Or they could have left public life entirely, as some German writers and artists did, embarking on something known today as inner emigration for such dissidents made their homes in remote parts of Germany, declining to place their talents at the service of the Reich and retiring to the private sphere. Or, most admirably of all, they could have worked actively against the Nazi state, although such work would have placed their own lives and that of their families in grave peril. But few, if any, of the Ananerb senior researchers chose to conduct their lives with such integrity, and today I wonder why. What was Schaefer thinking when he accepted command of the Caucasus mission, whose goal in part was to racially diagnose Jewish tribes, all the better for their extermination? What was Wuss's response when he first learned of Himmler's plan to forcibly conduct medical experiments on human beings? What thoughts passed through Hertz's mind as he first contemplated murdering Jewish prisoners for their skeletons? Were they conscious of crossing some great moral chasm, of leaving behind the familiar world of ethics, decency, and human compassion? Or had they become so numb to the great evil that surrounded them that they failed to notice where the next step would lead? History no matter how thoroughly researched and carefully pondered, has its strict limits, beyond which we cannot go. We cannot know in the end what these men were thinking at the moment they willingly relinquished their humanity and crossed over the divide to barbarism. And it is impossible to say exactly why they did what they did, though some combination of fatal ambition, moral weakness, and unthinking prejudice seems the most likely explanation. While many other historians have written about the dire consequences of such personal failings in the Third Reich, I believe that the terrible power of science, and the manner in which science was manipulated to justify some of the worst atrocities of the Holocaust, is a little-known story. We like to think today that science is immutable, the gold standard of human knowledge, but as the history of the Ananerb has shown us, it can be bent and warped to catastrophic ends. We cannot afford to forget this lesson. Guide to the Most Important Personalities Dr. Franz Altheim, 1898-1976, an urbane bohemian with a wry sense of humor, Altheim was an expert on the origins of Roman religion and the history of the Latin language. While teaching at the University of Frankfurt, he met Erika Trotman, who became his mistress and who helped introduce him to Himmler. With financial assistance from the SS leader, the couple traveled to Italy and Dalmatia in 1937, searching for evidence of the Nordic origins of Roman civilization. A year later, with funding from the Ananerb, the pair journeyed across Eastern Europe and the Middle East, arriving in Iraq. En route, they gathered intelligence on Iraqi pipelines and tribal leaders for the SS security service. Dr. Bruno Becker, 1911, a member of a prominent Heidelberg family, Beggar was an expert in Rassenkunde, or racial studies, a growth industry in Nazi Germany. At the invitation of Ernst Schaefer, he joined the SS expedition to Tibet, serving as its anthropologist and racial expert. During the war, he was assigned as a racial expert to Schaefer's Special Command K in the Caucasus. His mission was to racially diagnose tribal groups in the region information that could be used by the SS command to slate Jewish groups for extermination. In 1942, Beggar took part in a major war crime known as the Jewish Skeleton Collection. Dr. Asien Bomers, 1912-1988, born in the Netherlands, Bomers was a renegade archaeologist fascinated by the German Nazi Party and by Frisian politics. In 1937, he conducted excavations for the SS at the Cro-Magnon site of Mauern in Germany, claiming to have uncovered the origins of the Aryan race. His findings fascinated Himmler, and in 1938 Bomers joined the staff of the Ananerb. That fall, he journeyed across the Netherlands, Belgium, England, and France, searching for the earliest traces of Aryan art and culture. Dr. Fritz Bose, 1906-1975, a musicologist who theorized that the world's richly varied musical styles were a reflection of innate racial traits rather than cultural differences, Bose became head of the Berlin Acoustics Institute in 1934, after his Jewish mentor was forced out. In 1936, 
Himmler sent bows to Finland with Jirjo von Grenhagen to record the ancient songs of Finnish witches and sorcerers. After the war, he taught for a time at the Technical University in Berlin. Richard Walther Dar, 1895-1953, an agriculturalist specializing in animal breeding, Dar believed that Germany had to take serious measures to restore the purity of the Nordic race. He advocated exterminating the handicapped and using scientific knowledge to assist Germans in selecting their mates in order to produce superior human stock. In 1932, he became the head of the Race and Settlement Office of the SS, better known as RUSHA, a position he held until 1938. RUSHA examiners were responsible for the racial purity of the SS. In 1933, he became the Minister of Food and Agriculture in Germany. Jirjo von Grenhagen, 1911-2003, a handsome young Finnish nobleman who loathed communism, Grenhagen met Himmler while trekking on foot from Paris to Helsinki. His knowledge of ancient Finnish myths and folklore so charmed Himmler that he put Grenhagen to work in the Annenerb. In 1936, Himmler sent the young Finn and German musicologist Fritz Bose on a research trip to the Finnish province of Karelia. There they recorded ancient magical spells preserved by elderly wizards and recorded the primeval songs of the region. Dr. Hans F. K. Gunther, 1891-1968, a German philologist and anthropologist who became one of the Third Reich's foremost exponents of racial studies, Gunther wrote a series of popular books on race that proved enormously influential in Nazi circles. Adolf Hitler greatly admired his work, and in 1930 Hitler attended Gunther's inaugural lecture at the University of Jena. After the Nazi seizure of power, Gunther took up an important post at the University of Berlin. Heinrich Himmler, 1900-1945, the son of a prominent Bavarian schoolmaster, Himmler joined the Nazi party in 1923 and soon rose to the position of Reichsführer SS, 1929-1945. Ruthless, intelligent, and utterly dependable, he became one of Hitler's favorite henchmen, holding the posts of Chief of the German Police, 1936, Minister of the Interior, 1943, Commander-in-Chief of the Replacement Army, 1944, and Commander-in-Chief of the Rhine, 1944, and Vistula Armies, 1945. As diligently as he performed Hitler's bidding, however, Himmler always found time to oversee one of his fondest creations, the Annenerb, even serving as its first superintendent, 1935-1938. He committed suicide at a British interrogation center. Dr. August Hurd, 1898-1945, a talented anatomist who suffered a severe facial injury in the First World War, Hurt specialized in the study of the human nervous system. In 1933, while teaching at the University of Heidelberg, he joined the SS and there he met a young Bruno Becker. During the war, Hurt became a department head in the Annenerbs Institute for Military Scientific Research and conducted a series of notorious medical experiments on concentration camp prisoners. In 1942 and 1943, he planned and directed a major war crime known as the Jewish Skeleton Collection. Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945, an Austrian drifter and artist turned politician, Hitler became Reich Chancellor in January 1933 and Germany's head of state a year later. He assumed the role of Minister of Defense in February 1938, and took on the responsibility of Supreme Commander in the field in December 1941. He committed suicide in a bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery on April 30, 1945. Dr. Herbert Jankin, 1905-1990, one of the brightest and most respected archaeologists in Germany, Jankin joined the Annenerb in 1937, becoming the head of its Department of Archaeology three years later. In 1942, Jankin led a small unit of archaeologists to southern Russia and the Caucasus to search for the treasure of the Goths and find proof of a classical-era German empire along the Black Sea. Dr. Karl Kirsten, 1909-1992, an expert on the Northern European Bronze Age, Kirsten was an old friend of Herbert Jankin. In 1942, he joined Jankin's archaeological unit, 
and spent the early fall of that year surveying archaeological sites in the Crimea and preparing an itinerary for Himmler's tour to the region. Edmund Kiss, 1886-1960, a much decorated soldier in the First World War and an architect and writer by profession, Kiss claimed to have found the ruins of primordial Aryan palaces and temples in South America. In 1939, he planned to lead a team of 20 the Ananurbs' largest and most expensive expedition to Tiwanaku in the Bolivian Andes. Dr. Peter Paulson, 1902-1985, an archaeologist with an international reputation as a Viking expert, Paulson headed a unit of scholars dispatched to Warsaw in 1939 to methodically loot the city's most important museum collections of their archaeological treasures. Unable to fend off other Nazi thieves, he was reassigned in 1940 to a quiet teaching job at an SS officer training school in Bad Tolts. Dr. Ernst Schaefer, 1910-1992, a headstrong zoologist with a volatile temper, Schaefer led an expedition to Tibet in 1938 to search for proof of an ancient Aryan conquest of the Himalayas. During the war, he lectured in occupied Europe as an exemplar of Nazi science, and in 1942 he accepted command of a military and scientific mission, Special Command K, in the Caucasus. One goal of the mission was to conduct a racial diagnosis of the mountain Jews to determine whether they should be annihilated. Wolfram Sievers, 1905-1948, a high school dropout who taught himself European prehistory, Sievers was a gifted administrator who became the Ananurbs' managing director. During the war, Sievers headed the Ananurbs Institute for Military Scientific Research and orchestrated its notorious medical experiments on prisoners at Dachau and Natseiler concentration camps. Eduard Tratz, 1888-1977, one of Salzburg's most respected citizens, Tratz was the founder of the Haus der Natur, a major natural history museum. An ardent supporter of Nazi policy and doctrine, Tratz joined Paulson's looting unit in 1939, personally plundering the State Zoological Museum in Warsaw. Erika Trotman, 1897-1968, the daughter of a wealthy estate owner in East Prussia and a close friend of Hermann Göring, Trotman was an illustrator and photographer by profession. While working for the world-famous Research Institute for Cultural Morphology in Frankfurt, she met the classical historian Franz Altheim, who became her lover. In 1937, the couple conducted archaeological research in Italy and Dalmatia at Himmler's behest, and soon after joined the Annenerb. In 1938, they traveled to Romania and Iraq conducting research for the Annenerb, and gathering intelligence for the SS Security Service. Karl Maria Weilagut, also known as Weisthor, 1866-1946, a former psychiatric patient and a self-described expert in runic script, Weilagut traced his pedigree back to the Norse god Thor. He claimed to guard the sacred knowledge of primeval German tribes. He met Himmler in 1933, and in the years that followed, the SS leader gave him an office in RUSHA and consulted him regularly on matters of ancient Germanic traditions. Dr. Hermann Wirth, 1885-1981, an eccentric Dutch spendthrift with immense reserves of personal charm, Wirth was a philologist by training and a self-proclaimed expert in script and symbol studies. He became the first president of the Ananurb, 1935-1937, and led two expeditions to Scandinavia, where he believed he had found examples of the world's oldest writing system, a lost Aryan script. Dr. Walther Wust, 1901-1993, a cautious, reserved man, Wust was an expert on Sanskrit and Old Persian, and a Nazi authority on the ancient Aryans. During his first meeting with Himmler, he read aloud from old Sanskrit scriptures, an experience that enthralled the SS leader. In 1937, Himmler appointed West president of the Ananurb, and later made him the institute superintendent, 1939-1945. Acknowledgements The word acknowledgements seems far too slight a term to describe the immense debt of gratitude that I owe to the many people whose generosity, kindness, ingenuity, curiosity, hard work, and passionate commitment made this book a reality. 
Writing a history on a subject as large and convoluted as that of the Ananurb is a mammoth undertaking by any measure. Its successful completion depends upon so many complicated pursuits investigating and tracking down reliable sources for interviews, locating important archival materials, searching out rare books from the period, and finding gifted archivists who can, for example, recall at the drop of a hat the exact contents of microfilms that they may have briefly scanned years earlier. In this case of this book, there was an additional challenge. When I first began this project in the summer of 2001, I did not read or speak a word of German. Will Schwalb at Hyperion had faith from the beginning that I could overcome all these hurdles. From our very first conversation about Nazi archaeologists, he strongly encouraged me to undertake the project and then arranged for generous financial support from Hyperion. I am eternally grateful to Will for his publishing acumen, his wonderful editorial eye, and his continuing friendship. I am also hugely grateful to my editor, Peter Nelly Van Arsdale, who has been so supportive, patient, constructive, and discerning throughout this past four and a half years, never flinching once from the torrent of emails I sent her. She is truly a brick. I would also like to thank Christopher Potter and Cynthia Good as well as Catherine Heaney at Fourth Estate in London and Diane Turbide at Penguin Canada for their enthusiasm for this book. And I would be greatly remiss, too, if I did not mention all the help, encouragement and sound advice that I have received from my superb agent Anne McDermott and her associate Jane Warren. From the outset, I realized that I needed the assistance of a small band of linguistically talented researchers if I was to trace the activities of the Ananurb across Europe, Asia, and South America. While scouting about for suitable people, I contacted Peter Stenberg, the head of the Department of Central, Eastern and Northern European Studies at the University of British Columbia. This was probably the single most important phone call that I made during this project, for it was in this way that I was introduced to the astonishingly gifted Stenberg clan. In the course of this project, every member of the family polyglots all jumped in to lend a hand. Peter and Rosa Stenberg brought me new German books hot off the press from their annual summer sojourns in Munich. They loaned me articles and other research materials, assisted with difficult translations, bought me lunches, introduced me to their friend, Auschwitz survivor Rudolf Verba, invited me to Christmas Eve parties, and valiantly served as readers of the final manuscript, critiquing its contents and picking out many of my errors. I can't thank them enough. Their youngest son, Josh, took time out from his studies of Mandarin and Russian at Harvard to dig out and photocopy rare German scientific books in the university's library. Their oldest son, Eric, offered expert advice on matters to do with the war and the German military. Rachel and Anja greatly brightened my days by their visits to the office. But the family's greatest contribution to this book has come from Charlotte Stenberg. A wonderfully resourceful researcher blessed with an abundance of linguistic talent, Charlotte has labored full-time on this project since its inception. She immersed herself in Nazi German, a lexicon in its own right, translated thousands of pages of archival and court documents from German, Swedish, French, and Norwegian into English, doggedly tracked down photographs from archives across Europe and the United States, meticulously checked and double-checked the book's notes for accuracy, presided over a bulging mini-archive of copied documents in our office, and rescued me more than once from the crashes of my recalcitrant iMac. It's very difficult for me to imagine how I could have completed this book without her sunny temperament and the vast energy that she brought to her work. It would also be difficult to adequately thank another superb researcher, Sabina Schmidt. A Berliner with a doctoral degree in modern German history, Sabina was of invaluable assistance with the German archival research. In addition, she helped us contact family members and friends of the Ananurb researchers and accompanied me to nearly all the interviews that I did in Germany and Austria, sometimes at great personal and emotional cost. Despite these difficulties, she proved to be a wonderful travel companion and an astute guide to modern German life, kindly assisting me in finding apartments for my stays in Berlin, introducing me to everything from the complexities of German train schedules to the nuances of Turkish cuisine, 
and giving me impromptu primers on such diverse subjects as the spread of neo-Nazism in modern Germany. In addition, I'd like to extend my gratitude to three other members of the research team. For more than a year, archaeologist Sibyl Gunther combed the libraries of Berlin, searching out forgotten books written by Annenerb researchers and poring over their texts, trying to make sense of them. It was from Sibyl that I first learned of the Poison Closet, a section in German libraries where hate-mongering literature is stowed for the use of serious researchers only. In the libraries of Reykjavik, a young Icelandic student, Hafladi Sivarsson, located some very valuable research for us on Himmler's interest in Iceland, while in St. Petersburg, an old friend, Natasha Dobrynina, found and translated important Soviet sources on the Goths of the Crimea. Thanks are also due to Canadian cartographer Sinje Fridriksson Fick, who labored diligently to create the four original maps that grace this book, and to John Masters, Birgit Biscoff, and Peter Bennett for their patient labors on digital scans and other photographic matters. A small army of archivists and librarians went out of their way to help us ferret out documents, microfilms, photographs, films, sound recordings, and obscure books from their collections. I would particularly like to thank James Kelling and Niels Cordes at the National Archives and Records Administration in College Park, Michael Hallman and Simone Langner at the Bundesarchiv in Berlin, Gregor Picro at the Bundesarchiv in Koblenz, Christoph Bachmann at the Staatsarchiv Munich, Editha Platt and Peter Steigerwald at the Frobenius Institute Archiv in Frankfurt, Ulrich Delay and Dr. Klaus A. Lankheit at the Institute für Zeitgeschichte in Munich, Ms. Krug at the Deutsches. Archaeologisches Institute in Berlin, Michael Mosser at the Universität Archiv in Frankfurt, Ms. Galinska at Bundesbuch Trag die für Unterlagen des Staatssicherheitsdienst der Himmeligen Deutschen Demokratischen Republik, Gerhard Kuiper at the Politisches Archiv des Wardigen AMT in Berlin, Jürgen Marinjolz at Humboldt University in Berlin, and David Smith at the New York Public Library. Metheide, the archivist at the Kuhl II Ristorich Museum Archiv in Oslo, was especially warm and cordial, inviting me into her home to sample traditional Norwegian cuisine and dashing off frequent letters and postcards of encouragement while I was writing the book. Many other people freely gave of their time and their expertise, making this a much better book than it would have been otherwise. H. Imlub at Humboldt University in Berlin was an unfailing source of leads and a wonderful guiding light, always finding time from his own numerous historical projects to answer my questions. Rudolf Verbe in Vancouver generously shared his insights on the operations at Auschwitz, while Hans Joachim Lang in Tübingen kindly helped me piece together some of the more troubling details of the Annenerb skeleton collection. And I will never forget the fabulous weekend I spent with Lutgard Lowe and Camilla Olsen in Sweden, touring the famous rock art of Bohuslän and drinking German wine and talking late into the night in the little house by the sea at Grevestad. I could never adequately thank all the others who patiently answered so many questions and emails, correcting misconceptions and supplying much valuable new information. I am sure many groaned every time they saw yet another email or fax or telephone message from our team, so I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my deepest appreciation to the following individuals, Andre Engrich, Michael Balter, H. M. Barsh, Margit Berner, David Brond, Anton Broger, Jan Broger, Frank M. Clover, John Peter Collett, D. R. Eberhardt, Martage Nykhoff, I. Run Engelhardt, Frode Feroy, Dietmar Feldhaus, Jens Fleischer, Aspen Grogard, Walther Habersetzer, Anders Hagen, Elmer Hammerschmidt, Brian Hayden, Henry M. Honigswald, Nicholas Holzberg, Mary Eisen, Ermarada Jarvinen, Olaf Svera Johansson, Frederick H. Kasten, Hans Ewald Kessler, Stefan Klein, Serge Level, Sylvette Lemagnon, Freddie Litton, Katharina Lamel, Volker Luzman, Wendy Lower, Bob Martinson, Michael Meyer, Waldemar Nering, Oral Nelson, Karl Heinz Nickel, Javier Nunez de Arco, Linda Owen, Tana Partinen, Werner Renz, Perry Rolfson, Wienand van der Sanden, Ina Schmidt, Ike Schmitz, Winfried. Schulze, William E. Seidelman, Gerd Simon, Kurt Singer, Yuri Svoboda, Sid Taffler, Maria Teschler Nicola, Claudia Thunvoit, 
Annette Tim, Bruce Trigger, Gretchen Vogel, Hector Williams, Ingo Wajora, and Ingrid Zwerens. Moreover, I can't thank enough those scholars who took time out from their busy research and teaching schedules to read parts of the manuscript, Victor H. Mayer at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Juha Pentakinen at the University of Helsinki, Alexander Gertsen at Turian National University in Simferopol, Hanu E. Sinisalo from the University of Tampere in Finland, Guido Lombardo from Universidad Peruana Coitano no Heredio in Lima, Chaling Waterbold from the University of Groningen, Johanny von Grenhagen in Helsinki, Lutgard Lowe in Gothenburg, Camilla Olsen in Trondheim, and Sabina Schmidt in Berlin. They saved me from the scourge of many an error, those mistakes still embedded in the text are entirely my own. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to express my gratitude to my father for his personal recollections of the final days of the war and the bombing campaigns of the Royal Air Force, Kathleen Hodgson for her amiable concern during the grueling months I spent writing the darkest chapters of this book, and my brother Alex and sister-in-law Sheila, and their wonderful clan Thomas, Anna, and Sarah for their unflagging encouragement and curiosity about this book. I'm also indebted to John Masters and Andrew Nikiforuk for their research suggestions, unstinting friendship, and moral support. Most of all, however, I want to thank my husband Jeff, who thought from the very beginning that a book on the Ananerb was a great idea. He had no inkling that he would spend the next four and a half years listening to bizarre blow-by-blow -blow accounts of the research, sitting through numerous German documentaries and films on the Nazi regime, and browsing through nearly all the books I brought home on Himmler, the SS, and the Second World War. But even if he had suspected all that he was in for, I feel certain he would have been game. Jeff is at heart a historian, and his immense fascination for the past has been a continuing source of delight and inspiration to me. I wrote this book with him in mind. I can think of no one else that I would rather share my life with. About the author. Heather Pringle is a journalist and author whose articles on archaeology and ancient cultures have appeared in numerous magazines including Discover, National Geographic Traveler and New Scientist. She has won the American Association for the Advancement of Science Award for magazine journalism and has written three other books including The Mummy Congress. She lives just outside Vancouver, Canada.